Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to day two of the Richard Nixon Foundation's Grand Strategy Summit. Throughout the day, we will be joined by a number of members of the board of directors of the Richard Nixon Foundation, uh, including Christopher Nixon Cox, the eldest grandson of President and Mrs. Nixon, representing the Nixon family, Ambassador Robert O'Brien, Lisa Arduous, Ambassador Callista Gingrich, Blake Kernan, Bill Kilberg, Bobby Kilberg, Marlene Malik, and Charlie Zhang. So thanks to all of the members of the board who will be here, and thank you for your support. I also want to recognize a few organizations who helped to promote the Grand Strategy Summit far and wide, including the Vandenberg Coalition, the former Members of Congress Association, the Association of Republican Presidential Appointees, the America First Policy Institute, the Alexander Hamilton Society, the American Enterprise Institute, Pepperdine University, and the Naval War College. And I know there's a number of representatives from those groups here this morning, so thank you for your support. Now let's get into this morning's program. Last year, at this conference and on this stage, former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich said, quote, grand strategies require bold vision and a lot of specific incremental steps. It happens very rarely. It involves people who are remarkable, and President Nixon was one of those people. Fifty years later, after the Nixon presidency, we find ourselves living in a very different world. So let us ask, what are the ingredients, what is the composition of a 21st century American grand strategy? To lead this discussion, to look at the status of the Russia-Ukraine war and what it will mean long-term for American statecraft, it's my pleasure to introduce Jackie Heinrich, Fox News White House correspondent, and she will introduce our panelists. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here. So today, President Richard Nixon would not have been surprised that the fledgling democracy in Russia under former President Boris Yeltsin dissolved or that Russia's um, nationalist regime took hold under the likes of Vladimir Putin. He would also not be surprised that Moscow's relations with Kyiv worsened to the point that the United States finds itself in today, supporting Ukraine's defense of its democracy, holding the door against a possible Russian invasion of a neighboring NATO ally that could embroil the U.S. in a war with a nuclear power. On March 16, 1994, Nixon, in a press conference with the Ukrainian president, prophesied that one day the United States would face a terrible choice. There is no doubt that sometime in the future there will be occasions when the U.S. will have to look at Ukraine and Russia and say, who do we choose, he said that day. Ukrainian President Leonid Kravchuk urged there should be no serious confrontations and no conflict between Ukraine and Russia because this threatens the whole world, not just Russia and Ukraine, he said. Doesn't that sound familiar? Nixon said he expected the threat of nationalism in Russia would recede once economic prosperity took hold, and he dismissed suggestions that Russia was about to make a move militarily. But privately, he was much more concerned. Five days after that press conference made headlines, Nixon wrote a letter to President Clinton, the contents of which were kept secret for the next 30 years until it was declassified this past June. And its contents are striking. Nixon, who was then 81 years old, detailed his two-week trip to Russia and Ukraine, anticipating a much more belligerent Russia that would give rise to someone like Vladimir Putin that we have today. And he warned that Yeltsin's brief experiment with democracy was already over. He said, I have reluctantly concluded that his situation has rapidly deteriorated since the elections in December and that the days of his unquestioned leadership of Russia are numbered, Nixon wrote to Clinton. His drinking bouts are longer and his periods of depression are more frequent and most troublesome. He can no longer deliver on his commitments to you and other Western leaders in an increasingly anti-American environment in the Duma and in the country. Nixon predicted worsening relations between Moscow and Kyiv, calling the situation highly explosive. He wrote, if it is allowed to get out of control, it will make Bosnia look like a PTA garden party. 
Nixon urged Clinton to take this issue seriously and to strengthen uh, U.S. diplomacy in Kyiv and to anticipate and help cultivate Yeltsin's successor. And he shared his disdain for career diplomats, telling Clinton that some of the best decisions that he made in his time as president were without the approval of or over the objections of most Foreign Service officers. And Nixon warned Clinton not to be held back by his staff. When Clinton eulogized Nixon the following year, he spoke of the wise counsel he received with regard to Russia. And in 2013, Clinton said he found himself wishing that he could pick up the phone and ask Nixon for his thoughts on issues, particularly ones involving Russia. So today, in that spirit, we are going to examine the questions that we are facing as a country. The future of U.S. support for Ukraine, especially as Americans are increasingly viewing Ukraine aid as a binary choice, help defend Ukraine's border or secure the United States' southern border, for instance. We'll also consider what should happen when the war comes to an end. What should be the U.S. role in rebuilding infrastructure and to what strategic end? And we'll consider this against the backdrop of a looming Chinese invasion of Taiwan and now also our greatest ally in the Middle East, Israel, at war. So for this discussion, I want to welcome Congresswoman Jane Harmon of California, Chair of the Commission on National Defense Strategy. Admiral Mike Rogers, former Commissioner of U.S. Cyber Command and former Director of the National Security Agency. And Congressman Mike Waltz, a Green Beret who formerly advised the Pentagon in the White House and currently sits on the Intelligence, Foreign Affairs, and Armed Services Committees. So we'll get right to it. When it comes to uh, support for Ukraine, the question today really that we want to examine is how realistic is as long as it takes? Congressman Waltz, I know you have some thoughts on this, so I'll have you lead us off. Well, thanks. And, and thanks so much to the Nixon Foundation. And, and certainly couldn't be a more timely time to have this discussion as we have yet another uh, large supplemental uh, spending package coming our way, and, and, and thank you, Jackie, for, for, uh, for moderating today, and great to be with you. Um, look, I think, uh, to be very blunt and succinct, the blank check, as long as it takes uh, strategy and approach, uh, or lack of a strategy, uh, is not sustainable. And I want to caveat that very strongly and say I have supported uh, and do believe it is in our national interest to stop Putin. I do believe he will uh, try to realize his longtime goal of reconstituting the old Soviet uh, Union. Uh, that would involve some NATO countries, and the best way uh, heretofore to have kept us out of the war is to give the Ukrainians the beans and bullets uh, to do the fighting. However, uh, a number of folks on, on my side of the aisle and a number of folks that have been supportive are enormously frustrated uh, with how this administration in many ways has slow rolled us uh, by not providing what the Ukrainians had, had asked for uh, up front when they were in a position uh, to, to decisively win. And we can go down that long list uh, from harpoons to patriots to ATACMs to cluster munitions to tanks to F-16. I mean, it literally is probably a, a longer list than we have today. Uh, so I think going forward, uh, now that we have s this war is settling into a war of attrition, uh, it has settled into a stalemate. Uh, I do believe the president... Uh, has failed to articulate to the American people uh, what success looks like, what victory looks like in line with U.S. interests, uh, how long is it going to take, how much is it going to cost, how many times will he come to the Congress and the American taxpayer and ask them to dig ever deeper. Uh, and I think there is room between as long as it takes and not another dollar um, there's a lot of room between those two very black and white positions, and the administration has not filled that void and has not consistently uh, taken the case to the American people. Richard Nixon, Bill Clinton, uh, we can name the president, I think, would have had multiple primetime Oval Office addresses 
uh, by now making that case, and he hasn't done so. And in the context of our border being out of control, inflation uh, continuing to rise every time somebody goes to the, to the gas pump, people, particularly on fixed income, hurting, uh, not seeing the Europeans step up in a, in a truly fair way, the big European economies, not the Baltics uh, and, and the Poles, um, uh, people are rightfully asking questions. How long is this going to go? And, in, oh, by the way, in the wake of the Afghanistan withdrawal in 20 years uh, of, of that war, how long, how much, what does victory look like? And uh, until we have those questions, until we have those answers, excuse me, to those questions, I think, uh, I think future packages are going to struggle mightily. Congressman Harmon, I saw you nodding a bit. Do you want to respond? Well, let me add a few things. I don't know that I'm exactly responding, uh, but it's nice to be here. I've just learned that my dear friends, the Kilbergs, are very involved here. I can't see if they're in the audience, but they were, here uh, last night. Uh, they were there last night, so love and affection. Bill was a classmate of mine at law school and a distant cousin, and I've known them for absolutely ever, so there. Um, but I, I'm looking out at the name of this event where we're speaking. It's called Grand Strategy Summit. And let me suggest that that is the root of our problem. Uh, I wrote a book when I left, well, I left Congress in 2011 after 17 years, or maybe that was 200 years. Um, but I'd point out that during that time, we actually balanced the federal budget, something to marvel at. Maybe it was a total accident, uh, but in, I remember the vote in 1997 when both parties came together on a large bipartisan uh, basis, and we had a surplus for a few years. Just contemplate that. But at any rate, um, after I left Congress and just after I left the Wilson Center, which I headed for uh, 10 years following that, uh, I wrote a book, the title of which my daughter picked is Insanity Defense, why our failure to confront hard national security problems makes us less safe. And the premise of the book is that when the Cold War ended, which was a huge victory uh, for uh, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush and others, uh, we didn't have a post-Cold War strategy. We thought we won, everybody else lost, and they all want to be us. So what happened in the 90s? And I was there. I was elected to uh, Congress in 1992, uh, if anyone remembers the so-called year of the woman. Does anyone remember that? Uh, anyway, never mind. So uh, what did we miss in the 90s? Just about everything. We missed the rise of China because we thought China wants to be us. China should be in the WTO, and then China will be us. We missed uh, the rise of terrorism. I was on something. I was on the Intel Committee, as you know, Mike, and... Uh, a ranking member for four years after 9-11, uh, we, we, I was on a commission that predicted one of three, a major attack on U.S. soil by terrorists. Uh, it, it was ignored, and then came 9-11, so we missed the rise of terrorism in spite of hits in our embassies in Africa, uh, and we missed the rise of Russian grievance. Uh, they were totally, especially Vladimir Putin, offended by the way his country was treated, um, not that it should have, well, we, we, we treated the losers differently after World War II. There were lessons. And the, we missed the rise of Russian grievance, among other things. And then came 9-11, and we had a, you know, that was justifiably uh, a watershed moment in, in American history. And we did some things right after 9-11, and we did some things wrong. And I agree with President Biden, who said that in, um, Jerusalem, in uh, Tel Aviv yesterday. Uh, and let's hope others learn our, our lessons. Let's hope we learn our lessons. But the point is we did not have a strategy, and we're still paying for that. And I am strongly for, I, didn't, I don't think Mike, this mic or that mic would say differently, uh, the Ukrainians winning. But a couple of points about that. Just talking about Ukraine aid in a vacuum, it's this many dollars compared to that many dollars for the border, uh, is tactical and not strategic. What we should be talking about is what is, and what we should have been talking about for years, is what does our overall budget look like? What are the big, the big puzzle pieces? And how do we shape them to be reasonable uh, for Americans fu America's future? 
And we're not doing that. We've taken pieces of the budget off. We've made them off limits, entitlements, for example. I'll say it, and I said it in Congress. I was a so-called blue dog, which were the fiscal she said it. response. I said it. <laughs> Fiscally responsible mm -hmm, Democrats. And uh, entitlement reform is important because our, our, uh, the Medicare trust fund and the Social Security trust fund are going to go bankrupt in 2030. So if we want to keep those things, we have to reform them. Tax reform is a thing to talk about. Budget reform uh, and lowering a, a reasonable budget is something to talk about. Anyway, that's background to this question. Uh, do I support more aid for Ukraine? You bet. Uh, do I support aid for Israel? You bet. Uh, do I support um, cuts in other parts of the budget? Yes. Do I think the border needs fixing? Yes. But taking each one of these up and looking at them as a zero-sum game, I think, is a very counterproductive way to go at this. And I do agree with you, Mike, that uh, Ukraine should have gotten its aid faster. I think the Biden administration was afraid of provoking war with China, well, with uh, Russia. Well, excuse me, uh, there is war between Russia and Ukraine. And I don't think that uh, we gained anything and maybe we lost something by proceeding so slowly. But one other point about that. I give Biden enormous credit for restoring our alliances. And I think to some extent, the slow rolling at the beginning had to do with NATO and waiting to make sure the NATO uh, countries were going to join us. And you can say they're slow rolling too. I do understand that Germany right now has missiles Ukraine could use, and it, it boggles my mind why they don't have those missiles to blow up the Karch Bridge, which is the land bridge between Russia and Crimea. Crimea is in Ukraine, not Russia. And it is used to resupply the front in, in uh, Ukraine. So I, th I would think that would make a lot of sense. So my bottom line is, Mike, Mike is right, but the context is sadly so unstrategic that we're in a situation that is, uh, I think, very unfortunate. Admiral Rogers, I want to have you pick up where they left off, but also add on to that, you know, the U.S. has not clearly communicated what the objective is here because they're quick to say that Ukraine is going to determine its future in the terms of any peace. Should the U.S. be more involved in shaping that? When I look at excuse me, when I look at the problem as a military, I, I, I go, okay, we got a fundamental disconnect between our objective and our strategy. Am I going in and out? Okay, apologize. If the objective is to drive the Russians out of all here, thank you guys. If the objective you have a real look at microphone up there. Check? Okay. If the objective is to drive the Russians out of all territory um, that is Ukraine, as originally constituted prior to the conflict. And I don't mean the conflict that started in 2020, 2022. I mean the conflict that started in February of 2014 when the Russians went into Crimea and also moved forces into the Donbass, the ethnic Russian region of eastern Ukraine. That's the, that appears to be the stated objective. The strategy seems to be, so we will use Ukraine's capacity, the will of its populace, its military capacity. We will support that financially, militarily, and that is how we will achieve this end state. Except to me, I'm watching a strategy that says, to Jane's point about, because and it is a valid concern, we don't want this conflict to escalate into something broader with the Russians, that has driven us to a strategy of incrementalism where every seemingly 90 days or so, we decide, you know, we're gonna give you a weapon you asked for a year ago. And as a military guy, I go, look, a strategy of incre incrementalism generally leads to protracted conflicts with a higher cost. And I mean both in terms of monetary, but also most importantly in terms of people and the damage that's gonna be inflicted in, in the battle space. Add on top of that now, We've got an additional conflict going on now in the Gaza in, in which we as a nation are committed to supporting Israel with many of the same capabilities that are in Ukraine. Um, and we have already talked about in terms of military support to Ukraine, we are at maximum capacity in terms of the ability to generate more weapons, more munitions. And now we're gonna add on 
an additional requirement. So my view is, as a military guy, guys, either change your objective or change your, change your strategy. But the way we're doing this right now, it is not going to get us where we said we want to be, and it's only going to prolong it, and that, that's just not good. And it also, the longer this goes on, the last point I would make, the longer this goes on, the greater the ability to sustain political will, you have had to deal with this in your professional lives, the tougher it is to sustain the political will to do this. And quite frankly, time, I would suspect, Putin believes is on his side. The longer this goes on, the greater the probability he believes that he will ultimately be successful. That is not a good place for us to be. Congressman Moss. Yeah, no, and, and I'll just add to this war of attrition that, that frankly, I think slow rolling and dithering has backed us into. Um, you know, on, from a political standpoint, to then say, well, if you have questions, if you have concerns, uh, if you're demanding before we keep writing uh, the American taxpayers' checks, burden sharing or a realistic end state, or to, therefore you then are pro Russian and don't support democracy, is frankly insulting. Uh, I think the American people rightly have uh, those questions and should have those questions. So the, the Admiral's absolutely right. On the, one, on the other side of the ledger, you have North Korea opening up its foundries. There's, I mean, that's not anything that is classified. There's open source reporting of ships leaving Pyongyang and, and, uh, and delivering large containers after uh, the, the Putin uh, summit uh, with uh, the leader of North Korea. So they're opening their foundries. We know Iran uh, is providing drone manufacturing and other types of capabilities. Russia is in it for the long haul. Uh, there are other former uh, and, and current allies providing munitions as well. Yet we're limited on our side. and We are at capacity from our industrial base, which this war has exposed uh, some serious shortfalls in our industrial base. Who's going to fill that void? I would argue. Uh, the large economies of Europe should be filling that void. Uh, right now, as we speak, nine of the 31 NATO countries are living up to their 2% GDP defense, uh, defense commitments from 10 years ago, commitments they made a decade ago, uh, pre-2014. Uh, they didn't get the message in 2014, and they're not getting the message now. In fact, Germany, of all countries, just formally backed away from its 2% commitment. There's been a lot of talk the last two years, a lot of promises, but when it came down to a vote in their parliament, they voted it down. Uh, and my question is, if we can't get, I'm not talking Estonia, Latvia, the Baltics, and Poland, because the administration repeatedly puts these kind of misleading uh, fact sheets out of, well, the United States per capita GDP is middle of the pack, all of these other countries ahead. Look, the actual dollar amounts are de minimis in terms of what, I mean, God bless them, they're fully committed because they, are on, they know they're next. But in terms of the countries that could actually make a difference and move the needle, Germany, France, Italy, if you look at their actual deliveries, the other kind of long-time tactic in, in these uh, ministerials is to make a lot of pledges. You have to watch what's actually delivered uh, over time. Uh, is, I mean, France, for example, is providing a fourth the amount that Poland is, despite having an economy four times as much as Poland. So again, my question is, if Europe isn't going to step up to its own defense needs now, with the largest land war since World War II literally on its doorstep, and the administration isn't going to hold their feet to the fire now, then when will we ever? Well, why don't you write that legislation? Well, I have. As a matter of fact, thank you very much. Uh, and it's called dollar for euro uh, in that uh, we have to have parity. I think that's only fair uh, to the American taxpayer that and, and NATO has been a phenomenal, look, I, I want to be clear, a, an amazingly successful alliance throughout the Cold War and even post, I could, we could have another debate on their performance in Afghanistan and living up to their pledges and promises then. Uh, however, uh, we, can, we literally cannot afford with $33 trillion in debt and climbing the issues, the word that I won't say that, um, that uh, Jane rightly brought up, we cannot afford to continue subsidize, subsidizing European defense 
particularly with the threats that we're facing uh, in Asia and what's going on now in the Middle East. They have got to step up, and we're going to legislate them into that position if the administration – they would do themselves a lot of favor if they were pounding the table in Europe instead of backslapping. Well, could I Go ahead. make a few comments about that? I don't think the way forward is to do less because they're doing less. I think the way forward is to get them to do more and do more. Uh, it is impressive that some countries in Asia are stepping up to help us, like Japan, and that Japan has had an internal conversation. Uh, remember, after Japan lost in World War II, instead of grinding them into the dirt, uh, we figured out how to have an umbrella to protect Asia, which <laughs> is still uh, worthy of the idea, but they are increasing their ability to produce defense materiel and uh, contemplating, anyway, uh, amending their constitution to do even more. But my point is, uh, parts of the world are stepping up. Um, there is a problem, I'm, as, as uh, uh, you mentioned, Jackie, I, I had this Commission on National Defense Strategy, which is a quadrennial look at our national defense strategy, which was last issued in 2022. It's a bipartisan commission, and one of the big problems is the so-called DIV. If you don't know what that is, it sounds like an hors d'oeuvre, but it's the defense industrial base. And I represented an aerospace dependent district in Los Angeles for all the hundred years I was in Congress, and back in that day, it was quite uh, robust, uh, even though we downsized our procurement budgets in the 90s. Uh, now, uh, we have fallen short, and especially after COVID or during COVID, a lot of these uh, facilities cut back on production of obvious things like munitions. And so guess what? We have a munitions shortage. Shame on us. Uh, you can blame whoever you want to blame, but the point is we've got to grow out of that quickly. Uh, and I, I'm sure every, both everybody on this panel and all of you would agree with that. Certainly, I do. But we have to grow into producing stuff we need to win the next war, not just protecting all the legacy uh, projects that people like me used to fight to the death for <laughs> because they were jobs in our districts. But let's understand, there are two new defense domains, cyber and space, hello. Uh, so we've got to really leverage technology to think forward. But my bottom line is um, I think we need more for more, not less for less. Admiral, on the issue of conditionality that we've been talking about, um, there have been some efforts to make this happen already. You know, why hasn't that been enough? And is it even worthwhile to try to pursue this when we've been seeing recently support erode in Congress for continued Ukraine aid? We went from roughly having a third of House Republicans opposing continued aid package to half within the span of a few months. So what is it going to take to turn that around? Well, if, if you look at history, a, a, a crisis or the perception of failure, we get a significant battlefield loss, if you will, or gained by the Russians, lost by Ukraine. Does that drive you to a different strategy? Um, you know, I'm not a political individual, but clearly the, the political dimension is such a key part of this in terms of our ability to sustain this level of effort with this strategy and the fact that we now have got additional conflict makes that even harder and to Jane's previous point Ukraine our strategy with Ukraine and the challenges of Ukraine exist in a broader context and that broader context for us as a global entity that's focused on on the entire world not just on one particularly important but one particular aspect of it how to the, the purpose of this entire two days how do we create a grand strategy that actually enables us to address the challenges of Ukraine, but do it in a way that sustains a broader global effort for us that gets us to a better position in terms of our security, our prosperity, and the well-being of our friends and allies. Instead, we, we're looking to, again, Jane, although Mike said something very similar, instead we seem to be, everything gets looked through an individual microscope, and I'm, guys, that's, this is not a sustainable approach for us. If you treat every issue as both independent and of critical importance, then you tell me how you come up with a coherent strategy to how we're gonna do this. And I think that's an area. I think another challenge is we have got to help the American public understand why is Ukraine important? Why should we be doing this? What is our strategy? Why do we believe that what we're doing will lead to this objective that we've talked about? And at the moment, to 
something Mike said, it, it's an area where I don't think we have done the job we need to do. I think many American citizens, clearly not all, and I don't want to speak for all 335 million, but my sense is many Americans have said, okay, there doesn't seem to be much immediate impact to me in my daily life. Hey, if you want to keep spending this money and supporting, okay, fine. As we see Gaza, as we see other complexity over time, I think as the economic and inflation challenges grow, I think increasingly our citizens are going to say, could you help me understand why we're going down this road? Why are we spending this kind of money? Why is this strategy, do you believe, government? Why is this going to be effective? And I don't think we've really worked on that. And time, to me, time is against us. We are now 20 months into a conflict that initially most people thought would be some, um, some number of days or weeks. And the strategy seems to say, however long it takes, we're comfortable. I don't think that that's really going to work. I don't think that truly, however long it takes, is a sustainable approach. I, I just don't think you live in this environment. I, I don't think you can sustain that. Congressman, I see well, you wanted to respond. Uh, just, uh, there's a lot there, but I think we have done a poor job over many administrations selling why American leadership in the world matters. I think we've done a poor job. I think the good news is that Mike and a number of uh, veterans are now serving in Congress and we're willing, uh, are willing, you know, are great patriots in, in both parties to uh, explain why they made a commitment. Uh, at, and this Mike too, but he didn't, <laughs> he was a little smarter, he didn't serve in Congress. <laughs> Never mind. Sorry, that was an aside. Too many Mike Rogers there already, so. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of, yeah, the name is a little redundant, uh, just saying. Uh, although the others with your name are pretty impressive, too. Uh, but, but back to this. Um, uh, we've, uh, we have not explained why American leadership matters. It was axiomatic after World War II, and it was axiomatic through the Reagan administration, I think, I would say, and then what happened? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm not blaming a particular president. But uh, because we've undersold it, there's now this undercurrent of isolationism in our country, which I think is enormously scary. Uh, we can't build walls high enough. This is not to pick on the wall the, the, uh, on the southern border. But we can't keep out uh, challenges that don't uh, respect walls or, or nation states, like let's go there, cyber, AI, uh, climate terrorism um, in various forms. We, we can't build the walls high enough. We have to be a player in the world. And just this week, I think uh, uh, Mike mentioned it, there was this summit in uh, China with uh, uh, Putin there, uh, uh, the Belt and Road Summit. And China had 140 countries in, in, a, in a meeting talking about how China's vision of the world is, uh, is uh, important and, and I'm sure by their lights, uh, the dominant appropriate one, and here we are. Uh, we can't even get a, get a speaker elected in the House. This is uh, the contrast is just visible and sad. Congressman Waltz, you, you live in a district where selling this kind of a message is pretty difficult, um, and we're entering a time where we have more isolationist kinds of voices that are gaining popularity among voters. You know, how can we balance the need to message to Russia that we were going to continue sending billions of dollars um, to try to dissuade them from the idea that they can outlast us while also not letting those announcements of billions more here and billions more there convince your constituents that we can't afford to pay for this? Th this is what's so frustrating. I mean, we have closed door meetings. I've told the administration Come behind closed doors. No one in the Kremlin, I hope, is going to hear uh, what we're talking about. But can we have an honest conversation on what, not what Zelensky wants. As long as Zelensky has a blank check, he is going to push as far and as long as he can to get as much of his territory back as he can. But behind closed doors, with the people that are constitutionally um, uh, given oversight responsibility and the the checkbook for the American people, tell us what the end state looks like. Is it 2014 line? Is it all of the Donbass? Is it all of Crimea? What is it? And how long and how much do we estimate it's going to cost given the current situation? 
and we can't get an answer then. So either the administration has made a deliberate decision to not make a decision, um, they can't get a decision out of the president, he's not sure, I don't know, but it is, it is, I'm not going to sign off on any more of the taxpayer dollars. And I just wanted to add one thing, uh, until we get that strategy, until we get burden sharing, just two, two more points. I think the, the administration's energy policy has also led to a lot of this, excuse me, um, and, and, and a lot of frustration. You know, every time Putin has invaded a neighbor, uh, 08, 14, 21, 22, the price of oil has been over $100 a barrel. Why are we not flooding the market right now with cheap and cleaner American oil and gas? We should be driving those coffers down Russia, uh, and we should be driving that price down, and oh, by the way, it alleviates a lot of the concerns and burdens that my constituents have. I mean, as, as, as Jane and, and Mike rightly said, this is not, you know, the administration talks about this as a, as a singular issue. They're looking at it through the context of their daily lives and saying, whoa, wait a minute. You know, we're talking about deficits, we're talking about cutting back, we're talking about, uh, you know, smaller government services, whether you're a veteran or, or a truck driver, whomever, and it's just not clear where all the money's going. Um, and just last point on that, from the analysis I've seen, Russia is selling just as much of its oil uh, as it was pre-war. They're just doing it through Hong Kong and they're doing it through India. Uh, I was just out in Delhi and they are processing it and it's going right via ship now rather than pipeline right into the same markets in Europe. So nothing's changed except that Russia's making a bit less money but they're still making plenty to fund this war machine in perpetuity. So this is, we're literally working against ourselves and it's asinine and I think a lot of the American people have said enough. Can I just, go ahead. Ask, ask a question? Yes, this does work. Uh, I agree with the strategy of flooding the market, by the way, with LNG, I, American LNG. And I think Europe was slow to build ports and I think some of that's happening, but I think that's a good idea and I, uh, the, the transition to greener fuel is a good thing, um, but we're not there yet. So why can't we do both? Um, Can you call President Biden and tell him that? Yeah, I, I, okay, I'll call him. I think he's <laughs> hopefully catching up on his sleep today. My God, that was an heroic trip. But, but seriously, uh, my question is, don't we need American leadership in the world now? I mean, are we withdrawing? I, I asked that question about isolationism. It's not just isolationism, but why aren't we more vigorously selling the need for the U.S. to lead around the world? Because in this vacuum, others are selling their needs. China's doing it, Russia's doing it. Uh, the the so-called global south uh, is annoyed with us because they feel that over many years we have lectured them uh, rather than listened to them. And China, uh, you can say the Belt and Road Initiative is a one-way initiative because they build all the infrastructure. Uh, these countries are now in debt and have to pay them back and they use Chinese workers to build it, but it's all over Africa and it's all over Latin America and where are we? So question to this panel, because they're so smart, well, uh, is where, do we still need American leadership? And we're gonna move on to rebuilding hey, can, can just shortly, but well? you can. I, I, I think we have to acknowledge, look, the perception of a weaker America, less engaged in the broader world around it, less willing to stand up for the foundational principles. That, when I mean stand up, I mean commitment of resources, extension of political will, the ability to create co broader coalitions. That perception, you can have an argument if it's true or not, but I think you have to acknowledge, look, in many parts of the world, that perception exists. When that perception exists, we see a much less stable world, and that's exactly what you're watching play out around us now. And so one of the things I would try to be saying to the American public is, you are watching the price of a, of a thought that America's less involved, less willing. Is that is not in our best interest. Do you want this kind of instability, this kind of energy challenge, et cetera? I mean, I, I think we need to make a broader case here. 
Yeah, I, I, no, I agree. I know you want to move on, Jackie, but I just ahead, I have ahead. to I have to <laughs> answer uh, Jane's question because yes, we have some discussion here of an isolationist libertarian uh, right. Um, but to answer your question of why we aren't selling it, we also have a, a progressive left that is openly talking about the United States as not an exceptional country, uh, that one that is uh, at its core and its foundation and founding uh, inherently racist, misogynist, and colonialist, and describing now Israel as a colonialist uh, power. And when that is an overwhelming theme in our schools and our universities and coming from a, the other side, uh, of the of the political extreme, uh, and we're heading into an election year. I mean, it just doesn't. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I th I do think our uh, our adversaries smell uh, a weakness in Washington right now. They smell um, they smell opportunity, and we're seeing them on, and we're seeing them absolutely on the march on every front. Admiral Rogers. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you, before we move on to rebuilding, um, the idea of getting there. Uh, you know, Russia's not going to give back occupied land. And to Congressman Waltz's point, Ukraine is not going to stop fighting uh, as long as they have funding coming to them and until they have security guarantees. So what do you think about a peace agreement that's being tossed around now where... Russian-occupied territory is ceded and Ukraine-controlled territory gets NATO membership? Look, the, the challenge, I think, in terms of security guarantee, because the only way the Ukrainians would potentially agree to this if they truly believe that there was a meaningful security guarantee. Hard to and, do after the Budapest memorandum. And exactly. I'm going, look, if you're, if you're in Kiev, you're going, well, wait, we've been promised this before and you didn't deliver. Why should we believe you this time? And to go again to this perception we've talked about, you know, do you bet on <clears throat> a United States that you're concerned doesn't have the political will to potentially be there? A Europe that says one thing but seems to deliver something much less? Are you really confident given those circumstances? So I think that the probability of that really working practically right now is not high. I just don't see Kiev confident with that and I don't think the Russians would would be inclined to say yes anyway and the other thing is based on Russian actions can you truly believe a, an agreement that the Russians come to so your strategy has got to be are we really th there's a low probability the Russians m wouldn't would in fact guarantee never to come back so does your strategy account for a, a, a probability they in fact would do something like this again and are you really prepared to to fight it, and I don't think that that's there right now, yet. What, let me just clarify that, though, because if they were to get NATO membership, are you saying that wouldn't be a strong enough security guarantee? No, but I, the, the challenge with NATO membership for me is I think that's the long-term desired end state, personally, integrating Ukraine into the European security and economic, whether that's EU and NATO being the most visible signs of that. I do believe that that is the appropriate long-term answer. But that's not a process, the process that you do in 30 days. It just doesn't work that way. So we've got to come up with a strategy to me that accounts for those other things are going to take some period of time. What do you do now to convince both parties that you really want to go down that road? And it, it also involves NATO agreeing. And NATO is not a monolith, as we are seeing. And uh, the new election in Slovakia. Right, that's one of the reasons why there's a big time element could, here. You just uh, don't signal, do it in 30 days. Uh, some divisions, although I think NATO will solidly remain in Ukraine's camp. But with the Article 5 common defense provision, which a country can invoke, it doesn't happen automatically, wouldn't you think that uh, Ukraine, as a member of NATO, would invoke Article 5 uh, if there was, you know, one tiny little piece of Russian aggression and then NATO is the NATO countries are at war with Russia, which is something I don't think they are, are eager to seize. So I, I think that that's been the reluctance for a while in terms of accepting Ukraine into NATO right now. Uh, as a longer term goal, Mike, I agree totally with Mike, that's, that's the plan. But there has to be true peace on the border with Russia. And according to Ukraine, and we could argue whether Ukraine gets to call the shots all by itself, but it is a sovereign country. Uh, they want all their territory back. And remember, even if they become a member of NATO, 
Article 5 can be requested by a nation, but the North Atlantic Council must actually vote to approve for the alliance in Article 5. So again, it, it's a political process. It's not an automatic, hey, you've crossed the tripwire and it automatically goes. So it just goes to the complexity and the time component here. So Congressman Waltz, what do we do? Because you often bring up the fact that China is watching what happens here. And this is all within you know, the context of a looming invasion of Taiwan, concerns that you know, you'd have a difficult time maintaining a NATO-type block against that sort of thing, and whether we'd be alone in that fight. So what do we do? Well, I think you know, a few things. One of the key lessons that we have to learn uh, is you have to arm your allies from a deterrent standpoint before the war starts, not after whole cities and regions have been devastated and then you start incrementally trickling things in. Uh, so that should be lesson one, and I was in uh, Kiev the month before the war, uh, and everything they were asking for, anti-ship, stingers, you name it, there was, uh, there was you know, this, this narrative of tapping the brakes in Washington. We don't want to provoke Putin. We don't want to be too escalatory, slow down. And ironically, and that's where I think there's just a fundamental misunderstanding of deterrence, uh, in this administration that we're seeing over and over again, that's exactly what encouraged Putin to believe he could get away with it, was this kind of slow roll uh, and, and, you know, frankly, risk aversion uh, that was going on uh, pre-war. So with Taiwan, uh, number one, arm them to the teeth. Uh, make it incredibly difficult. And I'm uh, right now leading an FMS task force trying to peel back uh, more and more of the red tape uh, we will only get so far, but uh, trying, to, trying to reform that process. Number two, uh, and this is where I do give the administration some credit with the AUKUS agreement, we have to bolster those allies, particularly in the Quad. I'm also the Republican chair of the India Caucus, the most important relationship of the 21st century. Number three, we have to continue to pull our supply chains out. If we can't get them in the United States, then let's get them in the Western Hemisphere or get them to an allied country like Australia and India. And then four, uh, our dependencies that the Chinese Communist Party have deliberately and pointedly in a matter of state policy developed and created, uh, th th this is going to be won or lost economically well before there's any type of, um, uh, any type of, of military conflict. And just to add to Jane's point on Japan, South Korea, I give them a lot of credit. They're moving to their two defense uh, of GDP commitment as a deterrent measure beforehand, uh, before there is a massive uh, conflict right on their doorstep. And I go back to Germany, Italy, and France that despite it already on their yeah. doorstep still are not. So I think as part of a long-term strategy, um, this is my other frustration. On the one hand, we're hearing analysts and, and the administration officials and others pat themselves on the back that the Russian military has been, has been devastated in many ways. Thousands of tanks, armored vehicles, and artillery pieces lost. Their Air Force uh, uh, incredibly damaged. Uh, their stocks running low. But yet, uh, if we move one soldier, one U.S. soldier out of Europe, then suddenly our deterrence posture is going to be lost. It's really talking out of both sides of their mouth. I think we need to start thinking, looking over the horizon at reducing our force structure in Europe. The Russian military has been conventionally largely uh, sidelined for the foreseeable future. That force structure needs to go to the Asia Pacific. Uh, and to the extent we have uh, American troops left, then move them east. They need to be in Poland. They need to be in the Baltics. They need to be in Romania. Uh, and and uh, at the end of the day, we just cannot continue to sustain an all of the above blank check strategy around the world. We have to lead. Uh, but so we have to demand that our partners and allies that have the, the economic capability to do so pull their fair share. Well, can I add a few things to Go that? Ahead. I agree, lead and demand much more of others. However, how about passing a defense budget on time? You know, funny little fact, we are, spend, we are wasting money on defense because of the way we do these continuing resolutions or shutting government, and we avoid 
uh, getting to the next generation of weapons because we're, again, stuck in last year's funding. And the Pentagon, I don't think anyone would be surprised to learn, is kind of a slow adapter and has been forever. And uh, this is one, again, this one of the rants our little commission is making. Have to change the way we do procurement, have to you know, revitalize the defense industrial base, have to uh, rethink how we recruit because uh, the, the modern generation is very different and has different expectations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, have to confirm generals, just thought I'd put that out there. Uh, but all this junk, you know, the, 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 uh, the drag from a dysfunctional Congress is really hurting our defense capacity. So that's one. I do agree uh, that we have to ramp up. But Taiwan's an interesting case. And I do agree we want to deter China from annexing, invading, uh, blockading uh, Taiwan. What I hear is that the readiness of Taiwanese soldiers is poor. Uh, it's really high in Ukraine. And I don't know exactly how to change that, but I just put it on your agenda, Mike, because if they're not willing to fight, in spite of all the stuff we're going to help them get, uh, that's really bad, And uh, my view. And, and uh, so I, I, I don't know what the answer is there, and I hope I'm wrong, but certainly that's the... Some well, of this, the is gonna sound, this is going to sound uh, parochial, but Ukraine had eight years of Green Berets training him up, so I'm just, you know. Well, <laughs> so let's go. So that explains it. Hey, one other thing about the challenges of continuing resolutions from a, a uniform perspective. Continuing resolutions are designed to sustain ongoing effort. What do you do when part of your strategy is it's about building and generating new capacities in cyber, in space, in other areas like, hey, new capabilities with that'll help us were we to get into a conflict in China. I have to bet when I was Cyber Command, CRs used to frustrate the heck because I'm going, guys, I'm trying to do new starts here. I can't get funding for what we need to do because I'm not behind existing programs. I'm trying to create new capability for the department. And, and think what China might do <clears throat> before it annexes Taiwan as an aggressive uh, intro to this. A, ma a massive cyber attack in the U.S., not that they haven't tried before. Are we ready for that? And has the American public been prepared for what might happen? Uh, because it would be uh, I infrastructure in private hands that could be attacked, not just our, our defense uh, infrastructure. With less than 10 minutes left, I want to get to our final point, if we can envision for a moment that we're in the rebuilding phase here. Um, and with respect to China, part of these questions, a couple things to chew on. Admiral, um, when it comes to rebuilding, we often look at the Marshall Plan, 1940s. Um, today's political climate might be different. You know, how much will concerns about corruption, for instance, um, in Ukraine hamper success in getting that done? Um, how would Nixon achieve that? And then also, what happens if the U.S. does not play a heavy role in rebuilding? Well, do we risk having the rest of the world view the wealthiest nation as walking away when the fighting is over? And, and how do you counter the threat of China gobbling up the reconstruction efforts? Yeah, so clearly, and what would that mean? Lack of U.S. involvement in reconstruction, I think, offers opportunity for others to step in, and that is not in our long-term best interest. Secondly, look, if we think what we've encountered so far in Ukraine is challenging, I would argue the reconstruction dimension is even tougher. It's orders of magnitude in terms of cost. Depending on what figure you want to use, we're approaching a trillion dollars of damage just in the territory that Ukraine still occupies. It doesn't include, if you're going to rebuild Crimea, the Donbass, the south and the east that are currently held by the Russians. Massive amount of money. If we think there's challenges sustaining political will to support a nation in a physical armed confrontation, what are the challenges of sustaining political will when you're going, we want you to write checks and there's no visible conflict. So we're going to, again, this communication idea about why we communicate, why this is important as strategy. And then lastly, clearly this is a coalition kind of approach. It isn't going to be the U.S. unilaterally going, okay, we got this. We did it after the Second World War through the Marshall Plan. We're on it. That, that's not, that, that won't sell politically here. That's not what we need to do. This is about how do you sustain a broader international coalition to do this. Uh, could I just offer a hopeful note? Uh, why not? Just, just a thought. And it's not about Congress. Don't worry, Mike. Uh, 
the hopeful note is we have seized a lot of Russian assets. There are legal issues about what they can be used for, a bunch of yachts all over the place, et cetera, and, and country laws. I get that. It's tricky. But if we could use those assets, let's imagine somehow we get to an end state, whatever that is, uh, some of those uh, for rebuilding, uh, seems to me that would be a good start. The other point that I wanted to offer that's more optimistic is Zelensky has taken steps to cut back on corruption. Endemic corruption has been a huge problem in Ukraine, as it was and is in Russia. Um, and that's part of the reason why uh, the, the Russian uh, <laughs> en entry salvo into Ukraine was so poor, because all the modernization funds had been siphoned off to build yachts. So I mean, Putin either didn't know that or didn't care. Uh, but point is, uh, Zelensky has fired a bunch of generals, including his defense minister, etc. That's a good start. Uh, more has to happen. But there is an idea floating in Ukraine, because they are technically savvy, uh, that they want to build a different economic model from other European countries, uh, you know, a startup nation model like the one in Israel. Don't know if that could get legs, but maybe it could get legs, and it could jumpstart all the corruption and all the backward-leaning uh, development, if that's even a, a proper word, uh, that was going on there for some years, and give them an opportunity to be uh, a successful economy, uh, much more successful than before this horror started. I always, Jackie, I always uh, have an open invitation uh, to, uh, I was just, saying this to some Pentagon officials, but to kind of in the beltway uh, DC think tankers or other you know, analysts, others looking at this issue, open invitation to come to one of my town halls. Uh, and when I have a room full of teachers, uh, underpaid teachers, underpaid first responders, firefighters, policemen uh, and women and others, and try to talk to them about why we're paying billions of dollars of Ukrainian first responder salaries or we're sending billions of dollars of direct economic assistance into their economy when they're sitting there underpaid with their own needs, it is a non-starter. And I think one of the conversations we're having now on the Hill uh, is, are we, should the United States be looking at military aid only? What's the hardware that is going to end this war and again, if we're talking about Europe stepping up and having its fair share, it's going to have to be in the non-military space and the world. I mean, H.W. Bush, Baker, Schultz, and others had a global 10-cup campaign uh, in the first Gulf War saying, look, everyone is affected by this, then everyone needs uh, to collectively step up, and they did. I'm not seeing that outside of this White House. I'm seeing, hey, Republicans, you know, get on board, keep signing checks, and it is just, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to do it. Uh, it's, it's just not sustainable, but I think it reflects the conversation around this is going to, again, go right back to what is our end state, and the conversation is going to shift from how do we win the war, because that's been completely ill-defined, to how do we end the war. Uh, and as we head into this election season, I think that is the conversation you're going to you're going to see more and more, and everything will then flow from that. Admiral, did you want to expand on that at all? I saw you nodding a few times. No, um, no I mean, I, the, the challenge to me in some ways is it isn't, this isn't just about resources. Because if you make it about only resources, I well, guys, that's not sustainable for us. If this is just becomes a dialogue about, well, it's just how big are the checks you're going to write, whether the check is for military assistance, humanitarian, economic, whatever. It, it's got to be about more than just the resource piece, and it's also got to be about how do we look for opportunity. I think Jay made a very important point. This is also represents opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to project a different image, to create a different perception in the world around us. It's an opportunity for Ukraine to both address fundamental corruption issues, but also potentially recast itself in, in a different focus, economically, politically. And it's also, I think, an opportunity for Europe to show, hey, look, we are behind our words. 
Now, we'll see if we have the political will to do that, but I would be trying to show, look, there's great opportunity here if we're willing to do this, but it can't just be about how big a check are you going to write. That, that's just not a good place. 30-second point is I wanted to uh, – Jane brought up a great uh, point on the Russian uh, foreign currency reserves that are currently sitting uh, frozen – uh, and by some estimates, uh, in, to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. There, uh, we are working with the lawyers at Treasury. This will be a bit of a Pandora's box uh, if you literally take and spend uh, foreign currency reserves and how that then affects the international banking system. But that is, uh, that is legislation that is being actively discussed. Make Russia pay for Ukraine's rebuilding. But we need these types of ideas instead of here's another supplemental, here's another supplemental. It's just not going to work. So it sounds like we're ending on a note of moving on from obligation and moving toward opportunity then, because we've been talking so much about how, you know, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in exchange for security guarantees. Um, you know, the U.S. is the defender of freedom uh, and justice and liberty in the, United States, in the world, uh, and our obligation to uphold that Congresswoman, how do you shift the conversation to opportunity and have it matter to regular Americans, to voters who are maybe not paying as much attention to what's happening abroad? Well, I love that question. I just love it. And uh, one of my other gigs these days, I mean, I've I'm suffering for never saying no, including coming to this panel and early in the morning. Uh, but I chair the board of something called Freedom House, which is the oldest human rights organization in America, strictly nonpartisan. And to make a bigger point, I, I have been insistent that we have a, uh, a bipartisan co-chairmanship. And so the new co-chair will be somebody named Wendell Wilkie, who is the grandson of Wendell Wilkie, who was... Uh, the opponent of uh, Franklin Roosevelt back in the 40, in 1940, lost, and then formed this organization with, wait for this, Eleanor Roosevelt and a few others. And it puts out a Freedom in the World report every year that's highly respected, uh, which shows, surprise, freedom's going down. Um, what is my point about this? My point is that selling freedom in the world is one of America's best weapons. Freedom in America, too. And I don't disagree, by the way, Mike, that some of the isolationism and liber I wouldn't call it libertarianism, but the, 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 uh, I don't want to use, I don't want to use the W word, uh, some, some word, that both the left and the right are responsible for refusing uh, to embrace the robustness of American democracy and letting us talk about issues where we disagree. I mean, that used to be what we did. We're, we just did it on this stage, although I don't think we disagreed too much. But, but my point is, uh, selling freedom is something we can do. China can't do that. Russia can't do that. Uh, I, I don't agree that we should have a military-only uh, foreign, you know, foreign uh, military, foreign whatever you call it, uh, defense budget, because I think selling our soft power is extremely powerful. Uh, and, you know, things like American culture it may sound a little silly, but very popular. You know, you talk about India. India has a robust film industry because of us. Our, it's, it's modeled on ours. And, and that's a big deal there. And so my, my bottom line is uh, we have tools that we are not using. And part of the problem is we have a dysfunctional Congress. Another part of the problem is we have presidents who have not sold it well. And the last president we have had who sold it well, as I look back on it, was Ronald Reagan. And I think Ronald Reagan's vision of the shining city on the hill is an enduring vision of what America should be. We're going to have to leave it there. We are, we are out of time, but this has been a great discussion. Um, Congresswoman Jane Harmon, Admiral Mike Rogers, Congressman Mike Waltz, thank you all for being here. This concludes our panel. Our next panel begins at 9.20. Please take a few minutes to enjoy your breakfast. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to take your seats as we begin our second panel of the day. To say that our world is in flux would imply that there was once a time and place where it was not. In his book, Leadership, former Secretary of State and National Security Advisor and Nixon Foundation Director Emeritus, Dr. Henry Kissinger wrote, then as now, an important school of thought maintained that stability and peace were the normal state of international affairs, while conflict was the consequence of either misunderstanding or malevolence. Nixon's perception was more dynamic. He viewed peace as a state of fragile and fluid equilibrium among the great powers, a precarious balance that in turn constituted a vital component of international stability. The rise of the People's Republic of China, the 20-year disillusion of democracy in Russia, new challenges in Africa, throughout the South Pacific, and especially now in the Middle East, are contributing to an era of, well, flux. To begin this program, please welcome Leland Vittert, host of On Balance with Leland Vittert on News Nation, who will moderate the discussion and introduce our panel participants. Good morning. All right, this is actually working. Thank you. There wasn't too loud an applause, so I don't have to say to wait until you hear what I say. Uh, panelists with us uh, this morning, and uh, thank you. Hold your applause until we get through everybody. Body Glasser, Managing Director of the Indo-Pacific Program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Shiguri Kitamaro, uh, former Secretary General of National Security Secretariat of Japan. Matt Pottinger, former U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor and John Sedalides. Principal at Trilogy Advisor, Senior Fellow, National Security Program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, thank you very much all to be joining us. And obviously, uh, since we put this panel together, uh, things have changed a little bit uh, in the world. When we all talked a week ago Friday, um, we thought we were going to begin with China uh, and the, the changes that we were seeing out of China. Obviously, uh, world events uh, have intervened. Uh, 50 years ago, almost to the day, was the Yom Kippur War. And while history does not necessarily repeat itself, it does sometimes rhyme, as Twain said. And the attack on Israel by Hamas brings us back to that time. And some of the events we've seen since then remind us of Yom Kippur. Uh, President Nixon was uh, famously credited with both uh, saving Israel uh, and, and his clear-minded foreign policy uh, is also credited uh, with preventing it from spreading into a larger war. And he was interviewed about that and his thoughts about how he stared down the Soviets as it related uh, to the Middle East uh, after his presidency. We'll take a listen to that. There were 85 Soviet ships in the Mediterranean uh, that on those ships, among other things, were helicopters and landing barges, and that three Soviet airborne divisions, 50,000 men, where it had been placed on alert. But we could not allow the Soviet Union to intervene unilaterally there, because if they had, we would have been forced to intervene. I know that Senator Mansfield had told us earlier uh, in the month, right after the war, he said, we don't want another Vietnam there. But another member of Congress, who was in the majority on the Democratic side, made it very clear to the con uh, in contrast. He said, uh, we want to be sure that Israel is continues uh, to have support. And I said, I will not let Israel go down the tube. And I knew uh, that under the circumstances, we could not stand by and let the Soviet Union move in. And that would risk a world war. So under the circumstances, therefore, I approved an alert, uh, alert of our forces, uh, nuclear and conventional. Uh, a couple of days after that, Brezhnev backed down. Uh, and finally, the ceasefire went into place. But this is all uh, by now the 26th of October, only 20 days after the Yom Kippur War began. November 1st, uh, the tide had changed by that time. The ceasefire was in place. Golda Meir, shortly after that, flew into Washington, thanked me uh, very generously for the support we had given. And November the 7th, after a time of a lapsing of six years, uh, Egypt 
and the United States normalized their relations and Henry Kissinger started on his very successful shuttle trip. Summarizing it all, I think it's very important to note here two things. One, this is not a demonstration of detente failing but succeeding. Unless I'd had the personal relationship with Brezhnev, unless he knew from what I had said to him at Camp David that we would not stand by unless I had developed that kind of relation, and unless he was looking forward to another summit the next year, uh, I do not think uh, that uh, we would have been successful in keeping them out. That helped. Uh, the second point is that we handled the whole situation in a way uh, that saved Israel, but at the same time did not totally alienate the Egyptians, because the Israelis, by the time the ceasefire occurred, had all totally surrounded the Egyptian Third Army, which was on the other side of the Suez Canal. So they held back, and the Egyptians were appreciative of that. And so as a result, this was one of those wars which ended with peace without victory. And peace without victory is virtually the only kind of peace you can have that will survive in that kind of a situation. You can have too great a victory. If it is too great, what happens is you plant the seeds for another war. And it lasted for 50 years, uh, if you want to say there was peace in the Middle East. Uh, Matt, we've seen some moves by the Russians now that mimic what the Soviets did 50 years ago. Vladimir Putin has now moved uh, his hypersonic missiles and deployed forward deployed them now to the Mediterranean, uh, conceivably where they could take on uh, the U.S. Navy there. What do you make of President Biden's military moves, diplomatic moves, his trip there to Israel, and what do you expect him to say tonight? Well, look, I, I give President Biden credit for making the trip to Israel. I give him credit for sending not one but two carrier strike groups. I, I think the Biden administration's response in Israel, as in Ukraine, uh, is better after the war starts <laughs> than, than uh, in, in terms of deterring war in the first place. And, and there's a lesson in that with respect to Taiwan. Uh, I've seen some reporting, I think Reuters had a, a, a very interesting report uh, citing unnamed Israeli officials about some of the tactics that Hamas was using to try to lull Israel into a sense of complacency. And they were uh, intentionally feeding disinformation into the intelligence stream in Israel. And the intelligence that they were feeding were two things, senior Hamas leaders, other things, saying we're not, we don't intend to take on Israel anytime soon, we're not, and, and we're not capable of taking on Israel anytime soon. And then we saw what happened, uh, the, the tragedy of this uh, massive terrorist assault uh, less than two weeks ago. So there's a lesson in that. We can't be overly confident that uh, we understand all the signals coming out of Beijing. Beijing is, the, is a master of deception. They wrote the book, quite literally, uh, you know, a couple thousand years ago. ago. So, um, uh, but I, but I, do, I don't know what he's going to talk about specifically tonight, but, um, but I do give him credit for sending those, uh, those strike groups. Mr. Kitamura, I thought it was interesting. The largest rally I saw uh, for Israel was in Tokyo. And the pictures from downtown Tokyo of people waving I Israeli flags, was it was a massive, massive crowd. Maybe that didn't surprise you. It awfully surprised me, even as somebody who has studied the Middle East. What, what did that tell you? I think in Japan, the uh, right of the expression and the demonstration is totally guaranteed. And uh, I think it's a very natural reaction of the Israeli who uh, stay in Tokyo. I have some, I'm not a specialist in this region, but I have some observation uh, on this issue. In mid-September, the US government lifted uh, $6 billion in frozen Iranian funds in exchange for releasing five U.S. hostages. And eight days before the October 7th, the Hamas attacks, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said, the situation in the Middle East is the most stable in the past 20 years 
and since 9-11. These phenomena mean two things. First, security policymakers were not aware of the attacks until shortly before they occurred. In other words, it's an intelligence failure. Second, it indicates that the U.S. is not exercising appropriate policy in the long term toward Iran, which is a strong ally in the, in the act of uh, terrorism. I'm actually raise one my favorite quote from President Nixon. If you take no risks, you will suffer no defeats. But if you take no risks, you will know victories. This phrase is going with my way of life. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, and I think uh, certainly uh, <laughs> that, that proves apt right now. Bonnie, I, I'm glad Matt brought up sort of the way China has, has acted in, in perhaps we don't quite understand fully their, their way of thinking. Matt pointed out they, they literally wrote the book. I think you're referring to Art of War. Um, when I was in Israel, it was famous that the Israelis, when they would want to have a conversation in front of you and have you not understand it, they would speak in Hebrew. And they did this about very classified information. You could be with their military or their diplomats or Netanyahu or whatever, and he would speak freely in Hebrew to his advisors or his friends, and <clears throat> you'd have no idea what they were saying, obviously. Um, interestingly enough, uh, there's a, a story where a Chinese delegation came to look at some weapon systems and the Israelis would freely talk uh, in Hebrew in front of the Chinese delegation about the capabilities and uh, what they could and couldn't tell the Chinese, and they compared their we weapon systems to the Chinese weapon systems, on and on and on, and shared some very ha highly classified information between the Israelis and Hebrew. And at the end of their trip, four or five days, the senior Chinese general said in perfect Hebrew, Thank you very much. We are so glad to have come here to Israel and to have seen all of your weapon systems. Thank you. Have a nice day. We look forward to welcoming you to Beijing. The Israelis were obviously stunned, but it goes to, I think, what Matt was talking about, which is the lack of understanding in America about how China is playing the game. Fair? Well, I think anybody who's been following uh, China's approach uh, to the world, and certainly we can look at uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, in February 2022, but even before that, the uh, very long uh, joint uh, communique that Putin signed with Xi Jinping. And you can't help but conclude that uh, China is looking at the world through the prism of its competition with the United States and wants to undermine U.S. global influence. And I think that in part explains its response to Ukraine, and it certainly explains its response to, uh, to Hamas's attack on Israel. The Chinese, for a long time, um, have taken a, a position of having, trying to have good relations with both sides. They obviously have diplomatic relations with Palestine, and they have had a very important relationship with Israel, which, of course, your story um, underscores how important the technology and defense technology relationship um, was in the past. And uh, so it, it really, um, I think, shouldn't surprise anybody that the Chinese came out with a statement of calling for an end of hostilities, uh, supporting a two-state solution. Um, I think there are many in Israel who are disappointed. Uh, uh, so the Chinese have said there should be no civilians who are killed, but um, uh, you know they're not pointing fingers. And as far as I can tell, there has not been a single statement out of China yet that has even mentioned Hamas. Uh, so yeah, or called for the return of hostages or any of these. Ab issues. Yeah, no mention of, of hostage release. So you know the, the Chinese say that they at some point would like to spend, send their special envoy. Uh, but they're not going to be a mediator of this conflict. They neither have the hard power or the soft power in the Middle East, I believe, to have a really significant impact on the outcome. 
No, but they certainly, I think to your point, though, would have a desire to try and undermine whatever U.S. work is done and U.S. influence there. That's the goal. John, um, great power competition, a world in flux, and uh, to pick up where Bonnie uh, left off, that how much is it enough for China to just play spoiler to U.S. influence, uh, whether it be plain spoiler as it relates to Ukraine and NATO, plain spoiler as it relates to the Middle East, plain spoiler, and this is a little bit more directed towards them, as it relates to, say, the South China Sea? I think it depends on the situation. I don't think that Beijing is necessarily, I mean, when I say Beijing, I'm talking about the Chinese Communist Party, right? We need to be clear that everything we say and do regarding our relations with China must pass through the filter of this rigid Leninist ideology that dominates the government in, or controls the government in Beijing. Um, I would imagine it's uh, not necessarily zero sum in every instance, Leland, that where China can benefit from some measure of cooperation or an affinity of interests, it might pursue it. Unfortunately, I don't know that we're clear yet in the Middle East what that situation will look like or how it plays out in the weeks and months ahead. And if I might, I want to just pull back a second to the Middle East itself, because from a grand strategy perspective, the U.S. is dealing with a number of major objectives or priorities it needs to sort out. One, first of all, what is going to be the role of the Arab governments, the Sunni Arab governments in the Middle East regarding the future of the Palestinian people? They've had largely the luxury of sitting this out, or in the case of, say, Qatar, funding Hamas and destabilizing the situation in the Middle East. But to what extent, perhaps, say, when this war is over, or at least this initial phase of the war, would Arab governments volunteer their militaries to serve as a peacekeeping force in Gaza to replace whatever the Israeli defense forces leave of it when this is over? What do we do about the Shia theocracy in, in Tehran that is sponsoring terrorism around the world, including here in the United States, that still has bounties on former American officials, including some of your former colleagues, Matt, um, and is seeking to actively destabilize the Middle East, but is also now a major provider of oil under long-term contracts to China, as is Saudi Arabia. We have the issue of nuclear proliferation in the Middle East, and I think to one extent, perhaps, I can't read anyone's mind, one of the reasons that Iran may have greenlit the Hamas attack on Israel is not just to deflect the progress that was being made on the Abraham Accords with possible Saudi participation, but specifically to make sure that the, the component of that deal that would allow for the U.S. to support a nuclear weapons program in Saudi Arabia would be derailed, and Iran remains the only other nuclear power in the Middle East so as to achieve its regional hegemonic aspirations vis-a-vis -vis Israel. And I would just uh, conclude on this. One, first of all, Russia and China are going to be major diplomatic players now. It's a very changed world, ladies and gentlemen, and we have to contend somehow, and I guess this is part of the larger grand strategy theme here, uh, the, the America of the Cold War is behind us. That ended in 1991. And I think the dealing with the communist threat on a global scale galvanized a measure of American solidarity that we simply don't have today, as you heard from the prior panelists. We have a decomposition of American solidarity, a cohesiveness in this country that is sorely lacking, and I think that's going to weaken us on the global stage. But I would say, given China's ability to bring about a rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran back in March, while all this has been going on the last couple of weeks, we missed the fact that China welcomed Bashir Assad, to Beijing as well as the Crown Prince of Kuwait. And so making major diplomatic inroads in an area that maybe is somewhat rethinking whether or not America is a credible ally of the Sunni governments in the region. And I'll just close again with one reference to the earlier panel, Leland, and that is the degree to which the Middle East is an extremely important part of the world because our Asian allies and our European allies are so heavily dependent on the Middle East for oil and natural gas and the degree to which they can be weaned from that dependence more towards, again, as the earlier panelists said, U.S. and other friendly, let's call it near-shoring or near-sourcing of hydrocarbons as we move through the transition of the decades ahead and a more pronounced dependence on nuclear energy so that what happens in the Middle East is less important over the long term to our critical allies in Asia and Europe. 
And I think all of these components have to be part of a larger grand strategy, and then we'll dig more deeply into China and Russia as well. A lot there. Um, I, I'm thinking about what you said in terms of China's forays into the Middle East. Mr. Kitamara, what do you make of the, not necessarily the, the visits to China, but China's visits, say, to Saudi Arabia? Um, and the, 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 the welcome that Xi Jinping was given in Saudi Arabia is second only to like the, the, the next coming of Jesus or something, the way he was welcomed there and, and the Saudis cozying up to them. This is, a, you know, this is a problem that's been going on for 3,000 years or longer in the Middle East. Does China have the wherewithal, the knowledge, the understanding to insert itself effectively? It's on. Yeah, I'm sure. But uh, in any house, Xi Jinping has already started his uh, global strategy, one uh, Belt One Road initiative. Uh, concerning the uh, intervention toward the Middle East, I believe the motivation for the uh, energy is so important for China. Uh, therefore, they try to uh, reconciliate uh, Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. It's a very uh, natural uh, policy, but at the same time, in considering actual situation, uh, China is also a little bit uh, disappointed at this uh, turbulent situation in the Middle East. Matt, the the grand strategy, if you will, of the Biden administration, right, was to sort of pivot away from the Middle East. They felt as though they could leave Afghanistan, um, perhaps encourage the expansion of the Abraham Accords a little bit. But there was a, a clear pivot away in order to pivot to China. Um, is that something that's possible even, or are we learning that the United, any time the United States does pivot away from anywhere, that they get caught with their pants down, for lack of a better term. Yeah, well, I, I think that's the lesson of, um, of the uh, Hamas assault. The, you, the, you, <laughs> you, you can want to have less to do with the Middle East, but the Middle East still wants to have a lot to do with us. And so the Abraham Accords that President Trump and his administration completed w was a great inheritance, I think, for this country and for and for the Biden administration, I mean, what, and, and it supports the idea of um, economizing our forces a bit in the Middle East. If you have Sunni Arab states cooperating with Israel uh, as a counterbalance to Iran and its uh, terrorist proxies, um, that's a good strategy. The, the problem early in the Biden administration, and they're working to recover from these mistakes, was that President Biden alienated the Sunni Arab allies, and that was a, that was a big strategic mistake. It was unnecessary, and uh, we're now we're now feeling the blowback from that. Um, again, I'm very glad that President Biden made the trip to Israel, but he, you know, partly due to the disinformation uh, of terrorists claiming that Israel had bombed a hospital in Gaza, which is disinformation. It was actually Islamic Jihad, uh, most likely. Um, President Biden was unable to get meetings with, with some Arab leaders. I, I don't think that would have happened if he had played the first couple of years of the administration differently with his Middle East policy. Yeah, it's pretty stunning that we give billions of dollars to the Egyptians and the Jordanians and then they wouldn't meet, meet with the President. Bonnie, uh, how, how do you view China's move to try to capitalize on this? And how, from, a, from just a... a a strategy perspective, how does Xi Jinping look now two and a half years into the, the Biden administration? How do they look right now at the change between Trump policies and Biden policies? Well, first I want to raise a broad question and then I'll get to that. And uh, the uh, Trump administration, of course, when it came in and wrote its national security strategy centered on great power competition, which is what our panel is about today, but uh, there's a broader question, of course, uh, after what's going on in the Middle East is, uh, should we be completely turning away from terrorism as, as a threat? And we learn so much as a country and a military 
about how to fight terrorism, um, I think we need to keep that muscle memory working. And so I wonder in national security strategies going forward whether there will be some greater discussion about threats uh, that the United States and our allies uh, face from, from terrorism. Um, I think that uh, Xi Jinping felt in the first uh, few years after uh, President Trump came to power, um, and Matt, of course, knows this well, um, that he was able uh, to work with the Trump administration. And I think this was in, in part uh, because uh, there was, at, at, at least um, after a few missteps at the beginning and understanding reach that uh, President Trump would um, adhere to the one China policy, uh, which was not inevitable, but he did uh, accept. And then when they met um, uh, at uh, Mar-a-Lago, Xi Jinping essentially agreed that he would do some uh, uh, work with the U.S. or uh, in coordination with the U.S. Uh, to put pressure on North Korea um, and, and pass more uh, uh, resolutions in the, in the U.N. Security Council and sanctions, um, and that the, the trade issue of our bilateral trade deficit would essentially be put on the shelf. And I think COVID fundamentally undermined that understanding, and uh, President Trump, I think, sort of rightly uh, called out um, what the Chinese um, were doing, obviously, um, you know, COVID uh, emanated in, it, it originated in, in Wuhan. Uh, so uh, the, the, the Chinese had hoped when President uh, Biden came in that they could go back to the Obama administration. I think it took them um, uh, well over, probably over a year before they finally accepted that uh, the Biden administration really was going to inherit its assessment of the threats that China posed. There's some difference in approaches, but I would say they built on many of the, uh, the Trump administration's approaches. And so now the Chinese have come to understand we have a bipartisan consensus in the United States about the threats uh, that China poses. And uh, though I still think that they believe that uh, if President Trump were to be reelected, uh, that the, um, uh, that they could deal with him in a more transactional way. Um, and they believe that he's not as committed to protecting Taiwan as President Biden is. Interesting. Um, this is a quote from 1980, The Real War. Either we act like a great power or we will be reduced to a minor power. And thus reduced, we will not survive, nor will freedom or Western values survive. Mr. Kitamara, from our the perspective of our Asian allies, specifically Japan, uh, that's now ramping up its own military forces. Does Japan look at the United States as still acting like a great power? I believe the presence of the United States in the Asia Pacific region, uh, in the Pacific region, is a cornerstone of the security of Japan. At the same time, the safety of the uh, Taiwan Strait. Uh, last year, Prime Minister Kishida uh, prescribed the new national security strategy, which prescribed the counter-strike capability and the doubling the uh, defense expenditure. It's a very historical shift for the our defense policy. Uh, I believe at the same time, the Prime Minister Kishida decided to double the uh, defense expenditure. I think it's rather coping with his surrounding situation because during the tenure of the Prime Minister Abe, he's uh, from time to time uh, criticized as hawkish politician in Japan. But the, during his tenure, the expenditure of the defense budget is almost 1%. Uh, of course, he keeps a very uh, close relationship with the President Trump. At the same time, he uh, pay attention to his difficult neighbor. Uh, he met 27th time uh, with President Putin in order to conclude the uh, peace treaty. And uh, because of the 
COVID-19, it was uh, uh, canceled, but uh, he tried to invite uh, Xi Jinping as the uh, state guest to Japan. Uh, I think compared with two, uh, two prime ministers, maybe uh, Prime Minister Abe is underscore the power of the diplomacy with neighbors. And uh, such kind of uh, multi-layered system, uh, expenditure of the defense and diplomacy, and the multi-layered uh, international system, like Quad and the free and open in the Pacific, such kind of uh, mobilization of the policy enhanced the deterrence of Japan. But actually, the surrounding situation uh, has changed because the Ukraine warfare uh, started. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister Kishida aligned more closely to the United States. Therefore, in order to keep the deterrent power of Japan, it's important for us to double the uh, military expenditure in the near future. Thank you. John, I'll flip that on its head. As you, as you look at the, the world looking at America, uh, does it, does it appear that we do have a grand strategy, that there is something holding a thread through all of our foreign policy moves, or is it, as Matt pointed out, uh, much more reactionary? I think in many ways, unfortunately, it is more reactionary. And again, alluding to the earlier panel, we really haven't had the kind of strategic thinking in the United States Basically, since the end of the Cold War, we still call the post-Cold War era the post-Cold War era, defining about what took place before 1991. And I would say in many ways the U.S. today, now especially in the U.S.-China competition, is looking to define this new era as one that upholds the so-called rules-based international order, which we feel is under threat possibly with any Chinese actions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Taiwan, obviously with the Russian invasion, or I should say re-invasion of Ukraine, and now, of course, with everything roiling in the Middle East. And uh, I'm not faulting this administration. I think there's been a larger lack of leadership here in Washington, especially throughout our political class, and uh, a lack of uh, communication with the American people as to why American leadership on the world stage, I personally believe, is still fundamental to some sense of world peace, relatively speaking, and shared prosperity around the world. And even with Ukraine, I, I do fault the administration on this, as well as Republican supporters of this so-called winning strategy. I mean, I still have not had any serious individual explain to me how Ukraine can actually win a war against Russia. Russia is not only a nuclear superpower, it is a commodity superpower. We keep talking about the oil and gas it's selling to China and to India, but more than 100 countries around the world want nothing to do with American and Western sanctions on, on Russia over Ukraine. And so we're losing the global south in many ways to China and to Russia. And the Ukraine war is a catalyst for all of this. So we need to really rethink if we've made some bad decisions getting into Ukraine. And I don't know if some of you may have picked this up in the last week or so. Even the NSC uh, spokesman, John Kirby, he spoke last week in front of the microphones and said, we're getting to the end of the rope on Ukraine. Somehow this missed most media coverage. But inside the White House, I have to believe they're looking now for ways to extricate themselves from ongoing $100 billion annual commitments to Ukraine. So um, on the larger question, Leland, yes, that is lacking on the grand strategy level. It doesn't mean that we can't continue to try to devise at least components of a grand strategy. And I just want to close on one thing here with these remarks, Leland, and not just because Shigeru is here on stage, but the Japan-U.S. relationship is maybe one of the most important alliances, from my perspective, for the United States, and we almost never talk about this publicly. We focus on U.S. alliances with many other countries. But if you look at the fact that we're both major democracies, economic powers, technology powers, and security powers, especially over the issue of Taiwan now, you know, I think the U.S. has the will to be as supportive of Japan in the event of a crisis around Taiwan. My longer-term grand strategy concern, Leland, is will we have the capacity to be the stalwart ally and military security provider for Japan if, for instance, now with high interest rates here in the United States, 
our federal debt service is about to exceed, if it hasn't already, our annual defense outlays. So what does the United States do when we're paying $1 trillion a year for debt service alone, let alone the fact that we're not able to tackle entitlements in this country? Do we have the capability to build up the defense systems we need and push the frontiers of physics and computing to deal with a massive ongoing Chinese military buildup that may upend security throughout the Western Pacific? That's a great, it's a great point in terms of the U.S. military supremacy, which is what won the Cold War and, and went along with the diplomatic strategy as well because the world knew we could back it up. Matt, from a domestic political perspective, can you have a grand strategy when now both parties have this extraordinarily vocal and increasingly powerful populist wing to it? Yeah, I mean, w the moment we're in right now is a lot like the 1930s. We had a very divided country in the 30s. You had some pretty wacky ideologies that were gaining traction in the 30s. Um, of course, we had a depression. Uh, things were worse in, in, in many ways, of course, in the 1930s, but we, we were doing our best to emulate <laughs> or imitate some of, some of the, the less desirable aspects of that period. Uh, it took a war to shake us out of that, uh, and I, I'm, I'm really hoping that um, it, it's not going to require a direct hot war for us to get our act together politically. We need, to, we need better leadership. Um, across Washington, to John's point, it's, this isn't, we're not just talking about uh, uh, the executive branch or one person. It's, we've, so the answer is yes, because we've been in, we've been in a bad place before. Um, we were able to recover from that. Uh, it's just, I'd like to, to do that short of revolution and short of war this time. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Bonnie, are you seeing China understand where America is? And we've, we've known that the Russians uh, over time, you know, since the 50s, were involved in trying to influence U.S. policy both overtly and covertly. Are the Chinese doing the same thing? Are we doing enough to stand up to them in order to be able to have a strategy uh, versus them defining our strategy for us internally? Oh, it's a, it's a great question, Leland. I think that uh, the Chinese um, really do have a grand strategy to deal with, uh, with the United States. They uh, understand where American weaknesses are. Uh, they are working hard to divide us from our allies. Uh, Matt talked earlier about uh, the disinformation that the Russians are using. Uh, we have seen more disinformation come out of China in the last um, few years than we saw for decades uh, before that. And there is some collaboration between Russia and, and China on content farms and amplifying each other's messages, which I think is, is extremely dangerous, but does uh, really indicate, I think, how closely uh, Putin's worldview is aligned with Xi Jinping, which doesn't mean, of course, that Moscow and Beijing agree on everything, uh, but they, uh, in my view, very effectively compartmentalize their differences and work together where they converge uh, in, in their interests. So I think that we shouldn't underestimate uh, what the Chinese are trying to achieve. Um, and potentially their their ability to do it. Uh, you know, many people talk about uh, whether we should be de-risking or decoupling uh, from China. Uh, we should be crystal clear that it is the Chinese who really started uh, to emphasize technological self-reliance as as a driver um, for their strategy to achieve national rejuvenation, uh, and that was long before. Uh, the Biden administration came to power. So this is, um, uh, this is a strategy that uh, the, the, the Chinese are going to try and work uh, uh, on their, their, use their relations with Russia, with, uh, with, with the global South countries, which many of them are very uh, supportive of, of China. And they are going to try and, and, and divide us from our allies and, and exploit our weaknesses and use opportunities where they emerge. And going back to your reference earlier to 
China, um, uh, essentially, I don't know if I'd say mediating, uh, but um, enabling an agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I would say it was opportunistic. Um, there aren't too many countries in the world that have good relations with both and could help the two countries that wanted to uh, improve their relations. And so Beijing stepped up. Uh, but I don't think that Beijing is going to be, as I said earlier, uh, the, the leader of uh, mediating peace, either between Russia and Ukraine or between Palestine and Israel and Hamas. Yeah, the, what China can do by itself versus what China and Russia can do together is a, is a vastly different thing. Mr. Kitamura, you know, there's the, the saying in English, um, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Is it too late for the United States to do what Nixon did? And I'll read the quote. The U.S. must play a leading role on the world stage. On dozens of occasions during the Cold War, the U.S. proved that it was the only nation in the free world that consistently had extended its power far beyond its borders to blunt Soviet aggression. Is it too late for the United States to play Beijing and Moscow off each other in the way that Richard Nixon did? Uh, from time to time, the, uh, Russia and the China is described as, to some extent, allies. But uh, the relation is not uh, too ju- uh, always. <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> always uh, good. Actually, I explain a little bit the situation. The Sino-Russian relations are generally good, but the Ukraine war has limited the scope of the relationship in several areas. For example, the Chinese banks have been reluctant to invest in Russia and the suspended plans to build a railroad to Beijing. The Chinese, said, the Chinese said aside has stated that the Ukraine war was a cause. The Chinese fear a second round of the U.S. sanctions. For example, concerning the pipeline plan, power of uh, Siberia too, they never reached an agreement with the construction of any pipeline until now. It will start the operation in 2025, it's expected. However, it's not possible. And there is no common understanding of what to do with Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO, and the BRICS in the future. Regarding SCO, China wants to make it a counterbalance to the U.S. On the other hand, Russia wants to use it not only as a counterbalance, but also as a concrete regional security entity. Russia has shown a supporting posture for India. India also opposed China's push for the yuan to become the reserve currency within the BRICS. Russia is frustrated by China's slow support to Russia or by Ukraine warfare. Russia's current position concerning ceasefire of Ukraine is ceasefire is impossible without China's involvement. On the other hand, China is willing to consider mediation if Russia becomes more flexible. But there are no signs that Putin is showing any flexibility. I want to get Matt in on this. Real quick, Matt. One thing that we've seen with the United States has, at least they feel they've been effective in doing, is being able to stop Chinese arms shipments, lethal arms shipments into Russia. How does that play into what Mr. Kitamura was saying? Well, you remember shortly after the Russian failed assault on Kiev in February of 2022, President Biden had a video call with Xi Jinping And according to President Biden's own account of that call, he told Xi Jinping, you need the U.S. economy a lot more than you need the Russian economy, so do not provide weapons uh, to Russia. 
And I think that he drew a red line. I, th I think that red line has played an important role, but it's also clear that Beijing's trying to, to, to tread or skirt that red line, or at, at least around the edges. A lot of the things that matter most to Russia's military response are components, you know, chips and drones and things that are dual use and not strictly military. And that's, that's ended up being very important for the Russian uh, campaign. So we, President Biden, I, I think he may very soon be tested on the red line that he drew. I, I wanted to add, I th agreeing with, uh, with uh, Kita Murasan, uh, and wanted to add one, one other point to the, your question to him. I, this was an uneasy marriage between Russia and China. Nonetheless, it is a marriage now. This is what Putin and Xi Jinping both call a no-limits pact, right? I think we want to set the conditions for the divorce when it eventually comes. It, and it's going to be a nasty divorce, especially for Russia. And Xi Jinping's not going to be paying child support anymore when that happens. Um, I don't think that, that, will, that divorce will occur until one of the two men dies. They both intend to stay in power till death. But once one of them does die, it's gonna, it's, it, a lot of the natural problems in that relationship will start to express themselves more. I just want to mention one of them. China claims more Russian territory in its, on its maps and in its internal statements than it claims territory of its other neighbors. And it just fought a bloody uh, skirmish you know, a couple of years ago with India over that. Uh, they claim Vladivostok, and on their more and more of China's maps, they use Chinese city names for Russian cities. So it gives you an idea of what, what thing, what's to come in that relationship. Uh, John, uh, something that I think is interesting that's happened domestically in America is the rise of China hawks, even sort of among the American population. We've seen and we've reported on towns that have now revolted against Chinese battery factories, against Chinese agriculture purchases. Uh, Arkansas just kicked a Chinese company out. Um, what, do you, what, do you, what do the Chinese make of this sort of Amer uh, you know, rise of, in a, of an anti-Chinese feeling in America? Well, I personally would not describe it as an anti-Chinese sentiment. I think that there's a greater awareness in the United States and among the American people that the Chinese Communist Party represents an extraordinary threat to the well-being of the United States and to the international order as we know it. But specifically, the fact that the Chinese Communist Party has infiltrated every entity that is looking to invest in the United States, to take advantage of our open economy and our open society, and our generally free media. But look at the fact that we had this uh, situation in North Dakota, where there was a Chinese entity that was looking to acquire property that is, happens to be near a U.S. Air Force base. Um, the Chinese companies own, I believe, uh, about half of America's meat processing facilities. Uh, when you put this into context of a very difficult relationship, and probably one that I think is going to become more difficult in the years to come. Bonnie alluded to the technology competition that's taking place now between the U.S. and China. I think we're realizing more and more that we're dealing with a very different China than we thought was the case in 2001 when the United States welcomed China, even though it wasn't prepared yet for World Trade Organization membership. We brought it in on an expedited basis, hoping that it would become a quote-unquote responsible stakeholder, a freer, more consensual government so that as its citizens became wealthier, they would demand more political freedom and the CCP would liberalize. And kind of the way Hamas fed uh, uh, false information and intelligence to the Israelis in recent years, we've lulled ourselves into believing that we had a responsible partner in the, the CCP. I want to pull this in a, in a sort of a larger direction too, Leland. I see that our time is running short. Um, going back to the issue before that we were discussing about whether we're a reactionary country when it comes to grand strategy, let me offer two thoughts here, if I might. One is, I think the original strategy that we had during the Cold War was a relatively sound one, and that is that the U.S. sought to ensure there was no regional hegemon that would dominate Asia, no regional hegemon that would dominate Europe so that we avoid the cataclysmic events of World War II, 
and certainly no regional hegemon in the Middle East, so that we had a balance of power. And the U.S., of course, was supporting those countries that were looking to resist hegemonic activities. Going forward, I reflect on the statement that Xi Jinping made to Vladimir Putin in March of this year when he left Moscow. And I don't remember the exact quote, so forgive me. But with all the cameras there to record this, Xi Jinping said to Vladimir Putin, my dear friend, you and I are witnessing changes the likes of which we have not seen in 100 years since the end of World War I. And our two countries are the drivers of these changes. And Putin said simply, I agree. And I think the challenge for the United States is to prove them wrong, that they're not the drivers of change on the world stage, that it will continue to be the United States working with our allies in Asia, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Africa, and in Latin America to try to right what's been wrong over the last several years or last several decades. And maybe that becomes the foundation for whatever this next grand strategy begins to look like, Leland. All right. Um, we're, I'm going to give Bonnie the, the last word, and I, I appreciate what you said in terms of an anti-Chinese sentiment versus a realization of the threat from China. Chinese but Communist Party. Much, much better uh, stated than I did. Bonnie, I'll give you the last word, but I, I think what's interesting in, to tie this all together is that during the Cold War that Richard Nixon helped to win, America was united uh, both in terms of its businesses uh, and in terms of its population and in terms of its politicians against this one threat. Are you seeing that happen as it relates to China now? Well, I'll start since it's appropriate to uh, quote Richard Nixon uh, that in his foreign affairs article in 1967, um, he said the West has abandoned its colonial role. It no longer threatens the independence of the Asian nations. Red China, however, does, and its threat is clear, present, and repeatedly and insistently in expressed. And although I don't think everybody in the United States agrees with that uh, today, uh, there is certainly growing recognition about, of the challenges that, uh, that Beijing poses. Uh, our public opinion polls show uh, somewhere around 82 to 85 percent of Americans uh, see China in, in, in a negative way. Um, and uh, a very large percentage uh, sees China as posing uh, the greatest uh, threat to the United States and, uh, and to our, our allies. Uh, but um, they obviously we um, we we have uh, a, a business community that I think is still to some extent divided. Although that the direction uh, of that is is also clear, where there are more and more businesses that are thinking more longer term and not short term. I do a lot of work with the with Europeans and with German businesses, and I can say they're still lagging behind. They are making a lot of money uh, in China. So we have to do more work, I think, as a country to uh, ensure that we and our allies are on the same page. Um, because uh, another point that, that Richard Nixon made was that, uh, in the same article, for the United States to go it alone in containing China would not only place an unconscionable burden on our own country, but would also heighten the chances of nuclear war while undercutting the independent development of the nations of Asia. So we can debate whether or not we should be containing China, but I certainly think we need to be working more closely with our allies to protect and defend our shared interests. And we end on a quote from uh, President Nixon. Thank you all very much. Thank you to the panel. We really appreciate it. Some excellent points by all of you. And I guess the next panel begins, I think, in about five or ten minutes. So we'll take a quick break. Thank you all. This concludes our panel. Our next panel will begin at 1035. Once again, our next panel will begin at 1035. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to take your seats as we begin our third panel. In formulating a national security grand strategy, far too often sanctions are considered first, and perhaps as a quote-unquote silver bullet. But should they be more, should they be considered as more than an end-all be-all? And if so, what lessons can we take from situations during the Nixon years, crises that occurred during the Nixon years, in which alternative strategies led to equally or more successful conclusions? Allow me to welcome Arthur Herman, Senior Fellow and Director of the Quantum Alliance Initiative at the Hudson Institute, who is the author of 10 books, including Freedom's Forge, How American Business Produced Victory in World War II, and he will moderate this discussion and introduce our panelists. Good to go? Oh, hi. Uh, how's everybody this morning? Um, delighted to be here with you uh, with our two uh, very interesting and well-informed panelists on this topic uh, who've done a great deal of thinking but also acting with regard to the theme for our panel this morning that we'll be discussing, and that is about sanctions sanctions as part of grand strategy. Um, do they work? Do they not work? When do they work? When do they not? And it's interesting, too, because sanctions have become now a very familiar uh, weapon to be used in foreign policy and in dealing with uh, bad actors around the world. In fact, it really has, the, the imposing of sanctions has really become a kind of ritual uh, in Western governments, including the United States, um, as, a, as a means of bringing economic pressure, hasn't it? I mean, you'll have a, the White House or a prime minister will announce uh, new sanctions against a country or a group or a group of individuals. Um, the members of the opposite party or members of Congress will either praise or deplore the sanctions. There will be um, analysis by talking heads on television and media about whether these sanctions are really going to work and what the impact will be economically, politically, geopolitically. Um, those who are going to be receiving this, the sanctions uh, come forward with statements either of outrage um, about the sanctions being imposed or they'll say nothing at all because they in fact know that there will be all kinds of ways around the imposition of these sanctions um, that will mean that will have absolutely really no ill effect on them or do anything to change their policy and direction. So this has become a kind of ritual here. I think the question we want to get to with this panel is how do we make them effective? What are good examples of sanctions that can actually have an impact politically, economically, and, and from a grand strategy point of view? Uh, and what where does history tell us that sanctions can be, can be um, a, a bad policy choice? Uh, how do we compare sanction with their, sanctions with their more stringent cousins um, of uh, embargoes, boycotts, or blockades? Um, what are the choices that we need to face right now when we're facing uh, a whole series of crises around the world? When do we use sanctions and when do we not? So that's the overall course of the discussion. Um, what I want to do is to introduce to you our two panelists for the discussion. Um, we have, appearing with us uh, virtually, we have uh, Neil Ferguson, who is the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, speaking to us from London. Hello, Neil. Good to be with you all. And we also have with us uh, Morgan Ortegas, who is the founder of Polaris National Security and former uh, State Department spokesperson for the man who was here on the dais last night, Mike Pompeo, but who also, from a more, uh, should we say, from a, from a point of view of what's relevant for our discussion this morning, 
uh, who is also the treasury attache to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and also treasury intel analyst and who played, as she would tell us, an, uh, an integral role in shaping the sanctions that were imposed on Iran during the previous presidential administration. But for now, what I think I want to do is to turn to Morgan first, uh, to, from the context of when do sanctions work and when they don't, and what's the way in which you go about creating effective sanction policy in dealing with the wrongdoers of whom we now have a, 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 a growing cast of characters. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, too. Oh, let me do this. I've been talking on radio all morning. I was subbing for Hugh Hewitt this morning, 6 to 9 a.m. If you missed it, HughHewitt.com. And you could see it later today. But thank you to the Nixon Foundation uh, for having me. If you're not watching our monthly lecture series that we do with Secretary Pompeo and Ambassador Robert O'Brien, um, you should be watching it. And uh, I think it's a, one of the places where we're able to have deep intellectual conversations about everything that's happening around the world. So thank you so much to Nixon and my, and my panel. Analyst. Um, I, I come at the sanctions perspective from actually having worked across multiple Republican and Democratic administrations um, on sanctions. Uh, in the Bush administration, whenever I was at the Treasury Department as a financial intelligence analyst, and then later in the Obama administration when I was there at Ashe to Saudi Arabia, uh, that was in President Obama's first term. Uh, Bush's second term, obviously, and uh, we were, of course, really focused back then on the original sanctions against the Islamic Republic of Iran, which eventually forced them to the negotiating table in 2015. So first of all, I would say we could go into a lot of Iran examples, which I'm sure we'll get to today, but when you look at sanctions writ large, uh, they should not be the end-all, be-all strategy. They should not be the silver bullet, and they certainly should not be a tool in which uh, an administration administration uses because they because the administration is afraid to use a credible threat of force. So what I mean by that, and I think this uh, often ha happens too often in the uh, Obama and now Biden administrations, um, is, is that in the absence of, of having a, a deterrent a threat of military force that people actually believe, uh, we tend to use sanctions to try to change uh, behavior. Sanctions in and of themselves are never going to change behavior. It has to be a comprehensive strategy that you have towards Iran or to Russia in the case of Ukraine, and it should just be one of, of many tools. So you'll hear a lot today, I'm sure Neil has uh, thoughts about the overuse of sanctions, how that could impact uh, the dominance of the U.S. dollar around the world, and I think that these are all uh, very credible arguments. I would argue uh, that sanctions should not be used the way the Biden administration is currently using them. And what do I mean that by that? One of the most dangerous things that are happening on the world stage today is the lack of enforcement of sanctions that are on the books. So as we all know, for the past three years, the Biden administration has not enforced the maximum economic uh, pressure campaign sanctions that we put on Iran in the last administration. And so because of that, uh, we took Iranian oil basically almost down to zero. Uh, and we did not, by the way, raise the price of, of oil for the American consumer because we did this magic little thing, which is called uh, actually working with our producers, uh, our oil producers, our energy producers, here at home so that we could supply for our own energy needs. So uh, because we are not enforcing the sanctions against Iran, Iran has about roughly $80 billion over the last three years in additional revenue uh, that they have gleaned from oil sales because they have not been enforced. They also have not been properly enforced in Venezuela. And we just see today that the administration is likely going to lift sanctions uh, against Venezuela, some of them for a deal with Maduro, for a deal that Maduro and the opposition made. So one th what happens in one theater affects another theater. We know, for example, when Kabul fell to the Taliban and we saw that disastrous withdrawal that took 13 of our best young men and women, um, we know when that happened, that had reverberations, that had consequences. We know that that gave Putin uh, the gumption to think, you know what, I can probably invade Ukraine and get away with it. 
Um, and, and you've seen what's happened in every theater since the fall of Kabul to the Taliban. I say that as an example because I believe strongly whenever you don't enforce sanctions against Iran or Venezuela, then you see everybody backsliding against sanctions against North Korea or, or other states. So uh, it's never just isolated to one case. The reason why the Biden administration did not remove the Iran sanctions and decided just not to enforce them is because they knew it would be political suicide for them. So um, so I guess it, we can go much deeper into Iran and Russia. I have lots of thoughts about the current sanctions regime against uh, Russia, which is largely ineffective, um, as we all know. And uh, again, the reason I would say is because I don't think this administration has a comprehensive strategy for how they go are going to deter Iran and Russia. And instead, in the absence of the credible threat of military force, they are using sanctions to try to change behavior. And sanctions are never going to work to change behavior if they are the whole strategy as opposed to a tactic within a broader strategy. Thank you. Um can talk about, we will be talking more about Iran and what approaches to be to take uh, in order to make those sanctions uh, enforceable again. Um, the other country which has been the subject of a lot of sanctions talk, particularly in Congress, uh, as well as the current administration, is China. And, and we've seen a lot of clamor on the part of uh, Capitol Hill for imposing sanctions or imposing embargoes, and I'm going to link those two together here because they are in many ways, um, uh, well, not exactly synonymous. They do follow the same pattern of ways in which to punish uh, and to impose penalties on countries or groups who are, who are seen as wrongdoers, uh, as not good players in the international, international community. Um, with the case of China, we've seen this with efforts to shut down their access to various forms of advanced technology. Most recently, the sanctions that were imposed with regard to um, uh, high-end AI chips that NVIDIA uh, was making and had even uh, made adjustments and adapt uh, adapted to the previous round of, of, of sanctions regarding those chips in which now suddenly NVIDIA realizes that they've, st they've raised the bar as to what's acceptable to, to sell to China, which has had a, 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 a bad effect on NVIDIA's stock price and in their economic fortunes as well. Now, Neil, you recently published a column in Bloomberg uh, talking about this kind of sanctions regime, specific, specifically when it comes to China. And I think the message there is, is that be careful what you wish for, because the imposition of these kinds of sanctions and freeze-outs of advanced technologies can become itself an escalating uh, ladder towards growing levels of economic warfare. Uh, and that what you could see is a situation in which this becomes a, I think the term you used was um, uh, mutually assured destruction in which both the U.S. and the Chinese economies suffer a serious, even irreparable loss over time through this kind of use of sanctions as a way to either to decouple from China, right, in the part of the U.S. side of it, or in China's way to respond to the efforts to shut them and their companies and their government out from access to to U.S. technology. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you see this term mutually assured destruction entering into discussion about sanctions and embargoes and everything else that, that we're going to be talking about today? Yes, I, I want to make it clear that I agree with just about everything Morgan uh, just said there, uh, in particular about how not to use sanctions. And if anything has illustrated the, the way in which this administration misunderstands uh, deterrence, it has to be uh, the successive failures to deter Russia uh, and to deter Iran. Sanctions were eased on, uh, on Russia prior uh, to 2022. Let's not forget that sanctions were lifted on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline in 2021. It was one of the signals that uh, the, the Russians uh, were going to push against a relatively open door if they escalated their, their aggression in uh, Ukraine. And we see a similar pattern now with Iran emboldened 
uh, by those additional 80 or perhaps more uh, uh, billion to, to engage in, uh, in shameless aggression against Israel through its proxies, Hamas and uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and perhaps soon Hezbollah. So I don't think we're going to have one of those um, uh, punch and duty type disagreements on this panel, Morgan. Uh, what I want to do is is add a couple more uh, points to your, your critique. One important lesson of history is that when you use sanctions, economic measures uh, to impose costs on an enemy, even if you do it as part of a full-scale military effort, there can be unintended consequences. And one good example which is, is worth thinking about is uh, the way Britain imposed very sweeping and aggressive uh, economic sanctions on Germany at the outbreak of World War I. Uh, my good friend Nick Lambert has some terrific research on this, showing that these were so successful that there was massive blowback to the UK economy, the radical decoupling that they uh, imposed on, on the outset of the war. Uh, in fact, turned out to have significant costs to the UK that hadn't been foreseen. So I think whenever one engages in some artificial cost that one imposes on an adversary, one has to remember that one's tampering with the very complex system that is the global market economy. And it's not necessarily a case of other things remaining equal. There are unintended consequences. And a, a great theme of, of Nick Lambert's work has been the ways in which economic warfare uh, we, we, we used and abused and often had unintended consequences in that huge conflict, uh, which was in, in many ways the birth of the modern era of economic warfare. The other example, which I think you were alluding to, Arthur, is that against Japan in the 1930s and right up until the outbreak of uh, war between the United States and Japan with Pearl Harbor, the US kept ratcheting up the economic pressure uh, on Japan in a variety of ways, uh, including an oil embargo. And ultimately, the unintended consequence was to force the imperial government to take massive strategic risk because it faced a choice between doing that or just accepting that it couldn't possibly run a meaningful uh, uh, Asian empire and just had to accept second class status. Uh, and I think when one looks at the things that have been done by the Biden administration to China, the Commerce Department regulations on semiconductors that you mentioned, Arthur, are really interesting in this respect, because they're really much tougher than anything the Trump administration did to China. Compared with the tariffs or the things that were done to Huawei, if you cut China off from the most sophisticated semiconductors, including those manufactured at TSMC in Taiwan, if you make sure that they can't get the machinery that you need to make the high-end semiconductors and the people, if you basically shut them out, that is a very profound threat to China's ambitions to be an AI superpower on a par with the United States. There are only two AI superpowers, US and China. And so I think we may underestimate the amount of pressure that that set of economic sanctions has created on Xi Jinping. And who knows what conclusion he may draw, but in effect, We've presented China with uh, three options. Option one, just shrug your shoulders and say, oh, well, it's an American world. We better just learn to live with it. Uh, number two, let's try and replicate TSMC on the mainland, which looks like something that would be really hard for them to do if you ask the experts in this area. And number three is just let's, let's take over Taiwan. It's right there. We think it's ours. We say it's ours. Pretty much the Americans accept it's a one China uh, world, so why not just take it? And if that issue surfaces right now, if China imposes a blockade on Taiwan and says, well, here's some economic warfare, how do you like this? We control the in ins and outs, who goes in, what goes into Taiwan. We'll be in a tremendous strategic dilemma at that moment. We've got a crisis in Ukraine, we've got a crisis in uh, the Middle East. A third crisis over Taiwan would create major dilemmas for American military planners. And that's a very good example of the kind of unintended consequences that, that sanctions can have. I'm, I'm going to press you a little bit on that, um, on a couple of points there. One is, is it really fair to compare the oil embargo against Japan, Imperial Japan in the 30s, with the uh, sanctions regarding high-tech 
um, yeah. equipment and semiconductors in this case. I mean, in the case of Japan, after all, um, being totally dependent on foreign, totally dependent on foreign uh, imports of oil, it really meant a, a complete shutdown of the economy, including its military. Um, in China's case, certainly it, it, cram it would cramp its long-term strategy, uh, its I desire to become the leading AI nation and high-tech nation in the future. I think one of the worries uh, is not so much that, that by cutting off uh, U.S. exports of these kinds of semiconductors and other uh, advanced technology that China has been, um, on a part of other commentators, has been that the is that what will happen is the Chinese will just simply learn how to make it themselves. That, that basically, and you've already seen that with the case of the, of the 7mm uh, semiconductors for 5G that Huawei, you impose a boycott on Huawei equipment, fine, we'll go make our own stuff. And so what you've done is basically postpone what the real issue is. But I'm going to press you again, Neil. I'm going to say, you know, what the hell, Neil? I mean, this is stuff that's going to the Chinese military direct, thanks to civil military fusion. Uh, why should we, what can we do to prevent though, that U.S. technology from going directly into the service of the PLA and the PL PLAN um, unless we impose some kind of sanctions or some kinds of limits as to how that, how that technology goes. So my question for you then is if, if the current regime of limiting China's access to U.S. technology is, uh, is not working or could even have unintended, disastrous unintended consequences, from your point of view, what could be effective as a way in which to, uh, a way in which to limit China's access to the technologies that they need to basically compete with us, not just in the economic sphere, but also to prevail against us in the military sphere? Well, Arthur, one of the things that made me think much harder about this issue was several years ago realizing that China spent more on importing semiconductors than it spends on importing oil. So I think the parallel is actually a legitimate one because in many ways semiconductors are as important, if not more important, uh, than oil uh, today. And uh, if you limit uh, China's access to the most sophisticated of these uh, semiconductors, it can't compete in, say, the domain of large language models. And the, the reality of the Huawei chips you mentioned is that they're uneconomic to make. I mean, that's a really, really difficult thing to do. Uh, and so I think one should not underestimate how effective this strategy is at inflicting pain on China. I give credit to Jake Sullivan, who's one of the architects of this vision that you kind of do technological containment. I think it's an entirely uh, intelligent way of dealing with the Chinese challenge. But the point I want to make is that you must remember uh, that, that your, your opponent has options other than just accepting second class status. I don't think it's as easy as you just made it sound for China to catch up. I remember asking Morris Chang, the founder of TSMC, uh, if China could catch up uh, with TSMC. And he replied, they're five years behind us now, but five years ago, they were five years behind us. And in five years time, they'll be five years behind us. He was highly skeptical that the mainland would be able to replicate the achievement of TSMC. And I think we've made it even harder by our, our sanctions. So the key point I want to emphasize is that if you are going to impose pressure uh, on an East Asian uh, nation with imperial tendencies, uh, you should be ready uh, for them to take strategic risk in response. The United States was not ready for Pearl Harbor, and the costs of being surprised were extraordinarily high, and they were borne uh, by a generation uh, of young Americans who had to claw America's way back into dominance in the Pacific. I think we are creating a much shorter pathway to conflict with China than many people realize. I hear conventionally argued, oh, well, China's not going to be ready to invade Taiwan until 2027, which in Washington is the infinitely distant future because it's beyond the next presidential election. But in reality, that's really soon. And in any case, they don't need to invade Taiwan. They could do a blockade tomorrow. And because we've moved away from strategic ambiguity, and we now have kind of a more or less unambiguous commitment to do something if that happens, 
I think the president could find himself in the very difficult position of having to send another couple of aircraft carrier strike groups, this time to the Taiwan Strait. And unfortunately, unlike in 1996, uh, the Chinese now have the capacity to sink aircraft carrier strike groups. So I think we've got to be careful here. The assumption that China won't do what Russia did and won't do what Iran is doing is a very complacent assumption. And it's a dangerous one, given that China is a far more formidable adversary than Russia or, or Iran. The point I'm really making is not that sanctions don't work. Sometimes they work too well. They work better than you realize. And they create uh, an appetite for risk in your adversary that you you underestimate at, at your at your peril. Morgan, when thinking about China, and I know that was very much part of the discussion and, and thinking about what U.S.'s stance with regard to China and China's access to U.S. technology uh, during the during the during the, the previous administration. Um, when thinking about sanctions with regard to China, are there important lessons that can be learned from the Iran example? Absolutely. Um, first, I, I agree with a lot of what Neil just said, but in my mind, the Chinese calculation about what they are going to do or not do and win over Taiwan is baked in the cake. I, I, I don't know that I necessarily think that our sanctions are going to push them there. I think that it is, um, it is, it is, Xi Jinping's red line, it is, it is personal to his identity uh, to get Taiwan back in his mind. Um, it's, it's more personal than probably, you know, in many ways than Crimea is into Russia. Maybe, that's, maybe it's analogous. So, um, so I don't know that, that sanctions are going to push China to do that. China's going to get Taiwan back in whatever means necessary because it is existential to them and their mind and the mind of this regime to get Taiwan back. Uh, but saying that, I, I, I do want to step back. Um, we could definitely compare and contrast the Iran sanctions from the last administration, from the Trump administration, and the, and the Russian sanctions as well. But I also want to remind our viewers who are watching at home, thank you very much, and people here in the audience, that there are different types of sanctions. It doesn't just have to be countrywide sanctions. In fact, uh, during the global war on terror, uh, we, in, we used quite effectively um, sanctions against individuals and entities that were providing support uh, to al-Qaeda. Uh, to ISIS. Uh, we worked in the last administration, we worked very aggressively on getting other countries to do things like uh, declaring Hezbollah a terrorist organization. I forget how many countries we were able actually to do, but, but that was a big push to get people to actually recognize Hamas and Hezbollah as terror organizations. And so after 9-11, um, uh, at the United States Treasury, when we really founded the terrorism and sanctions office that we have today, uh, we were aggressively going after individuals and entities that were funding terrorism, especially to, at the time, right after 9-11, uh, to the Sunni groups uh, like al-Qaeda. And, and that's really important, number one, I think, because there is the naming and shaming element, right? If you are an individual, if you or your company are providing illicit support, uh, that should be something that banks around the world should understand. Um, and I also think, too, we also have to differentiate uh, between sanctions placed by the United States and sanctions that are multilateral sanctions. So that would be sanctions that maybe come out of U.S. and EU together or sanctions uh, and, or entities list notifications that are put on from the United Nations. We obviously know that for sanctions to be the most effective, uh, you want to have multilateral sanctions. U.S. sanctions in and of itself can be certainly effective at getting American businesses not to do business with a particular individual or entity but the hope always of course so when I was back in my 20s which was just a few years ago um, oh good everybody's waking up thanks for laughing at that um, uh, but when I was back in my 20s when I was an intelligence analyst at the Treasury uh, when we were building sanctions packages against these individuals and entities that were supporting terrorism uh, we had the US threshold the package that we would build which was very high but we always built the US sanctions that was typically under a presidential executive order we always tried to build those packages with the 
the hopes that it would be significant enough to also get that individual or entity sanctioned at the UN. Because if you could get it done at the UN, that meant things like a red notice so the person couldn't travel. And that way, more countries would be uh, obliged to actually uh, go after that particular entity or individual for their support to terrorism. So I do think, um, while it seems maybe minor, I do think that there is a point to make sure that we're differentiating between what sanctions are put in by the United States only versus multilateral sanctions, which can obviously largely be more effective, and to remember that sanctions aren't just country-specific. Uh, in the case of the global war on terror, which apparently we're back in again, um, uh, we really were able to go after uh, not only uh, Al-Qaeda and Hamas and others, we were able actually to go after Mexican drug cartels, incredibly effective in shutting down the Cali cartel, for example. I think that was around 2014 when that, when that Cali cartel was completely dismantled. So wanted to bring, wanted to just make sure that we share those nuances and know that sh sanctions are not monolithic. There's a bunch of different kinds. And that goes right into the comparing and contrast the maximum economic pressure campaign sanctions against Iran uh, versus uh, what we saw the sanctions package that uh, Biden and his team put on Russia. It was incredibly unfortunate, as Neil mentioned, that uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which we sanctioned quite heavily in the Trump administration, that was one of the, I think, 10 or 12 things that I've looked at that, that I think really led to the failure of deterrence that allowed Putin um, or, or gave him the gusto and the bravado to think that he could invade Ukraine without impunity. Uh, not only did we stop the military aid that the Trump administration, uh, the lethal assistance that the Trump administration was giving to Ukraine. The Biden administration stopped that. Uh, they also stopped any new sanctions. And basically, Jake Sullivan told the world, uh, we're only going to do all of these things if Russia actually invades. So arming your enemy you know, after they've already been invaded is a peculiar way of deterrence. I'm going to just go out on a limb here and say maybe that didn't work, um, especially uh, when, you, when you saw that we gr greenlit Nord Stream 2. So, at the end of the day, the maximum economic pressure campaign was instituted after we withdrew from the JCPOA because we saw two big flaws in the JCPOA. Um, number one, we all knew that Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, chanced death uh, to Israel and death to America. Unfortunately, the Obama negotiators, uh, led by the brilliant climate czar John Kerry, um, <laughs> a lot of dripping with sarcasm, um, the Obama team, I, I guess, thought that the only way that Iran could destroy the state of Israel, which has been their stated goal for 40 years, was through a nuclear weapon. They forgot about these pesky things called ballistic missiles. They forgot about Iran's rampant funding to terrorist groups to their Shia proxies throughout the region. And as we have unfortunately seen in the last week and a half, starting on October 7th, that we should have believed the Iranian regime when they said uh, that they wanted to destroy Israel and wipe it off the face of the map. Uh, they were happy to do it, I think, via nuclear weapon, but they're also just as happy to do it via their terrorist proxies, via their massive ballistic missile arsenal, if that is what mo is what most effective to achieving their goal. So when we when we left the JCPOA, we knew one of the main things that we had to do to hurt the regime was not to put sanctions on the regime that would be a slap on the wrist. We knew that we needed to take Iranian oil off the market. And so that's where you get things like not only the initial U.S. sanctions, but secondary sanctions. All the fancy terminology and lingo essentially boils down to telling Japan uh, working with India, working with China and other countries around the world to get them to stop buying Iranian oil. And for all intents and purposes, because we were willing to take the hard step of secondary sanctions, because we were willing to increase production here in the United States, and because we were willing to draw a very firm line of not taking Iranian oil, I do think that those sanctions, from the perspective of taking legitimate Ar Iranian oil sales off the market, was incredibly effective. And again, you will remember we did not have the big uh, price uh, jumps in the gas of gas price of gasoline for Americans that you've had. Compare and contrast that to what I think is a very paltry sanctions uh, regime that the Biden team has placed on Russia, 
I, I think it's mostly an exercise in making everybody feel like they're doing something without being effective. Uh, we know that, you know, the ruble is trading higher today than it was at the start of their invasion. Uh, we know that clearly Iranian oil still continues to flow. Um, we've not inhibited that at all. We haven't done secondary sanctions against Russia for their oil. So we've done nothing to effectively take it off the market. And we did do some banking san uh, sanctions, but we exempted all of the banks that are doing energy transactions. So I actually think that the sanctions package on Russia is dangerous um, from the perspective of someone who does believe in the effectiveness of, of, of the entities list of sanctions, whether it's for countries, individuals, entities. The most dangerous thing you could do is to half-ass sanctions. And that's exactly what the Biden administration has done with Russia. They're not willing to actually take the measures to take, to take oil off the market. It's all an exercise to make everybody feel like they're doing something without actually doing anything. Well, that's a rather familiar um, theme, isn't it, with the imposition of sanctions, is a feeling like, well, we've got to do something, and the easiest thing we can do to express our moral outrage is by imposing sanctions. Neil, the example that comes to my mind, which I think sort of fed the vogue for economic sanctions um, over the last quarter century or so, was the example of South Africa, where you had um, multilateral sanctions against the apartheid regime. The idea of it was that this would force them into uh, changing their policy and changing their political and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and apartheid system. Um, and within two years, that's exactly what happened, uh, in part because people did not realize that or did not think through the fact that the uh, South African regime was uh, prepared to abandon apartheid. They were just looking for an opportunity and a way in which to do that. Um, and so the international uh, uh, effort to boycott uh, South Africa seemed like an amazing triumph of moral um, moral will over uh, over political and, and economic circumstances, which I think has encouraged people to think about sanctions as being a way in which you can very quickly and cheaply um, strike a blow against regimes that you see as wrongdoers or as being um, in some ways um, a dangerous uh, presence in the world stage and that you can even force regime change or even force major changes in the political and economic system as a result. Yeah, I can remember being caught up in that whole uh, anti-apartheid campaign as a, as a very young boy. Uh, I think the the de delusion uh, was that that was why apartheid had come to an end, uh, when in reality uh, it was as much the end of the Cold War. And before that, the pretty clear signal from the United States that, that it would not sustain white minority rule in Southern Africa, a signal which dates back to Richard Nixon's administration, of course, and, and a signal that got even louder under Gerald Ford. So I think we, we fail often in telling ourselves uh, historical narratives to acknowledge the relative importance of the, the different variables. And I don't think sanctions are the reason apartheid ended. Apartheid ended partly because it was an unsustainable fascist regime with just enormous uh, and ultimately insuperable obstacles to maintaining white minority rule. You'll have noticed it doesn't exist anywhere, white minority rule. And that's not, I think, because of sanctions. But I'd like to try and contextualize this debate because it seems to me that uh, for every successful sanctions campaign, there seem to be at least three unsuccessful ones. I haven't noticed regime change in Cuba lately. And Cuba's been under sanctions for an extraordinarily long time. Uh, and and Cuba is a relatively easy place to sanction, unlike, say, Russia. Uh, it's a it's a relatively small island. And I, I think part of what has happened uh, particularly since the end of the Cold War, is that we've started to exaggerate the power of sanctions and forget where they failed. Uh, and this, this, I think, led to an exaggeration of what could be done against Russia. Uh, even after the war had failed, sanctions clearly weren't a deterrent. Completely uh, agree with you there. Uh, but, but then they didn't even become a particularly useful and effective weapon of war, although they were sold as such at the beginning of the war. And why have we exaggerated the power of, of sanctions in recent times uh, and started to think that it's a sort of solution to any problem? 
uh, in international relations. I think it's partly because the discovery of financial sanctions as opposed to trade sanctions or restrictions on technology after 9-11 exposed a kind of superpower that the United States hadn't previously appreciated that it had. I mean, I think of Juan Zarate's work on this. Uh, it was suddenly become, suddenly clear that really financial sanctions were something that the United States had never properly used before. But when used, they could do a lot. And really, that encouraged the sense that the United States didn't need to get so mixed up with boots on the ground and all that uh, tough stuff. It, it, it had this super weapon. And I think it started to get overused. Uh, and with that, you create the obvious hazard, which I think it's worth discussing, Morgan alluded to, that if you overuse the san financial sanctions, you incentivize China and its allies to create a parallel financial system that doesn't include SWIFT and doesn't include the different things that we've used, uh, particularly against Russia. I, I think this is worth watching because although it's not like the yuan is going to replace the dollar, much less some sort of fake BRICS currency. Nevertheless, if I look ahead 10 years, I am, I would expect more transactions in RMB to take place between China and its trading partners, more offshore renminbi centers to uh, to operate. It's, it's just that we can't expect the Chinese to be as susceptible to financial sanctions when there's a showdown with them as the Russians were to financial sanctions when there was a showdown with them. And I'll add one final point which brings back Richard Nixon to the conversation. In the Cold War, Nixon was especially adept at using sanctions to extract uh, concessions, improvements, uh, a better behavior uh, from regimes that the United States uh, could do more trade with. We forget that part of the opening to China, which was in many ways the pivotal moment of the Nixon presidency, it began by offering improvements uh, in economic relations. And this was something that they also did with, with members of the Eastern Bloc in Europe that weren't particularly pro-Soviet, like Romania. So I think it's worth remembering that sanctions are a lever in a different sense. You can offer uh, your uh, counterparty improving tr improved trade relations to try and improve their behavior. And that, of course, was part of what detente was supposed to deliver. Though how far it succeeded remains, I think, a matter for heated debate Interesting you should mention Nixon in this context, because I think the other theme that is worth thinking about with regard to sanctions, which was a theme of the, of the Nixon-Kissinger approach to, uh, to foreign policy, was the idea of linkage. That, in other words, that you can have, you can bring sa sanctions or threaten sanctions in order to change behavior in, one, in some specific area, instead of simply a blanket sanctions as a punitive measure, you think of it as a as leverage to force changes in other in other respects and other in other directions here. And I think when you look through Nixon's uh, papers um, and his reflections on these kinds of issues, you see a really deep skepticism about sanctions, and particularly about the idea of a complete sanction regime, the kind that you mentioned Cuba, for example, which has had so little so little effect. And in one of, his, one of his writings in 1992, he says this, which I want to get comments from both of you. Um, he says, if we use our ultimate weapon, total economic sanctions, we will squander our greatest asset for only marginal returns. Sanctions held in reserve are more powerful than sanctions put into place. Yeah, far be it for me to argue with Richard Nixon. Um, and I think I, I largely agree with that quote. I mean, if you just look at the con uh, the context of Iran and Russia, let's just say fast forward in two years, I'm talking to you as a part of the next Republican administration, if we win, please God. Um, and uh, I don't know that we can put the genie back in the bottle as it relates to Iran, for example. Uh, the genie is already out now um, over the past three years. So it, we used enormous, enormous political capital in order to get India and China and Japan and others not to purchase Iranian oil, um, as an example. And I, I, I don't know that I don't know that that genie can be put back in the bottle. So we will absolutely have to look at. We'll have to see where the Russian uh, Ukraine war is. Um, we have, I, I think, in many ways, that fight has has been in, in 
somewhat of a stalemate over the past six months, not a lot of advances from either side. So the next administration uh, could, if, if Republican or Democrat, but from my perspective, if it's a Republican administration, you will inherit, uh, inherit a challenge of uh, weak sanctions on Russia that didn't actually stop them and their advances towards Ukraine over the past 20 months. And at that point, uh, the pa you know, for two and a half years, you will inherit, um, and we'll see what goes down in the Middle East over the next week and a half, but you could potentially, you know, inherit um, a, an Iran uh, that, um, that has been completely emboldened through the oil revenue and, and the sanctions while still on the books haven't been enforced for so many years that they are largely ineffective. And so at that point, I would argue it's better to take ineffective sanctions off the book or actually make the decision that we are going to enforce them. But enforcing them, which I think we should do, does require enormous political capital. Enforcing sanctions uh, means that the president and his secretary of state or her secretary of state and the Treasury uh, Secretary have to use enormous leverage. They have to take enormous political risk, and they have to be willing to lead. And so far in the past three years, we have an administration that has instituted things like a price cap, that which Secretary Yellen instituted uh, on Russia, which has been largely ineffective. So I think there's, you, you know, I, I, I think we are talking about on variations of, of a theme here. I do agree with Neil that for every successful campaign, which I would say our maximum economic pressure uh, sanctions against Iran were successful. For every one of those, you, you can find plenty of examples where it hasn't been effective. I do think when you look at the examples and the places where it wasn't effective, uh, Neil brought up Cuba, for example, it's places where uh, the sanctions were not easily understood, they were not easily enforceable, they were not adaptable, they weren't tailored sanctions, they were just sort of this blanket monolithic sanction that didn't actually, you know, make room uh, for humanitarian ex exemptions, for example. Uh, Neil? What about, what Neil, in looking at the Nixon formula of using the threat of sanctions as a way in which to bring about changes in behavior, particularly in specific areas, let's say, through a linkage policy. Do you see ways in which that could be adapted in terms of dealing with China? Well, I think, and in this I'm quite unfashionable, uh, that we would be better off pursuing a policy of detente than risking confrontation over Taiwan in the near term when I don't think we're ready for it. My understanding of, of Nixon's detente was that it was a way of buying time as the United States recovered from the debacle in, in Vietnam, and uh, and it was time that was uh, valuable to the United States. Uh, I think the way Richard Nixon thought about sanctions was as part of a, a, a very complex system of bargaining with other states, uh, where the carrots and sticks would be very finely uh, maneuvered, uh, and you would extract uh, leverage, as you say, you'd extract gains uh, by that by that process. Now, of course, sanctions were sometimes used in quite a clearly punitive way against the Allende regime in Chile. Most notoriously, people like to talk about that. But if you look at Latin American policy as a whole, there was a lot of um, of quite subtle use of sanctions and sometimes a, a kind of forbearance. There were times when U.S. companies were nationalized by uh, regimes in Peru, for example, when when Nixon actually opted not to impose uh, sanctions. It's a much more complex story than I think is generally understood because he just saw it as one of many tools in uh, in his very sophisticated uh, toolbox for trying to exert pressure and to give incentives to countries uh, to, to behave better. You're right to bring up linkage. The ultimate linkage was to try to get some kind of uh, better outcome in, in Vietnam. That wasn't successful. But I think if you look at uh, what was done exactly 50 years ago, uh, you see two very striking things, one of which we, we just haven't thought about in this conversation and need to. Number one, that uh, faced with a crisis in the Middle East uh, that threatened the uh, existence of Israel, the attack on the Yom Kippur War by Egypt and, and Syria, the United States moved extremely effectively uh, to support Israel, but also to, to stop the fighting and use its diplomatic leverage to bring about a substantial improvement in Israel's position, namely the, the, the paving of, of the way to peace between Egypt and Israel. 
Uh, and one of the ways in which that was achieved was with the credible threat of force at a critical moment when the Soviets looked like they were going to intervene. I'm still waiting to hear a credible threat of the use of force against Iran from President Biden, despite the very fine speech that he gave uh, yesterday. The second point is that sanctions were done to the United States. We haven't talked about that. But remember, the most powerful sanctions uh, of the 1970s were the oil embargo imposed on the United States and other countries by uh, the Saudis and the other Arab members of OPEC in the wake of the Yom Kippur War. That was one of the unintended consequences of uh, that whole episode. And it had profound economic costs for the United States and indeed the world economy. We should never forget that we're not always the subjects of the sentence where sanctions are concerned. We can be the object. That's right. And by the way, for the audience and for Neil, if you want to join us, uh, we have a panel this afternoon uh, on the uh, 50th anniversary of the Arab oil embargo and the OPEC price rise and the, uh, the worldwide, as well as the implications for American econ economy, the worldwide uh, impact of that change. And speaking directly on this issue of unintended consequences, Neil and Morgan, I would remind you, just as a last thought here, that one of the consequences of that Arab oil embargo, and we have to remember, for those of, us who, those of you who are not here, that in the course of a year, the, bar the price of a barrel of oil jumped from $2.50 a barrel to eleven sixty-five a barrel. Um, that one of the consequences was that the Nixon White House Sir and Security Council seriously debated using military force as a way to seize the oil fields in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait because the threat to American economic security uh, was so grave that it seemed that military force might have to be the final option um, until, the, uh, until the embargo uh, was negotiated out in the spring of, of 1974. So in that sense, when we were, talk we were talking about the Japanese um, uh, oil embargo of the 1930s, 1939, and when we talk about the Arab oil embargo, uh, watch, out what you, watch out what you wish for. Uh, because uh, countries can react in, in ways that you had not anticipated, uh, including the use of, the use of military force as their, as their last option. Final thoughts, Morgan and uh, Neil? Well, which is exactly why there has been this ongoing discussion for many years now about onshoring and nearshoring, being able to, you know, such a novel concept, being able to provide for our own energy security here at home, our own food security, uh, our own pharmaceuticals. I mean, I know I think we are still, what, 90, 95 percent dependent on China uh, for our generic uh, medicines, almost completely dependent on them for penicillin. Um, so I, I, I think the, the point, the examples that you gave from China, excuse me, from Japan and from the, the 70s oil embargo, I think only can re-emphasize the conversation uh, that we are having ar around making sure that our national security critical things like energy, like food, like medicine can actually be produced and procured here in the United States. And then finally, I would just say, you know, we have seen is that as I to bring it full circle to what I said at the beginning, uh, one of the reasons why I think sanctions have not been effective in the way that the Biden administration has deployed them is because there isn't the credible use of uh, a force backing them up. Uh, no one is scared. No one is intimidated. You've got the vice president saying to migrants coming over our undefended and wide open southern border, don't come. Since she said the words don't come, we've probably had at least a million gotaways into this country, uh, untold numbers uh, from China, from Iran. Uh, you know, these are not just country people from the Northern Triangle fleeing economic hardship. So you, you have the vice president issuing warnings to people not to come over the so southern border and then a million more people come after that speech. You have Secretary Austin just a few days ago uh, who sort of, you know, issued his version of a threat to anybody who might want to get involved and escalate the conflict over uh, Israel and Gaza. And he said, don't. Don't do it. Something like that. Since he said that, what do we see happen overnight? We've seen at least three of our bases in Syria attacked. We have seen uh, Iran's proxy forces from Hezbollah and others. Basically, uh, they have moved. They've positioned themselves. They've encircled Israel. Uh, so 
no one is listening uh, to the threats and to the warnings from this administration. Listen, I, I greatly do not want to be critical of them. I want them to reestablish deterrence. But we have a policy writ large around the world, which is avoiding escalation at all cost. And that appeasement policy, that avoidance of escalation policy that they are pursuing is actually making the, the problems in, in almost every theater escalate. It's making the world uh, far more dangerous. It's making the world less safe and the Middle East that was everyone said would blow up in the Trump administration and create World War III we're seeing it today because there is no credible threat of force because there is no deterrence that has been reestablished and because the policy of let's avoid escalation at all costs that policy is making uh, every conflict in my mind get much worse and actually forcing the escalation that they're trying to avoid Neil I'm going to give you the last word I'll keep it brief, uh, as Morgan was so eloquent. Uh, the, the great category error is to think of sanctions as an alternative uh, to, to military force. Uh, they're not. And uh, they, they really actually only tend to achieve things if there is uh, an accompanying threat, even if it's only an implicit one, uh, of military force. Uh, we're going to see play out in the coming weeks uh, some world historical events. I wish I knew which way it's going to go. I hope, like Morgan, I hope the administration is successful in deterring Iran and its proxies from escalating the war against Israel. Uh, but I think it's very clear to everybody, I'm, I'm hoping by the end of this discussion, that they're not going to achieve that outcome uh, by talking about sanctions. They're only going to achieve that outcome if there's a credible threat of large-scale U.S. military action against Iran and its proxies, perhaps including Iran's uh, nuclear sites. Uh, without that, I very much fear uh, that there'll be another uh, protracted conflict, as as in Ukraine, which will leave Israel in its weakest state, perhaps in its history, certainly in a weaker state than it was 50 years ago when Richard Nixon was still president. Um, I hope those of you here in the audience will be able to join us for our afternoon panel when we'll be exploring more of these issues in a discussion about energy security and the 50th anniversary of the Arab oil embargo. But for now, I would like, I think we all want to thank our guests and our panelists for an absolutely fascinating discussion. Thanks very much. This concludes our panel. Lunch is now being served in the reception area. Please return to your seats by 11.50 for the keynote discussion with Ambassador Robert O'Brien and Morgan Ortegas. Thank you so much.
Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to take your seats. In light of recent events in Israel, in the horrific terrorist attack on October 7th, 50 years after the 1973 Yom Kippur War in which President Nixon ordered a swift resupply of arms and materiel to Israel to help repel the invading Egyptian and Syrian armies, we will focus today's keynote session on the, ne on the next steps that America should take to respond strategically to this geopolitical aggression and to get our American hostages back. Obviously, this is a complicated and rapidly evolving situation, and there is no one better to address these topics than Ambassador Robert O'Brien, Chairman of American Global Strategies, who served as the 27th National Security Advisor, the U.S. Special Envoy for Hostage Affairs, and is Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Richard Nixon Foundation. Ambassador O'Brien is joined on stage today by Morgan Ortegas, the founder and principal at Polaris National Security. She's an active U.S. Navy Reserve officer and served in the Trump administration as the spokesperson at the Department of State for the United States. Would you please welcome our keynote? Good afternoon. I hope everyone enjoyed their turkey sandwich. I ate all the pecan brownies, so I hope you didn't want any of them. Um, well, it's so great to be back. Hopefully, you, I didn't lull you to sleep with an hour of sanctions talk. Um, hope you enjoyed that panel. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to have this conversation with Ambassador O'Brien, who I've known for probably 15 years now. Uh, many years ago, we were on the board of a small NGO in Afghanistan that brought young Afghan lawyers to the U.S. to get an LLM. And sadly, it all came full circle two years ago with that uh, disastrous withdrawal because Robert and I had to get many of those students, uh, many of those law students that we brought to the U.S., we had to get them out of Afghanistan uh, very quickly. And, and we did. We got a lot out. But it was it was, it was an odd way to come full circle. But um, Robert, we had the amazing discussion last I mean, night. Yeah, go for it. Looking? Do we have audio here? Okay, great. One of the things I want to say, I know... Qatar has gotten a lot of uh, a hard time recently because of the Hamas folks that are there. I don't think they'll be there very long after Hamas is destroyed on the ground. But it was Qatar that they got the folks out of Afghanistan when we, we couldn't get any help from the U.S. government. We got our allies and the people that we trained here and put a lot of money into under both Secretary Rice and Secretary Clinton. Uh, we got them out of Afghanistan with the help of Qatar, and uh, I appreciate that. That's a really great point. I mean, when we were trying to get our students out, we didn't go to our own government. We had to go to Qatar to get them out, and thankfully, thank God, they did. Um, but Robert, we had, you, that was an amazing intro that you did for Secretary Pompeo last night. So we heard that discussion. Um, we've heard a lot of intense policy discussions today. What's your favorite part of the conference so far? Well, th this conference and the summit is different than any other summit, I think, in our conference in Washington, D.C. And I, I think the, there are two things, the speakers that we have. So I, I just think, of, like this morning, we had Waltz and uh, Jane Harmon and... Uh, uh, Admiral Rogers, any any one of those three could have been a, a national security advisor. Then we had the the following uh, session. We had Pottinger, who was the deputy national security uh, security advisor. We had Kita Morrison, who was Prime Minister Abe's national security advisor. I mean, the the, the thoughtfulness and the substance that you're getting, and and the people that are here, uh, it's pretty unusual for a Washington D.C. conference. Usually, we're you know. You operate and do this better than I do, Morgan, but we're, we're doing four-minute, five-minute sound bites or segments on, on Fox or on CNN. And, and when you come here and listen to this conference, you're getting strategy and substance that I think President Nixon would have been really happy about. Um, I, I agree. So thank you again for having us. So there's so many different stories to tell from your time in the Trump administration, but you were also in the Bush administration as well. Uh, I, I would just like you to sort of peel back the onion and, and tell us the differences in working in the Bush administration versus the Trump administration and what you think about the overall foreign policy and, and grand strategy behind both administrations. Yeah, the, the biggest difference is I was a pretty junior person in the Bush administration, so I didn't have a plane and didn't have Secret Service, so yeah. that was... That's sort of the biggest difference. And uh, look, uh, President Bush was a great president. He had, you know, challenges like President Trump had. I mean, we had the Iraq War. Uh, we had, I was at the spent a lot of time at the UN uh, in the Bush administration. We were dealing with Abu Ghraib and uh, Guantanamo and and dealing with some of those very very tough issues. And 
I think it was good prep for the Trump administration. People ask, you know, it was baptism by fire in Trump. But we had a pretty, pretty big baptism by fire after the, uh, the second Gulf War in, in the Bush administration. And so it was, it was certainly good training. But I think the idea of President Bush and President Trump is that they're both pretty tough guys. And I know President Pr Trump better than I know President Bush, but I'm a, you know, no President Bush. I'm a fan of his. And, and you wouldn't have had the, the, what we're seeing now. We're seeing the world fall apart on us. And you wouldn't have had that with either President Bush or President Trump being in power because they, they both believed in peace through strength. And President Trump called it America first, but it's Ronald Reagan. It's peace through strength. And it goes back to Nixon. It's, re it's realism. It's, it's using American hard power to back up our diplomacy. And so you can, you can have peace initiatives, and you can be successful with them, but you have to have the strength to get there. You can't just have peace without the strength. And, and that's, that's what we saw with President Nixon. We saw it with President Bush. We saw it with, certainly with President Trump. And unfortunately, with our Democrat friends who are all about the peace but don't, don't understand strength in American exceptionalism, it, it, it's hard to get to get to the, the end of peace when you're, you're appeasing your adversaries and not not standing up to them. So most of people know you from the Trump administration from being the national security advisor, but you actually started as the hostage envoy. And what people may not know is you were able to successfully get more Americans out of captivity or more Americans who were wrongfully detained out uh, than any president uh, than any presidency in the history of the United States. So you were clearly a, a very credible and highly effective hostage envoy. What was your secret? Well, the. It was, in some ways, it was easy, I, and I, I don't take credit. I give the credit for the hostages coming home to President Trump because when you're president, you get credit for the when, – when things go well, you should get credit for that. When things go poorly, you know, your staff should take the, the blame for it. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it did make it a little easier when I had President Trump. I, I could go into no, no, negotiations and say, look, do you want to cut a deal with me and, and work it out, or do you want me to take it to the president's desk? And uh, I, I have no idea what he's going to do. Uh, the, the other thing I'll say is, and this is really important, I, I mentioned Qatar. Let me also mention Switzerland and uh, Jacques Pitelet, the Swiss ambassadors here. We were able to get a lot of people out of a lot of countries because we had partners that, that believed, that, that shared our values and, uh, and that believed in, in getting innocent people home. And, and so whether it was working with, with Jacques and Wolfgang Brulhard and the, the Swiss government, which was just, you know, the... What, what Switzerland does for America, no, no one will understand uh, as, outside of the government. Roger Carstens will tell you about it, our current hostage envoy. They facilitate getting, getting people home. The Qataris did it. The, the Emiratis did it. We had, it wasn't just President Trump, but we had a lot of partners who, who were against terrorism, against kidnapping, against hostage taking, and, uh, and we, we leveraged those relationships as well. The, the final thing I'll say is that we use the military, and that's something when I first got to the hostage envoy office, there was a memo that described what the SPIHA office did. And the, the first thing it said, we use diplomacy and military option. The military option is always a last resort. And I, I took the memo and started editing it. And I said, we use our military option as a first resort. That, that's why we have Delta Force. That it was created after the, the debacle in Iran with Desert Eagle. I said, we're going to rescue our hostages first. Only then will we turn to diplomatic means. And we wanted to send a message to our adversaries, especially the, the non-state actors, the terrorists who were taking our our people hostage that we're coming after you and we're going to rescue our hostages and, and uh, eliminate you uh, so that you can't do this again. And we had a number of successful hostage rescues in addition to the diplomatic work that was done. So I think it was a combination of on the, on the diplomacy front, you know, being able to play good cop to President Trump's bad cop, uh, working with our allies and our friends and our, our like-minded partners, and then using the exquisite and capabilities of the U.S. military to, to rescue hostages whenever we could. And the audience should know you did all of that, and you got all more Americans home than any other presidency in, in the history of the United States, and you did it all for zero dollars. We, we, we didn't pay ransom. Uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> well, one of the first things that came through when I, I took the job, it was very quickly, and I won't mention the country, but an interlocutor came to us and said, the Iranians are prepared to release hostages, and you know what the price is. And the price they were asking for was the price that, that the Obama administration paid for in the JCPA, about $400 million per hostage. I said, yeah, I, I don't think the, our, our Iranian friends understand the, who they're dealing with now. Because I'm not going to go tell President Trump or Secretary Pompeo that we're going to pay $400 million per American hostage. That's not going to happen, ever. And we didn't, and we, so we brought three hostages home from Iran among the 58 others that we brought home. 
and we didn't pay a dime of ransom to any country, in, including to North Korea, which asked us to pay for the medical t- treatment of Otto Warmbier. And we, it's, you know, Otto, Otto's story was particularly sad, but we got him home before he died, although he was in bad shape. We refused to pay for that medical care. We didn't pay a dime to any terrorist organization or to any pariah state, whether it was China or Russia or Iran. Uh, that, that, so it, it got to a point uh, towards the end of the administration where foreign governments or terrorist organi- organizations didn't even ask us to pay because they knew it wasn't going to happen. And the good news is we had some other big countries like France. President Macron, I give him credit. President Macron changed his, his government's policy. France used to pay ransom, or at least was reported to have paid ransom. And uh, the French stopped paying ransom, and then the Italians stopped paying ransom. But w- once America starts paying ransom, we can't go out to our, our allies and like-minded partners and tell them, don't negotiate with terrorists, don't pay ransom. Yeah, when, when we do it, it opens the spigots and opens the doors, and it creates a, a market for future hostages. Hostage taking, you put a price tag on a blue passport or on a Western passport. But the second thing you do, and I said this at the time of this, this most recent Iran deal, is when you give Iran five or six billion dollars for five Americans, uh, you're not only creating a market for them to take new hostages because there's, it's a rational economic decision at that point, but you're funding future terrorism. Yeah, I, and I said this at the UN a couple of weeks ago. I said, you're gonna fund the drone makers who are killing Ukrainians. Right. Well, what I, what I didn't understand, Morgan, is how quickly and how vividly both those points, that we'd have future hostages and terrorist activity taking place the way we did in, in southern Israel with Hamas. There's a direct correlation between what we did with Iran and what happened in southern Israel, and it's, 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 it's a shame, it's bad for America, bad for the world, it's certainly bad for our Israeli friends, but th- th- this is what paying ransom results in. It's, it's foreign policy malpractice. The last thing on the hostages, because I do want you to tell this somewhat funny story, I got a call uh, when we had an American that had been imprisoned, um, and it was a rapper, and we, you know, listen, we care about all Americans individually. Doesn't, doesn't matter if you're famous or not famous. But uh, I am one for classical music, so I did not know who this rapper was, but I, I knew he was important. And I, I spoke to his representative and said, well, I'm good friends with Robert O'Brien. Don't worry, I'm going to get him on the phone. I'll tell Pompeo uh, this is clearly important. So I called my staff in and I said, guys, we have some, an American arrested. We need to get on this right away with, with this BIHA staff. His name's ASAP Rocky. I'll oh, see so you guys. So his name's ASAP Rocky. So it just goes to show what a boomer I am. And you all are quite anyone, nerdy because you guys didn't get it either, did you? <laughs> anyone under 30 knows who he is. <laughs> so tell us about how you got ASAP Rocky out of prison. Well, so uh, Abraham, I was involved in the Abraham Accords. I was involved in the Serbia-Kosovo normalization, some big operations like the Baghdadi raid. Uh, on my tombstone, ASAP Rocky, it'll be, this is the guy who got ASAP Rocky out. Uh, I didn't know who ASAP Rocky was. My daughters were very impressed when they heard I was going to try and get ASAP Rocky out of captivity. And he was being held by Sweden. So it's a little bit unusual. Uh, but I had I, come home to Los Angeles for the weekend. I commuted home, and it was a Saturday morning. I think I was running to the store. And the, the phone call, the phone rang, and I picked up and said, please hold for the secretary. And it was Secretary Pompeo. He said, I need you on a flight to, to Sweden to meet it to Stockholm, like today or tomorrow, the next flight out of L.A. to Stockholm. I said, okay, what's the mission? He said, well, we've got to get ASAP Rocky uh, out, out of jail, out of Swedish jail. <laughs> uh, usually I'm dealing with Lebanon or Algeria or, you know, Yemen or someplace like that, Iran, China, Russia. I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, I, said, I'll, I said, what tools do I have? He goes, oh, you can, the president is very serious about this. He expects them to be out very quickly. And I said, okay, okay well, I'll, I'll undertake the mission. I'll go. So I flew in, and Pompeo said, uh, Secretary Pompeo said, listen, you can, you can tariff, uh, you can put tariffs on Ikea or, or, or Volvo if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, well, that'll help. So I got to Sweden, and, and the Swedes weren't very happy. The Swedish government wasn't very happy to see me. And uh, I, I said, well, you know, we need to get him out. The president thought he had to deal with the prime minister of Sweden. Apparently, the president's understanding and the prime minister of Sweden's understanding were different. Although I think the, the prime minister of Sweden may have changed his views a bit. Uh, and uh, subject to political pressure in Sweden. ASAP Rocky, to be totally blunt here, he, he would have never been prosecuted in L.A. or New York or San Francisco. 
he, he and his, his guys were stalked by a couple of, of migrants from the Middle East uh, that attacked him. The, the mistake the guys from the Middle East made is like, you don't attack a rapper and his posse uh, because it's not going to end well. And they kind of got beat up after they attacked him. The, Swiss, the Swedes took the position that, uh, there was un, that there was too much force. Once they had the guys on the ground, there was one or two kicks too many. Uh, to defend, so it went beyond self-defense, and so they were going to keep ASAP and, and two two members of his team uh, in jail for some time. I had to explain to the Swedes that, listen, this is U.S. credibility is now at stake. The president has tweeted that ASAP Rocky is coming home at the end of the week, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I've got to go from here to Lebanon, and I've got a very important negotiation that that Jacques knows about. Uh, uh, on an Iranian hostage, and I can't be seen as having failed in Sweden and uh, expect to get get somebody out of a, a hellhole in the Middle East because our credibility was shot. And uh, they said, well, there's nothing we can do. We've got our laws. And I said, well, the king can pardon them. And they said, well, the king's in the south of France. I said, well, I'm happy to go see the king in the south of, the south of France. Uh, but he needs to pardon me. He said, well, that's not how it works. This and I said, well, here's how it's going to work. ASAP's going to be on a plane by the end of the week. And uh, it's, it's very important to us. And I said, it would be terrible if, they, you know, if you lost your Volvo plant in, uh, <laughs> in South Carolina, and, uh, which I felt bad doing because I like the Swedes. And, uh, Volvo does have the most comfortable seats. Yeah, great car. And so, I, uh, but going to, so they were going to do a trial, and I said, look, it would be good if he was, you know, if, if you convict him, you convict him, but he's got to be let out for time served on Friday. He's got to go home at the end of the trial. They, just, they said, no, we're not doing that. And uh, on Thursday, by the way, going to court, more press than I've ever seen in my life, including at the White House when I was National Security Advisor. There were like 250 press guys accredited to the, uh, the trial. And no one would talk. The Swedes were very professional. Their prosecutors wouldn't talk. There were no leaks coming out of, out of the court or out of the, the prosecution office. So the only thing the press had was me arriving in the morning and leaving at night. And they'd all, you know, bunched together. The Swedes actually were very nice and provided police escort, you know, up and down to get through the press. And ASAP Rocky was released at the uh, at the end of the week, which was was very nice. It was it all worked out well, and and we uh, ended our relationship on a on a nice note with the Swedes. A month later, I'm made national security advisor. My first meeting at the UN at the UNGA is with the Swedish foreign minister to talk about North Korea, <laughs> and I walked in and. They were a little apprehensive. I, I, I thought they'd be mad at me. They thought I'd be mad at them, and uh, we hugged it out, and we had a great relationship <laughs> with Sweden for the next year and a half, and, uh, and they're a great, great partner and now NATO ally, and, uh, and so all, all is well ends well. But the best part is I ended up at the, the head of intelligence in, in, Be- in Lebanon and Beirut a week later. I sat down with our ambassador and this general, a very tough guy, warlord, Middle Eastern guy, and uh, the first thing he says is, my kid said you're involved in ASAP Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I get to Beirut, and I'm being, being asked about ASAP Rocky, so that was my, my 15 minutes of fame, as Andy Warhol would say. So we're foreign policy, Republican foreign policy professionals. What happens when you get to you know, the pinnacle of a career in national security, which is to be asked by the President of the United States to be his national security advisor. How do you prepare for that moment, and how do you rise to the occasion? I can only imagine when you went into the office that, that so many legends before you uh, sat in. How do people in this room that are dreaming about being having that job one day, how do you prepare for it, and how did you take on the pressure? Yeah, so one, one I've got a great wife, Lo Marie, who's in the front row here, and she supported me all through the hostage yeah. envoy days, so thank you, Lo Marie. And, uh, so that was number one. I mean, preparing for it with President Trump was a little unusual because I, I'd interviewed for the job, but there was a list of 10 people that were up. And look, I, I've had this happen many times before. I'm always like the Republican to be named later in a trade, you know, so they always fill in the, 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 the list of 10. I'm always the ninth or 10th person that they, they kind of throw in there. So I, I'd called my wife. I'd heard about this. I was in Israel working on trying to get some IDF soldiers home from Gaza, from Hamas. Uh, and... Uh, I called my wife and I said, I'm on this list, but I'm going straight home to LA. I'm not going to go to DC. It's not going to happen. And Lomery said, no, go to DC, at least do the interview. So I interviewed with the president, flew home to California that weekend. And, and the president was actually in California doing a fundraiser, asked me to see him again. I met with him. I, I, I thought he offered me the job, but our good friend, Pete Wilson, who a lot of you know, a great governor of California, former senator and Reagan board, or uh, well, he is a Reagan board member, but he's also a Nixon board member, was with me. And 
the president asked Pete to come in for the interview. He said, asked me how well I knew Pete. And I said, I've known since I was 16, so I've known Pete for a long time. He said, well, Governor, come on in. I thought the president offered me the job, and I walked out of the room, and I said, I think he just offered me the job. And Pete said, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I wouldn't say anything. <laughs> so so we, we found out the next morning by tweet. We woke up at 6.30 in the morning when the phone started you know, ringing, and Lomery turned on the TV, and the, the tweet, tweet was on that I'd been offered the job, or it was, it was being appointed on, by Twitter. So that's, that's, that's how... Well, the, at uh, least you didn't get fired by Twitter. Yeah, I, 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 didn't get, I, did, I did not get fired by Twitter, as a number of people did, so I was able to... I was the only national security advisor President Trump didn't fire, so I, I got that going for me. <laughs> uh, but no, li- listen, I was... I'm from California, you know, I'm out, outside of D.C., and, uh, but I had the opportunity and, to work at the U.N. as a young lawyer, I'd been a, like you, a reservist. And, and a, you know, Morgan's not just a uh, Fox commentator and, and, and uh, spokesperson and pretty face. She's also a, a Navy reservist and intel officer and a kick-ass warrior. And uh, I had the opportunity to serve in the Army Reserve as a JAG officer. I had the opportunity to work in, in Switzerland, in Geneva, for the UNCC and, and working at the Security Council as a younger lawyer. Had the opportunity to work in the Bush administration. I worked on a couple of presidential campaigns, all of which lost. So uh, you don't want me on your presidential campaign. I'm bad luck. So uh, ask Governor Romney about that. And Scott and Governor Walker. So uh, if, if I endorse a presidential campaign, I'm, I'm being careful about endorsing President Trump again because if I do, he'll lose. So I, I told him, I'm with you, sir. I support you 100%, but don't get me too far out in front because I'm, I'm bad luck on a, on a big campaign. But, and then I obviously did the Afghanistan work with you, Morgan, and you did a great job on, on that program, and, and then the hostage envoy work. And uh, so, you know, over a career, you, you, you develop a, uh, you know, uh, an appreciation for the, the threats that face America. And I, I was lucky enough to grow up, you know, I remember President Nixon as a young man, and, and then, you know, kind of came of age politically during the Reagan years, and, and it was all about peace through strength. And so I understood that if a strong America was good for our country and our countrymen and, and keeping us safe. And that was a prayer I said every morning before I left my apartment to, to go to work at the White House was it a pretty simple prayer. It's like, uh, help me keep America safe today. And, and I knew we'd keep our allies safe. If we, a strong America wasn't just good for us here in, in the U.S., but it was good for our friends in Israel and Europe and Asia and, and around the world, Australia. And, and so it was peace or strength. And that, that's really what prepared me was you know, growing up watching President Nixon and President Reagan, the Bushes, and... Uh, kind of getting an understanding of what our adversaries, like weakness is provocative, and when our adversaries see us as weak or perceive us to be weak, even if we're not, fundamentally, they'll try and take advantage of it. And so my whole, whole goal every day going into the Trump White House was to work with the president to keep America safe by being strong. So let's just say, fast forward and say this is Jan- the afternoon of January 20th, 2025, the Republican nominee has won and is the presidency. And let's just say you're going in in some form in, in that administration. After Afghanistan, Russia, Ukraine, Hamas and Israel, and God forbid whatever else comes in the next year and a half, how do you clean up this mess? Yeah, look, it's not going to be easy. I, Mike Pompeo and I were talking about this last night uh, before his speech. Is it, we knew things wouldn't go as well as it did with us, and it's not a criticism of President Biden. It's just the Democrat approach to foreign policy is, is a very different approach than the, the, the GOP approach, unless you've got someone like Jane Harman or Michelle Fuller, and I, I hate to mention them because if I ever mention a Democrat who's, who's good on foreign policy, it's probably bad for their career. But, uh, but you know, if you don't have a, a strong America and a peace or strength foreign policy and a pro-American foreign policy, things aren't going to go well in the world. So we immediately have to turn around the way we address, speak to the world. And that doesn't mean being belligerent. It means being like Teddy Roosevelt talked about, being quiet. And then the second thing is carrying a big stick. We have to make sure our military is, is the best military in the world, that, that, that our war fighters have the platforms, the weapon systems, everything they need to defend themselves. So, so that people like Morgan, my two daughters, Lomer and my daughters are both on active duty now, uh, young lieutenants and... and uh, We've got to make sure the kids and the, the men and women who are serving us have everything they need to keep themselves safe, but also to, to defeat our adversaries. And, not, and, and that's what deters bad behavior. That's what deters malign activity, is if they know that the United States is strong and that we're willing to exercise our strength if necessary. Now, one thing I'll point out, that works and deterrence works. We did not start a new war under President Trump. Think about when's the last president 
that didn't have a that didn't have a new military engagement. Now we took out a lot of bad guys. We we defended our troops. We defended our embassies, but we didn't start a new war under the Trump administration. Just like Ronald Reagan didn't. Uh, we had Grenada, but that was kind of a, a giant hostage rescue of the medical students. But we were able to do that because our adversaries knew that we were strong and that we were prepared, prepared to use overwhelming force to defend our interests if necessary. And so there's a the, you know there's a humility in that in that you don't. You don't send the 82nd Airborne, like Mike said last night, to solve every crisis. But if, if your adversaries know that the 82nd Airborne or the 101st or a Marine MEU or, or the Air Force or Navy are ready to, to engage if American red lines are crossed, you know, then, then we'll, that, that, that's how we'll clean up the mess. But it's not going to be easy. It's going to be very complicated for the next president. Speaking of the military, um, we are at historic uh, recruit, recruiting lows. I mean, we just can't get people to sign up, except for the Marines. God bless them. People still want to be Marines. I, I think I just saw yesterday. It's the uniforms. They've got great uniforms. I know. That's true. They, they, anyway, I'm, I married a Marine once. Um, but um, the, he's an ex. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, we've got to keep it lively, Robert. But we do have historic recruitment lows. I think the Navy just missed their mark by uh, 20 percent. And you've got a whole generation of young people that have been indoctrinated that this is a racist nation, this is a nation sub- founded on white supremacy, and suddenly everyone is surprised that nobody wants to sign up to fight and die for that country. I, I think our recruitment crisis amongst the services is, is almost a bigger problem than our very slow military industrial base. So how do you fix that problem? Well, the first, it's a great question, Morgan. And, and look, most of it, one of the things that many of you know, and maybe some of you don't know, is that most of our military uh, recruits come from families that have, the, the parents and grandparents and uncles served in the military. And those people are, are generally traditionalists. They, they believe in America. They believe in American exceptionalism. And so when the military, it's not just the culture, it's not just the universities, which are bad enough, uh, with the wokeness and the, and the, the anti-Americanism, and we're seeing, gosh, this horrific anti-Semitism that's taking place on American university campuses, which everybody should deplore, and no one should hire any, any kid who goes out and, and says that they're in favor of Hamas killing innocent Israelis and slitting the throats of babies. That kid shouldn't be hired. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm all for free speech, but there are consequences that come with your speech. And, and supporting terrorism is an outrage. <laughs> so I, I, I can't tell you how happy I was when I saw Bill Ackman, who's a, a Democrat and big you know, hedge fund guy in New York, uh, uh, come out and say he, he and others weren't going to hire these students from Harvard that signed the letters and supporting Hamas. It's one thing to talk about Palestinian rights and a two-state solution and to be within the bounds of decency. But when you're supporting a, and say, supporting Hamas and saying this is what I think one professor tweeted out, what did you think decolonization was going to look like? In other words, genocide against Jews is how we're going to take Israel back. That that that's that's abhorrent. And so we've got that going on on college campuses, where you don't expect to find it. Morgan is in the military, and unfortunately, you know we've seen. I think the Air Force Academy is probably the worst. Uh, we've seen they've got the equivalent of poli- DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion students or officers that are acting like political commissars in the Air Force. I mean, I, I read about this. I didn't know about it when I was National Security Advisor. I read about it in the Wall Street Journal from a, from a kid who left the Air Force Academy, gave up his scholarship, and, and didn't want to be involved in it anymore because of what was happening at the Academy. And, and I know the senior military leadership doesn't want to take it seriously, but if we don't take it seriously, we're, we're going to have a hollowed out military because kids aren't going to want to fight and die for the greatest country in the history of the world. And President Biden talked about this the other day, and I was happy to see him. I was asked for commentary on it. I said, I'm, I'm really glad to see President Biden talking about this being the greatest country in the history of the world. It is the greatest country. It's the strongest country. It's, a, it's, an, Amer- it's an amazing place. But if, if, if we did down, you know, denigrate our own country in our universities and in, uh, in the military, people aren't going to want to go take a bullet for this country. Be, uh, and you know, we, we've, got, we've got to change that immediately and start instilling pride again. I think one of the reasons is that the... <laughs> Excuse me. Under General Berger, the the, mili- the, the Marine Corps refused to go woke. The, sta- the training standards are still high. There's an esprit de corps that you have in the in the Marines, and they 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 push back as as hard as they can against the what well, well, was in the Obama White House and now in the Biden White House of this wokeness in the military. I think the Marines have done the best job of pushing back on it, and that's why their their recruiting is high, is they've kept their standards high, and people want to meet those standards. Uh, the other the other branches of the service need to do the same thing as the Marines have done. 
there's no place for politics. And I'm not suggesting that there's, you know, the, the, the job of the, the, the services isn't to create little Republicans. Uh, or, or, you know, it's not, that it, you know, it's not a college Republican club or a young Republican club. It should be totally non-political. I mean, people shouldn't know what political party their captain or their major or their, their colonel's in. It should be totally devoid of politics. And, and so we, we need to get back to that ideal. So we know that a week and a half ago, uh, we obviously lost over 1,400 Israelis, but importantly, we lost 30 Americans. I believe that's the most Americans that we've lost in a terror attack since 9-11. We know that we have at least 14 uh, that are held hostage right now. What is the appropriate American response uh, when terrorists have killed that many Americans? So this is something that's been quite disturbing to me the past you know, week or two, 10 days. And uh, uh, to be honest, I, I don't understand what's going on. When America has been attacked in the past, the response of Secretary Baker, or Secretary Schultz, or Secretary Pompeo, Secretary Rice would be, look, if you're a terrorist, we're going to find you. You've killed Americans. You've taken Americans hostage. We're going to kill you. We're going to find you, and we're going to bring you to, ju to justice, you know, just like we did with Baghdadi and, and ISIS and shutting down the caliphate. The, the idea of Ronald Reagan said you can run, but you can't hide. That, that was always America's response when we were hit with, with terrorism. And, and now... We've got grief for the families, which is important, and you know we, we've got it. And Tony Blinken's a very eloquent Secretary of State. He's you know speaks better French than I do by far, so he's got that going for him. Uh, but he and that's he, about he, it. He wants to stand. He, he wants to stand by Israel, and that, that's important too that we stand by Israel. But where's the outrage about what hap has happened to American citizens and Americans being killed? I I, I don't see it, and I've, I've never seen an administration respond to a crisis in this manner. I mean, we're the United States of America. We defend our citizens and we, re we re re rescue our hostages. And there's been nothing on that front. Now, the, the, the best case scenario, and again, I do a caveat everything I say, I was much smarter about national security before I was national security advisor. And, and I'm much smarter after I've been in office. You know, once you're, when you're in office, it's a little tougher. You're, you're trying to muddle through sometimes and, and get the best result for the country. And I. Look, Jake Sullivan, who replaced me, is a, is a good man, and uh, I'm sure he's doing his best. And maybe there's some negotiation going on now with Qatar or, or some other country to get the Americans home, and I hope that is. And, and maybe there's a reason for the, 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 the quietness. But once they're home, we better figure out how to get our voice back as the United States of America and let the terrorists and the, let those that would do us harm, whether it's the Chinese Communist Party or the Russians or the, you know, the North Koreans or whoever it is, that if you do America harm, you're going to pay a heavy price, and there's going to be a massive consequence. Because if you don't, the, again, it's this gets back to this idea of weakness being provocative. We're going to see one one malign act after another like this, and, and killing Americans and taking them hostage is about the worst thing that can by a, a two-bit terrorist organization like Hamas is about the worst thing you can do. And we, I hope we we come down on Hamas like a ton of bricks once the Israeli, if there's anything left when the Israelis get done with them, I hope we come after them hard. So that there's a, other terrorist organizations understand that, that if you take, there's a, there'll be a major price to pay if you take American lives or take Americans hostage. It's just unfathomable the way we've kind of conducted things so far, and, unless there's something going on that I have no idea of, and I hope there is. What is, uh, so you, you were with President Trump on a daily basis. What's one thing that we all don't know about him that you learned about him from your time as National Security Advisor? So... <laughs> I don't know if President Trump would like me to say this because he might, might think it sounds weak, but uh, he's an incredibly cordial man, uh, especially in his dealings with foreign leaders. And I, I was with him on every phone call. Uh, and the amount of sympathy, especially during COVID, that he showed for foreign leaders and, 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 and foreign governments, uh, friends and foes who were battling COVID and who were trying to get through the, the crisis uh, was really impressive. He showed a lot of empathy, which is not something that I think the general public would associate with President Trump. Uh, he was incredibly kind. He was generous. We gave ventilators out to countries around the world, including some countries that were very that were adverse to us but were suffering. Uh, and and he's, you know, I used to say he was our best diplomat because he's he's so good in these environments with with foreign governments. Tough, always tough. You know, he was never going to back down on his his you know belief that America was the greatest country in the world and that America America should come first. But he was always very, uh, very cordial. I think that's something that people would understand, 
you know, from the outside that he's, he was really a, a great diplomat. And, but, you know, being tough is, is part of being a diplomat, but, you know, someone once said being a, dip, a good diplomat is saying the, the nastiest possible things in the nicest possible way. And, uh, and President Trump was very good at that. And, and you, you just look at the results that we got. We healed the Gulf Rift between Qatar and, and the UAE and Bahrain and Egypt and Saudi. We got the Abraham Accords done, which people said was you know never going to happen. We got Serbia, Kosovo, which are now at each other's throats, but we we got them to sign an economic normalization deal. Uh, so there was, we we even, we even had a good deal with the in Afghanistan that unfortunately went south after we left. But the the number of peace deals that we got. Uh, because of President Trump's strength, but also his cordiality and his willingness to be a good diplomat uh, is something that I think history is going to look at uh, 50 years from now when all the partisanship and the polarization is maybe cooled down a little bit. L by the way, like with President Nixon, I think he's, President Nixon's being totally reevaluated 50 years on. I think President Trump will be as well. And I think people, people will see the success of the administration and understand them for, for the, the achievements and accomplishments that they were, you know, putting aside the, the, you know, some of the partisanship that we see, unfortunately, in, in the country today. You know, we could keep going around the world, but in the few minutes that we have left, I want to go back to what you said at the beginning when I asked you the question about how you prepare for your moment in the spotlight, your moment in history as being National Security Advisor. And you brought up your wife, Lou Marie, who we all know and love. And I hope you don't mind me bringing this up, but the two of you have been such an amazing example to me for so many long, for so many years, most especially because you went through an unspeakable tragedy of losing a child, but you stayed strong, you stayed together, and you went on to achieve great things. I would just love, you know, I think we all know what you think and feel about the world. I'd love for you to just tell us more about your marriage and your family and how that has made you the policymaker that you are today. Well, I, I, I got married as, as a child. Uh, I think I was 21, Lumber was 22. We, we met in college, and uh, and I was lucky enough to get a great great wife, great woman that I, I, I met who's been a partner with me the whole time. And, you know, the success our kids have had, I, you know, I give Lumber all the credit. We had two Girl Scout Gold Awards and, a, and an Eagle Scout. And, uh, and, and, you know, in our family, it was, it's God family country. We, we took the kids to church and, and prayed at every meal and prayed at night and, uh, and taught them that they were, you know, incredibly lucky to be born in America. I mean, there, there are very, very few countries that have the opportunities that you have here. And it's, it's a blessing. I grew up as a middle-class kid in Santa Rosa, California and uh, had the opportunity to become you know, a successful lawyer, national security advisor. And that, where, where else can you do that in the world? There's very few places. And so I think Lomer and I realized we were fortunate and, and uh, blessed, and, and, and we had a, a tradition of service in, in the military in our, in our family. And, uh, and then my, my two daughters now are doing great, and uh, one, one's an Air Force pilot, one's an Army JAG officer, and they're both, both on active duty now, and uh, we're, really, we're very proud of them. And... Uh, so, so, but again, the, the, the credit goes for that, all that goes to Lomri. I always work long hours and travel a lot in, private, in the private sector and in, in government. And, uh, and I had a great, great home front. Like, and, and by the way, anyone who is in the service here, men and women, you know what your spouse has done when you're deployed or when you're off you know, doing things. And I wasn't deployed in combat, but I was uh, traveling around the world in, in my job capacity. And... Uh, and that's the it's a, it's, it's the spouses, the military spouses that are at home taking care of families that we really owe a debt of gratitude to. Well, thank you so much. I think that that was amazing. Thank you for sharing the personal side because I think that we we all know what you were able to achieve on the policy side, but sort of peeling back and looking behind the curtain and knowing what it's like to be a national security ad advisor was, is, is, I think, something so many people in this room aspire to. Get, get, ASAP, get ASAP Rocky out of jail. <laughs> that's, 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 that's your best, that's your best ticket to be an NSA. Um, there you go. So finally, in closing, uh, what is your advice uh, to, to, you mentioned, you said nice things about Jake Sullivan. Um, wh what is your advice to him in this administration in the final year and a half? Well, you know, it'd be presumptuous of me to give advice, and they wouldn't probably wouldn't take it. But uh, one of the things I've said recently is I never thought we'd be looking back at the Carter years as the good old days. I mean, and uh, what I'll say about Jimmy Carter, and, and I grew up in those years, and some of you are old enough to remember, 
we lost Mozambique and Angola and Rhodesia and, and uh, Nicaragua to the communists. And, uh, and it, the, the bear was on the march. I remember there was a Time Magazine uh, cover page that had a big bear over the globe. And it looked like the Russians were going to run the table and win everything. And they, they invaded Afghanistan. And, and Jimmy Carter came out and said, to his credit, he admitted to being naive. And he said, I was wrong. I was wrong about the Russians and the Soviets at the time. And we've got to change course as a country. And he boycotted the, the, the Summer Olympics in 1980. And, and what he did, Harold, uh, uh, that was, uh, Harold Brown, his uh, defense secretary, started the defense buildup that became the Reagan defense buildup. People don't realize it actually started in the last year of the Carter administration because Jimmy Carter was, was, had the integrity to admit that he was wrong and to change, change American policy. And what we need as Americans, this isn't a political issue, we need President Biden and Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin and, and, and Jake, NSA Sullivan. They need to change policy, starting with Iran. We have to stop appeasing Iran. They're the largest state sponsor of terrorism. They've just engaged in this horrific attack uh, on, on Israel. We've got to sanction the heck out of them. I know we, there was a debate that you were involved in whether how effective that can be, but we need to put maximum pressure back on Iran. And we need to let the Iranians know that if this doesn't stop, you know, th there's going to be hell to pay. It, with the, the Ukraine, we've had our second big adversary, Russia, has invaded a sovereign country. And as Mike Waltz talked about very eloquently this morning, for those of you who are here, we've got to give the Ukrainians what they need, the tools they need to finish the job and, and stop worrying about provoking Putin and start worrying about how we win the war in Ukraine. We've got to sanction the Russian Federation Central Bank and kick, kick them out of SWIFT. Vladimir Putin and the Russians have made money on this war. Notwithstanding all the sanctions, the price of oil has gone up from 40 to $100 a, a, a barrel. Russia is doing very well with this war, and, and our sanctions have been meaningless because we haven't put the right sanctions in place. And then we've got to send a message to Xi Jinping and the... the the country that is, a, is an existential threat to our, our way of life, to our liberty, to where our kids live and our, our grandkids are going to live is the PRC and the Communist Party of China. And we've got, to, we've got to build a military that's so advanced and so strong that the Chinese understand that it would be foolhardy to attack us or our allies, whether it's Japan or Taiwan or South Korea or, or the ASEAN countries, India, which they've already attacked many times. They have to understand that, 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 that we're back in the business of peace or strength. And that will, that will protect our democratic allies in Taiwan. But what I'm, I'm terrified of, because I love the people of Taiwan very much. They're great people. I've been there, there several times. It's a wonderful place. They're next. We've seen Ukraine go down, or not go down, but at least get invaded. We've seen Israel be invaded. And Xi Jinping has got to be watching this thing, thinking there were so, so few consequences to the Russians and so few consequences so far to the Iranians for their invasions. Why shouldn't I invade China? Or why shouldn't I invade the Republic of China or Taiwan? And so, so we need to change course for the, for the good of America and our partners, not for any political reason, not to say I told you so, but because it'll keep us safe and it'll keep our allies safe, just like Jimmy Carter changed course in 1979 and 1980. And uh, that, that's the advice I'd have, whether it'll be taken or not. But we want, look, I, I've gotten criticized for saying this. I want President Biden to succeed. I want Jake and Tony and, and Lloyd to succeed because it's good for us as Americans. And, uh, but unfortunately, they're not taking the, the policies they're putting in place now. It's not a personal issue, it's not a political issue. The policy is that they're, they're pursuing, especially with Iran and appeasement of Iran and then, you know, this concern about provoking Russia and, and then frankly, the appeasement and the kowtowing to China is making us less safe. So I want them to change, not because it's good for us politically, but because it's good for us as, as Americans in, in keeping us and our kids safe and our grandkids safe. Well, thank you so much for this uh, amazing conversation, Ambassador Robert O'Brien. Thank you, Morgan. That was terrific. This concludes our luncheon keynote. Our next panel will begin at 1.05.
Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to take your seats as we resume. Questions abound today about what really is economic self-interest. Free trade versus tariffs, onshoring versus overseas investment. What are the right series of policies to consider in formulating a 21st century grand strategy, considering great power competition, technological advancements, the instability of the world in which we find ourselves? To tackle all this and more, allow me to introduce Joe Kernan, co-host of Squawk Box on CNBC, to lead this discussion with our panelists, who he will introduce. Great. Hello. Let's get some more people in here quickly. We will. Uh, I would like to thank the Nixon Foundation for inviting me to this great event. I take great pleasure in introducing uh, my two esteemed panelists, my good friend and frequent guest on Squawk Box, Congressman Ro Khanna from the 17th Congressional District of the great state of California, who told me that the 49ers were a lock versus the Browns last Sunday. <laughs> And I bet the house. Thanks, Ro. <laughs> and Elbridge uh, Colby, co-founder and principal of the Marathon Initiative, who also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Planning in the Trump administration. And our, our uh, topic specifically is protectionism in grand strategy. It relates to many things uh, that President Nixon felt very deeply about. It influences and determines our ability uh, to maintain our standing um, in the world as the preeminent economic and military power. Uh, and in his words, and we, I may have heard this last night, uh, Katie may have mentioned it, but you can't say it too many times, economic power not only enables us to maintain the levels of military power that we need, by itself it's a powerful weapon that you skillfully can advance our interest. It brings prosperity, not destruction and we should stop being apologetic about having it and reticent about using it. And uh, how many more examples do we need uh, than what's happened in recent days? So protectionism can take many forms. We're going to talk about some of them. There's been a lot of discussion on both sides of the aisle about the negative impacts uh, that protectionism can have on free trade. Uh, but we do perhaps need it to combat China's growing industrial base. And President Trump put in um, tariffs and duties, something that is usually loathed to Republicans. Was this a good idea, Ro, in your view? Well, first of all, Joe, thank you for doing this. Uh, good to be here. I couldn't have predicted the missed field goal, so but my wife was happy with Cle <laughs> being a Cleveland Brown fan. I thought it was a lock. I and mean, uh, Colby, thank you for all your insight. I, I supported the, the, the tariffs uh, targeted on China, so I want to answer your question. But I think we have to look at this more broadly. I mean, China has a massive trade deficit with the United States, surplus. We have the trade deficit. They've got a surplus with Japan. They've got a surplus with Korea. They've got a surplus with India. How did we let this happen? How, how did we allow them to accumulate all of this surplus cash, which then they use to advance their foreign policy instance interest by creating vassal states around the world. They're using our financing to do that. I mean, we went from being the largest exporter of steel to the largest importer of steel. Nine out of the 15 top steel companies are in China. We don't have a single one. So I believe that we need to couple strategic tariffs with the financing that Hamilton had, that FDR had to build modern industries back here in the United States, including modern steel, and that we need to have an explicit goal of reducing the trade deficit and rebalancing our economy. Tariffs are one tool to do that. <clears throat> I usually have a mic right here. I've got to remember this. If I was interviewing you, I, do, I keep getting confused. I do. I keep getting confused. Now I only have to remember myself. Okay. Bridge, historically, Republicans... As I said, we've been loath uh, to, to levy tariffs, and there's a lot of 
grousing that Trump wasn't a, a true Republican. Uh, and we don't like it. We chafe as a country when, when we're subject to duties and tariffs uh, from even our friends as well as our enemies. But do you think in this case with, with steel dumping from China or, or Korea, or we've even had problems with, was it milk with Canada or something? I mean, do you think there is a time and place for it? Uh, absolutely, and it's an honor to be on here with, with you, Joe, and Congressman Khanna. Uh, I actually pretty much agree with everything he said. Um, uh, look, I think there's a question about uh, are you know, industrial policy and tariffs uh, better in the abstract? Well, that's one question, but there's another question when uh, is, is industrial policy, tariffs, and so forth necessary when you have the first peer economy to emerge in 150 years, substantially on the back of our financing, as the congressman just said, uh, is itself using Distort, distortionary moves and so forth. It's one thing if it's a relative, say, Taiwan or South Korea. I'm not saying it's okay in that context. It's an entirely different matter when it's a peer economy that is also coupling that with geopolitical and military moves. I would just say, Joe, I'm, I don't think it's actually fair to say that Republicans historically have been against the tariffs. In fact, historically, I think Republicans were often strongly in favor of the tariffs and industrial policy. You go back as Congressman Connor wrote, I think, in Foreign Affairs, uh, the Hamiltonian tradition that in, in a lot of ways the Republicans, at least in part, are, are heirs to. And I, I, I know President Reagan, I'm sure President Nixon also used these kind of measures. I mean, I think the successful policy that we pursued during the po Cold War was a more measured form of free trade where we were also looking to have balanced trade and balanced accounts and being conscious of how others were using it, especially as, that, as they recovered. I think the error which President Trump rightly and people like Bob Lighthizer rightly put their finger on, was after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we kind of went willy-nilly in the free trade and, and liberalization direction without any sense that there was going to be some kind of um, counter, counter move by others to balance that out. I mean, in the sense that I, I think people often point out that China, you know, there was a failure of U.S. policy on China after the end of the Cold War in the sense that it di di didn't liberalize. I think that's partially true. But the, mo the, the more profound failure of our policy was that even if China didn't liberalize and continued these kinds of distorting economic moves and so forth, that we would still outcompete them substantially. And it's that error that's more consequential that I think we do need to, to uh, rectify in the ways that the Congressman was just talking about. <clears throat> I mean, in a perfect world, there would be no tariffs. Would there? there but there's no such thing. And, and if, if Republicans aren't going to, to be free market, and we're not, we can't count on Democrats to, to embrace the free market to the extent that, that oh, sorry, so, so no, but if, we, if the Republicans don't reject Well, I mean, tariffs, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's saying anti-free trade. It's saying we need to take account, we're not, you know, it, we're not 50% of global GDP in the, the way that we were in 1945. We're not so far the world's largest and most advanced economy, or at least the largest economy as we were yep. in 1991. So we need to look at what, and if our competitors are cheating, more than our competitors, our fundamental rivals, if not our opponents and enemies, are cheating on a grand scale, including in ways that involve an unprecedented military buildup. The congressman mentioned steel companies. Well, the Office of Naval Intelligence just reported that China has, I believe, 200 times the shipbuilding capacity of the United States. That was not a coincidence, as the Marxists say. And I, I probably should have thanked thank you, Ro, for, for, for you know, coming here and, and being here. And you come on my show all the time, so you, you know, you're okay. You, you're very confident. You're very confident. But this I, is I thought civil discourse and agreement <laughs> it used is. to be the core it of is. American it, it, uh, it is. traditions. I think, right. But you're the only Democrat in the place, I think, aren't you? I mean, I, 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 and I think that's sad. I think that the commentary in our country where uh, we can't go into a, a forum where people may disagree or have a different ideology and win or present the force of argument. That's part of what's tearing this country apart. We have some problems with tribalism. You, 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 do, you do see that. It's rough. It's tough out there. You must get it all the time. And you're from, isn't it? Like, you're close to San Francisco, too, right? Silicon Valley. Silicon, Silicon Valley. Valley. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So they asked me to, to mention, uh, is the steel uh, low-grade that we've gotten, Bridge, from, from China? Is it, is it, uh, are we worried about national security from the quality of the steel? Well, I don't know about the, about the quality of the steel that we're getting from China, but the fact that we appear to be dependent on China for important components for some of our weapon systems, including I think they had to suspend F-35 production for uh, at least a little while because some of the components were sourced from China. I think this shows uh, the fundamental. I mean, look, 
you know, I think what we're seeing, I mean, to, to connect it to the national security context for a second, what we're seeing very tragically in the case of the Ukraine war is that even with all of the cyber capabilities, AI, space, et cetera, at the end of the day, a large war between major powers is going to tend to be a war, a kind of an industrial and, you know, with post-industrial elements of, of attrition. It's going to be a war of attrition and um, when, when the sides are sufficiently resolute. And in that context, you need to be able to produce stuff. You know, yes, I mean, if you, if you look at, the, say, the conflict uh, in Ukraine, obviously, I mean, Eric Schmidt wrote a piece in the journal a couple months ago pointing out the, the use of drones, and, and he's a you know, great thinker on, on, on these issues. But on the other hand, the war in Ukraine, in a lot of respects, the front lines seem like they would be recognizable to a soldier fighting on the Western Front in early 1918 because both sides have technology, both sides have scale, et cetera. And in that case, you need to be able to produce. And what we're seeing is that we're not. We're, we're, we're definitely not. And one of the things that really disturbs me is this kind of blasé attitude. And I'll say uh, the president exhibited the other night and Secretary Yellen and others, but many leading Republicans also exhibit that it's, you know, the Wall Street Journal op-ed page last week said, it's a false choice to say that we need to make decisions among these theaters. I think the re manifest reality is that we don't have the defense industrial base that we need. And it seems to me that that's a, a bipartisan area where we need to be able to produce weapons at scale, not only for our own deterrence and defense, but for that of our allies, a very close ally like Israel, but also a way to bring back the kind of jobs in the way that Congressman Khanna was talking about in his foreign affairs piece. Congressman, has your, your thinking changed given how dangerous the world has become again? I mean, we know that the, typically the guns and butter argument and, and certain members of your party think that, you know, we're still spending way too much on defense. Are, are you one of those people? I am, but I think it's not how much you spend, it's what you spend it on. And we're not spending it on the right things, which is I would support a defense industrial base. I would support having more investment in long-range missiles, anti-ship, anti-air, to make sure that we are deterring uh, a, an invasion of Taiwan. But on the defense industrial base, look, I had a bipartisan amendment that cleared uh, on the national defense authorization that said, let's just figure out how much of our industrial base are we dependent on other countries. The Department of Defense doesn't even know it. If we're going to move up to a trillion dollar defense budget, at least let's know what are we procuring in the United States, what are we pro procuring outside. And we don't track that. We don't track that for the, Mike Gallagher and I had a uh, hearing this morning on the replicator program, they don't know for that how much of the supplies are going to be procured, not just outside the United States, but in non-ally companies. So we do need to build our defense industrial base, but we also need it from a sense of pride and bringing this country together to be a manufacturing superpower. I mean, imagine, Joe, if someone came in with a platform in the 1970s, 1980s and said, you know what, we don't really need Wall Street. Let all the finance jobs go to London. Or we don't need Hollywood. Let Bollywood make all the movies. Or we don't need tech. You know, let some European country do tech. We would have thought they were crazy. But the tech folks, the Wall Street folks, the media folks, we kept those jobs here. And then manufacturing, we said, oh, it didn't matter. A country needs self-reliance on critical industries. And it was a colossal mistake that I think has contributed to the polarization of this country that we hollowed out our manufacturing base. And I'm glad that we're starting now on a bipartisan basis to figure out how we get it back. I was going to go here, but now you're, you're where I'm going in a second, so I think we should stay, uh, stay with this. So we did the, the IRA. We did the CHIPS Act. Is that... Bridge, do you think those were you? There were some were bipartisan, some weren't. Is it quasi central planning to, to subsidize favored industries? It's going to be expensive because things are going to cost a lot more to make here. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, others are much more expert on the specifics of those legislative proposals than, than I. I think what I would say is, I mean, you know, the, the, the sort of at least in some quarters, the classic narrative that things just all completely develop organic really it does not match, I think, the history of our economic development, Germany's economic development, 
France's economic development, Japan and South Korea and Taiwan's economic development. It's more complicated. You don't want central planning, but the, imp the, the involvement of the state is an important factor. Is it protectionism? Europe is mad, bro. At, at, you know, that we're picking U.S. companies to do all these things, right? well, well, give me a break on Europe. First of all, we've got a trade deficit with the EU, so we don't need to be lectured from them. Secondly, secondly they, they've been subsidizing their companies, and they subsidize their companies, and they don't even produce winners. I mean, what's the last good tech company that Europe has produced? So I, I certainly don't think we need lectures from Europe on our economic policy. But, you know, here's the thing on... Uh, on, on, on the policy of in industrialization, and this is just my theory of what happened. I mean, it could be caricatured or shorthand, and feel free to push back. But I, if you look at the New Deal, unemployment, even under the New Deal with FDR until around 1938, was still at 18 to 19 percent. It only falls to 5 percent by 1942. And it's not just the New Deal policies, it's because then FDR goes to Ford and goes to industries, and we basically have the government financing with corporations and labor of new industry in America. With women, by the way, industrializing America. That was Rosie the Riveter at the factory. And unemployment's down to 4%. This is what leads, in my view, to the modern industrial age. The Soviets look at that and say, oh, wow, look, what the Americans did. Isn't this great? And they basically take that war economy message of central planning and, and, and take it to an excess, and they're producing you know, tanks and war machinery without feeding their own people, without doing anything in a consumer economy. And we say, this, is, this doesn't work. We are going to not have just a, a war economy. We're going to have a robust private sector. But because the Soviets become our contrast, we go, in my view, too far where it's just free market absolutism with no understanding that we need to make sure that critical industries stay in the United States. Trump comes along and he says, I can't get my party to, 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 to go along with me. He comes and he says, you can't have a country without steel or aluminum. So if I were advising Biden, I'd say, let's do the first thing. Let's put steel and aluminum across the country, because that you're going to get bipartisan consensus. I love electric vehicles. In Warren, Ohio, hard sell. Down River, Michigan, hard sell. I mean, just being blunt. You know, so how can, why don't we have a start with the simple stuff? Modern steel mills in these places. By the way, one-third the CO2 emission. You could get the left and the right on board on those kind of policies. It is going to be expensive, though, in terms of labor, in terms of everything else. And we've got an inflation problem right now. So you could convince the American public, buy American, and it's going to cost you more, and you're going to have to... You know, at the grocery store, you're going to be thinking long and hard about what you can get, but, but do it because we need to do it. You think we can do that? Well, I, I, I think we can have a Buy American tax credit plan that you get some tax credit at the end if you buy American. But more importantly, you can do uh, modern steel factories uh, with a, 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 an investment with federal financing and the companies and labor where you can be competitive on the price, especially with technology and with AI. And you can't do it for everything. Uh, can you make every toy in the United States? Probably not. Can you make every piece of clothing in the United States? Probably not. But you can do it for strategic industries, and it will bring this country together. I mean, imagine if you put three steel plants in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, and in Michigan. I guarantee you any president who does that would have 60% approval to run for re-election. I, I oh. mean, if I could just... I, yep. mean, well, I mean, I think, I think that's a very compelling argument, but if you don't find that argument compelling... I think the, the, uh, the world crisis, I, I don't think that's an exaggeration to say that we're in a world crisis now. You can disagree with everything the congressman just said and say, well, we better be able to produce our own ships. I mean, Senator Wicker, for instance, is a very, are the, the uh, leading Republican on the Senate Armed Services Committee, is regularly decrying uh, the, the deficits in our shipbuilding industry, as is Congressman Gallagher, uh, uh, you know, uh, as well, head of the China Committee. Um, I mean, these are very real. We need to be able to produce more submarines, more weapons, more ships, more aircraft for peace through strength, not because we want to start wars, but we want to be able to supply our, our allies like Israel, like Taiwan, like Ukraine, ideally, right? So whether or not, even if you don't accept that argument, and I, I basically do, it seems to me it's overdetermined, and the political coalition here just seems to be so compelling. And this is what I... I guess I don't understand. I, I mean, I, I say this genuinely. If, I, if Jake Sullivan were here, I'd say the same thing. I would say, why is the president saying on 60 Minutes, we have no problem? 
why, why aren't we saying, and why maybe, you know, leading Republican senators as well, why aren't we saying, because I, the, the, I would go a little maybe even more specific. I think the current model of the defense industrial base is broken, and I don't think Americans are going to be prepared or support just dumping a whole bunch of extra money into the existing structure that's gone from having 30 defense primes in the 1980s to five now. And people say, wait, we're spending a trillion dollars, to your point, Congressman, and we, we have these problems, we can't produce enough missiles? How is that even possible? So something is fundamentally structurally broken that leads me to think that you could get it more a kind of a left or new right sort of uh, perspective. But at the same time, the sort of national security hawks, the people who are always saying the world is a dangerous place, okay, well, they also should see that we need to be able, we can't be reliant on China to produce the, the steel and the various, and if you get, to me, if you have the, the defense industrial base as the sort of, I don't know, you know, it's kind of the load-bearing pillar, right? You're going to need to have steel production. You're going to need to have enough skilled welders that you're also going to be able to build commercial ships. You're also going to be able to, but it's not that we're going to produce three times the number of cars necessarily and hope to sell them. We're going to be producing more arms for peace, in my view, for ourselves and our, and our allies, but that's also going to allow us to compete more effectively in the commercial non-military sector. Colby, quickly on your point about the defense industrial base, the prime example that is broken is that they came to the United States Congress and said we need to supply more artillery to Ukraine. And I said, okay, I'd support that. Well, the only artillery we have is cluster bombs, which I didn't support with many Republicans, because we don't have enough conventional artillery. And my question was, how do you have a $1 trillion yeah, budget for defense and not make bullets. I mean, isn't that the first thing you make as a def in the Department of Defense? So we absolutely I think, have I mean, I think a, just, an industrial base problem. I think, and I, I, I agree with you, and I think that's a very reasonable point of view. I mean, we might differ on where exactly the defense top line should be, but I mean, a tremendous amount of money is going into personnel. There's reasons for that with the all volunteer force, but basically there seems to be a structure with a relatively small number of prime contractors. The subcontracting base is shriveling, really worryingly, and they're basically incentivized to do, uh, you know, just in time, small batches instead of the kind of, and kind of the, the, the ability to produce large numbers of weapons and capabilities rapidly that would come from a much greater degree of scale that you're not going to get by pouring a hundred billion extra dollars into the existing model. Did you ever see yourself being from where you are saying, I think we need to make a lot more bullets in this country? Did you? Uh, you know did, are one of you, these clips is are you thinking? Viral. Are you thinking this through? I, you are really an enigma wrapped in a, rib, a riddle, I think. Um, bro, whenever you're on, Congressman, on Squawk Box, it's almost always about China. Have you thought about that? It's almost always... It's almost always about China. Well, they got to find something we agree on. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 well, and, <laughs> and we have bridge here, but it's multifaceted discussion, but we're always talking about either, if it's not intellectual property theft, it's privacy, or it's TikTok. It's all these things. It, it, is this a form of us using protectionism? Or, or is our, and I'm sure Bridge thinks there are real concerns. If 10 years from now we're still number one, would it surprise you? Or are we going to have to take some really hard steps to, to deal with China and, and the, the rise of China? I don't know who wants to, to, to go for it. Well, we have a lot of advantages as the United States. I mean, we have an open society, which uh, leads to creativity and innovation in a way that I don't think China society has the same openness. Uh, we have incredible research happening here. We have the best and brightest coming from around the world, which makes us a non-homogenous society. The fact that we still have capital financing going to uh, entrepreneurs is an advantage. But one of our biggest advantages is that we're not complacent. And it would be uh, a gross error uh, to be complacent either to the uh, threat that China poses uh, in the Pacific and what they want to do in dominating the South China Sea, what they want to do in terms of potentially uh, invading Taiwan, but also the other islands in that area, what they want to do on the Indian border with Ladakh and the Uskim Chin region. Uh, it would, we should absolutely not underestimate that. And we should not underestimate their resolve to become the global ec economic leader in the world. Now, their model is, is, is wrong, in my view, because they have no market test because they have just pure government financing uh, of these uh, industries that can lead to corruption and inefficiencies. 
Our model, in my view, is the best one, which has a robust free enterprise economy with uh, immigration, with the rule of law, but it needs to have also strategic direction from uh, the Congress and, and, and the government. If America is not number one, there's only one class of people to blame, the governing class of this country, the politicians. It's not the, uh, the, the entrepreneurs or the, the innovators or even the universities. And I, I'll say one final thing about this. You know, when people talk about the gerontocracy, I said, I said, you know what they're really angry about? And I, I'll just be blunt. It's not like this past generation of politicians have been our greatest generation. It's not like we're talking about people who scaled the cliffs of Normandy. Right. I mean, over the last 40 years, we've presided over the hollowing out of the middle class, hollowing out of the working class. We've got the most polarized country we've had in the last 40 years. That's what people are upset. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I, make, I mean, honestly, I don't know how old you are, Congressman, but I'm in my 40s. You know, if, if it were more debate, and I find a lot of, uh, uh, you know, Democrats or other people along the spectrum, if we were having these kind of debates, I think it could be a lot more constructive. And um, uh, I, I agree with you about the jury. I mean, if you look, I, I wasn't, I'm not the biggest Bill Clinton fan, but you have to say at the end of his administration, the United States, and partially I think a lot of credit to Congressman Gingrich and others, but you have to say we had a nearly balanced budget. We were unparalleled military and geopolitical power. Crime was at all times low. I mean, so there was a lot of social stability, I think you could say, in this country. And China was a distant prospect of potential threat. And, and you look 25 years later, and things are really grim. I mean, the financial crisis, two failed wars, crime is up, a lot of social discord. And now we're worried about losing a war with China. So, I mean, why are we assuming, and a gerontocracy, people used to accuse the Soviet Union, but we look at our, our own you know, leadership class, and it's pretty old. And I think a big part of the problem, and to connect to a point that you made, Congressman, is I don't think they take China seriously enough. I think, you know, the way I think about it is a lot of those people probably think the Chinese are still riding around in mouse suits on bicycles in, in Beijing, and that just ain't the case. That's not what it's I mean, you've got to give the Chinese their due. I, I always say to the Chinese when I have the opportunity to interact with them, I'm worried about you not because I hate you or something. It's because I have so much respect for what you've done. I don't approve of your model, but it's extraordinary what the Chinese people have done in turning 40 years, 50 years, from abject poverty, you know, the Cultural Revolution, to the, you know, the frontier of human development. And we need to take that extremely seriously. And so sometimes people accuse me of being declinist because I say we shouldn't take our, our leadership role or our, our, our preeminent role in the, in the global uh, sort of arena and economy for granted. And I say, well, the real kind of declinism is to be blasé and sanguine, whether you're Democrat or Republican. And I think there's a lot of that. And that's what I and I and I, I want to touch on something, uh, Joe, that you mentioned, which is and it gets to the issue of protectionism is why do we care about Taiwan and why do we care about Asia? Because I think what the Chinese and this makes sense for them, and I'll, I'll be kind of telegraphic about it, but happy to go into it, is I think what China wants is a secure because what they want and what they fear from us is the interruption of their future trajectory as a growing economy. Because scale is what matters. If you look at what Eric Schmidt and Bob Work said in the AI Commission, scale matters as much in, in AI as it does in steel. And you gotta have scale. And uh, the, the incentives of a rising superpower are to make sure they have a guaranteed sphere to sell into and to buy from, and then you orient the, the, the world around you. And that's essentially commercially. And that leads you to have the best universities. And that's, that means that creators will go there. That means the best, you know, the future Hollywood, the future social media companies, even if we have advantages. Because if we're just 20% or less of the global economy, we won't have the scale. And if China's dominant over 50% of the global economy, the future of the world is in Asia, then you're going to see protectionism. They're going to basically condition our, our company's entry into that market on compliant behavior. And so if you say something wrong on social media, it might, it might be Xinjiang right now, but their criteria are going to escalate because that's human nature and that's how, how power works. And so that's why we can't allow China to dominate Asia. And if we allow Taiwan to fall, Beijing's going to make a big step forward. So the stakes here are economic, even though what, what's, what's going to determine that is the military balance in the region. Bridge, I was going to plug your book, too, from a couple of years ago, The Strategy of Denial, American... Uh, defense in the age of great power conflict. Good book. Thank you. It, it, it is good. He brought me a copy, which, which uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to reading all of it. But, and I'm not picking on you, Roe, because both parties spend a lot of money. But, uh, Bridge, for, for our ability to do what we need to do economically and militarily to, to face China over the next 10 years, we've got $33 trillion in debt 
and we've got interest rates. I think the 10-year was just under 5%. Mortgage rates are now 8%. In a couple of years, just paying interest is going to be bigger than what we spend on defense. I mean, how are you... And like I said, I'm not picking on you, but you, man, you guys have spent a lot of money. This, the, I mean, you, you doubled the deficit from, from where it should have been, even without the pandemic, bro, right? You still blaming the Trump tax cuts? or? Well, that did add to the deficit. But look, I, here... Well, we, those, we, are, but those are good the, things. Here, here, here we have an uh, ideological difference. I'll just tell you where I'm, I'm coming from. You know, the biggest place, in my view, that added to the deficits uh, were one... Staying, I supported the initial strikes into Afghanistan, but staying there for 20 years, getting into Iraq, having a foreign policy that was not focused on our national interest but got us overextended around the world. Right. Then you had the massive deregulation of financial industry that led in part to the financial crisis of 2008. That contributed. And then we, uh, in my view, I disagreed with uh, the Bush and Trump tax cuts to to, to the very wealthy. And if you reversed a lot of that, you'd be in a situation of much less uh, deficit spending. And my view, though, where we could agree is spending that is productive, where there you have a rate of return on economic growth, is different than spending that's not productive. Now, Democrats love to call everything productive. You do know you what? think a corporate tax cut is a, is a tax cut for the wealthy because corporations are... I, I, when I hear that, I, I always kind of – that makes me chafe. So, so the, well, the corporations are – don't you think we should have a low corporate tax rate to compete globally? I think there are ways I, – I think that the benefits of that tax cut went to people who already are doing very, very well. I think that was that, – that's where we just disagree. And I would have rather uh, put that investment in – uh, building our industrial base. But whether we agree or not on the Trump tax cut, we just, just I mean, I voted against it, so obviously I'm on record right. disagreeing with it. But the, the point is that there are places where we can talk about productive investment in building the industrial base, in building our manufacturing base, where we can start to find some common ground in a Congress that is divided on tax policy and health care policy on many right. other issues. I guess, Bridget, I, I was asking the question just because it's just, I'm not optimistic about our ability to do all the things we well, need to do from, from where we are without growth, without more tax cuts. No, go ahead. Sorry. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I would not presume to comment on the tax cuts and, <clears throat> and the rate of return. I mean, there are others who are far more sophisticated and qualified. But what I would agree on is that we definitely blew a lot of money unnecessarily and political capital also in the country in terms of the, the failed wars and a lot of wasted things and so forth. Um, and then we're paying for that. And regardless, you know, there's been a ton uh, uh, put out in COVID, and for instance, leaving aside the merits of it, I think the, the implication is that we need to pursue the kind of foreign policy and defense policy in particular that the congressman's talking about, which is more focused on our national interests, is selective and oriented specifically on the things that, that, that we need to do. And this is the main message. I mean, my, I, I would say my two big messages are focus on China. Well, focus on China, prepare for war in order to deter it. That's the best way to get to stability. And three, focus and be selective because I think regardless of what happens now, we are definitely so much in debt and the deficit is so hard, high that we're not going to be able, and we were talking about President Reagan, and I'm a big fan of President Reagan, but this is not 1981. We do not have the macroeconomic picture. We do not have the workforce picture that we had then. It's very different. And, there, you know, I mean, I was struck, I, I mean, the Wall Street Journal, and I published there, and I agree with them often, but they, they said in their opinion page last, last week, it's a false choice between, you know, Asia and Europe and the Middle East, and it's like, it's like well, wait a minute. The, the same page pr pr uh, put out something by uh, Glenn Hubbard, who was Bush's, President Bush's, uh, I think, council He was on the press. train with me yesterday. Oh, okay. Minnesota. Well, That's I don't know him personally, but he, he wrote a very important piece last year saying that we need to def increase defense spending, but we could not do so either by raising taxes um, or by borrowing more. Because of the, and, and again, I'm, I'm not an economist, but I'm saying I think what, and I think politically, and I would, would you know, with some presumption given there's a member of Congress here, but my sense is a lot of the un, unhappiness, including among some of the new right populist members on the Republican Party, is spending is way out of control. And that's, I think that's a reasonable point. And a lot of the chaos, quote unquote, that's happening is people saying, look, if we continue in this direction, we're just pouring tons of money in the current sort of broken system. So let's be more intentional in our foreign policy. Let's be more intentional in how we spend money and so we can get ourselves back on track. But this notion that we can just like double defense spending to be 6 7% of GDP, I see zero evidence in this country 
that people are interested in doubling defense spending like that, especially when they look at the Defense Department and they say, I'm spending a trillion dollars and they can't produce artillery shells. Meanwhile, we mock the North Koreans. The North Koreans can produce artillery shells. They have a million people slaved, essentially, enslaved, working in artillery factories. But, I mean, who are we to criticize when we blow all this money on this defense structure that basically doesn't do a good job at efficiently producing results. You're also going to, I agree with a lot of that, you're also going to have a situation, I'm going to be voting for the supplemental that the president's going to bring to Congress, uh, which is to stand with Ukraine and stand with Israel in their self-defense. But you're going to have, I guarantee you, at my town halls, people will come up and say, you've just spent uh, $100 billion or so uh, on supporting uh, our allies what are we doing back home on building our industry back home? And with $100 billion, that's more than the entire CHIPS Act. You could probably have a steel act. You could have an aluminum act. So I do think that there, the question is, why is some of our spending not geared towards explicitly the working and middle class in places exactly. that have been hollowed out? You go to, I mean, I'm sure many of you have been there. Go to Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Go to Downriver, Michigan. Go to Warren, Ohio. And for 40 years, they, they haven't had much economic opportunity. And I do think we have an obligation, Democrats and Republicans, to figure out what we're going to do in those places and not everyone there is going to go become an IT tech coder. You're describing, I mean, we are not ever going to, to completely reverse globalization, but we're certainly comfortable reining it in to some extent. I want to just shift gears quickly. Are you um, in favor of this nearshoring? initiative about in Latin America. It's fascinating to me. They're our friends. They're in the same time zone. They all want to come here, so we have a... Do you believe... We, is our southern border secure, Ro, or you want... Is it, well, we need to do more to secure it. I, mean, I, I just I, wonder, because I, I hear that all the time, that it is from, I, I, I from some of your colleagues. But, okay, let's just, let's just admit in a bipartisan way that we could do more. Uh, at the southern Absolutely. Border. I mean, I don't think anyone can look at it and not say Well, that if we were, does it make sense to nearshore and, with our friends in Latin America and, and actually, you know the bill I'm talking about. Would you vote for that? I, I'd strongly consider it. I mean, obviously I want as much in the United States, but to the extent that we can have uh, more uh, of, of the industry in Mexico or in Latin America instead of China or Vietnam or Malaysia, and to the extent that that helps the economic development of those countries, uh, that's a good, good thing. I don't think that's enough to solve the immediate crisis on, on the border. And, you know, I, I don't think we're going to solve that here. But just the, a lot of times politicians, they say, okay, let's have long-term economic growth. Yeah, okay, if I could wave a wand and have political stability and long-term economic growth in those countries, that would be the solution. But what about right now? We do need some compromise with border security and the processing of immigration, which has eluded this Congress for the past 35 right. years. Bridge, when we were talking about things we were going to touch on, one of, one of the uh, individuals with the foundation told me, we like, since it's a grand strategy, we like to go out 10, 15, 20 years to talk about where we're going to be. And I was like, wow, it's really hard, uh, I, I think. But they, they were serious, and it is grand strategy. So what... Who will be? Will India be our trading partner, a bigger trading partner with billions of, of people and a vibrant economy? If, if they stay, if they can walk that line and stay a, a, a democracy, a Western-style democracy. Will they replace China, in your view, down, down the, or could they? Um, well, I think on the sort of on the globalization note, I don't think you're going to see a full reversal of globalization, but you're going to see, I mean, in a sense, what we're seeing is that geopolitics is going to be upstream of economics on key things, not in every respect. But, you know, you're not going to trade too extensively on, on, on crucial things with a country that is actively preparing to, to, to start a war with you, right? I mean, that's sort of common sense, but we lost the thread on that. I mean, I was struck, actually, it was, I mean, it's not a situation to make light of. But, um, you know, Thomas Friedman, the, the infamous, I think now, you know, countries with McDonald's never fight each other. Well, the McDonald's in Israel was, it was uh, you know, releasing statements in favor of the IDF. And the McDonald's in Oman was releasing statements in favor of Hamas or, or, or Gaza. And so I think that tells us, okay, that, that idea has been pretty substantially laid, laid to rest. I think what you'll see is, you know, again, to go back to this kind of geoeconomic spheres, you'll see, you'll see a, a kind of bifurcation, not a hard bifurcation is my sense, 
this is all dependent on us having, uh, you know, succeeding in our goal and creating a, st a reasonably sufficient, stable and balance of power in Asia. But you'll see, um, you know, a China-oriented world. I mean, you can see it obviously with places like Russia and Iran, North Korea, more strictly aligned. And on our side, you know, you know the United States, Japan, uh, hopefully Taiwan, South Korea, you know, to some extent Europe uh, and, and India. Um, and then I think you'll see a lot of overlap, especially countries like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, the Latin American countries trying to play both sides. And even our, we and ourselves and our allies still trading with China and, and so forth. I think in that context, look, if, if India hopefully continues to grow as it has been growing, um, you know, it'll become more and more uh, an important partner. And I mean, there, I hear more and more optimism about India's growth prospects. I think the last 25 years, you know, if you go back and you look at the projections about India overtaking China, you know, in the 2000s, they didn't age out very well. But I mean, there's an, obviously a very large population, an increasingly educated population. The Indian government, you know, depending on what you say, and I, I think their foreign policy and defense policy are excellent. But on the economic side, I'm not as, I'm not as expert. But if they can resolve some of maybe the structural inhibitions to growth, that should be, that should be positive. Um, but I, I, you know, I mean, I think China and the United States will remain in power terms, barring some you know, really sharp shifts, the two primary actors. The basic way I think about it is the world's going to be largely bipolar in the coming generation, you know, with multipolar features, India being, you know, Japan being the kind of bigger second tier players, but India and China are going to be the big poles because of their economic heft, ultimately. And, Ro, you're... You were talking about the hollowing out that, that, that we've seen. I think you were blaming, were you blaming me and the boomers for, for, for not, uh, I mean, you think the millennials are, are showing us, leading by example, living in their parents' basement? I mean, is that really what you, you, do you think that's what we? You know, there is a Gen X that yeah. just gets, yeah, just gets. Uh, they're, they're coming around. I, I think uh, Gen X. I think my dog. Kept. Blake, are you Gen I think you're Gen X, aren't you? Oh, sorry. Oh, you're Z. That's what I mean. Yeah, Z, Z, Z. That's a Brad Pitt zombie movie. Um, so my, I guess my question is, you, you, I think, see a domestic renaissance at the expense of maybe globalization. Do you want to do it that way? Is that possible to do it that way? And are you pro, since we're talking about protectionism, doesn't, aren't you seeing a world in the future to address some of your concerns that, that means we're going to be protectionists and, and making everything here? Well, let's see how, you know, what was the hope of globalization? They were, the hope of the globalization was that countries like China would uh, make sure that they didn't have the poverty that they did, that people would grow to the middle class and that they would embrace liberal democracy and that you would have mul cohesive multiracial, multicultural democracy here and engaging with democracies around the world. It just didn't work out, right? I mean, they had extraordinary economic growth. It's not, it's not that all of globalization is bad. The fact that there are, you know, hundreds of millions of people in China or India that aren't in abject poverty is objectively a good thing if you believe in the dignity of human beings. But it came, the globalization unchecked came at a huge cost. It came at the cost of Brexit in Britain. It came at the cost of in my view, anti-immigrant sentiment in Europe, it came at the cost of a very polarized politics in the United States. And we're no closer, it's not like we have better relations today with China or uh, those countries. So we need to, at the very least, rebalance globalization to make sure that countries don't lose their self-reliance, that we don't forfeit entire sectors of the economy, that we care about geography and pay attention to what's going on uh, not just in New York or Silicon Valley, but in the rest of the country. To me, and I've said this publicly, I mean, people don't like it. I mean, the Trump election of 16 should have been a wake-up call. You think Tim Cook was thinking in my district what's happening in Youngstown, Ohio, when he was flying around? I mean, I love Tim Cook, but that was, people were oblivious. And whatever, you know, I obviously opposed Trump. I voted for his impeachment, but it should have woken us up that something is not right in this country. And until we address that and rebalance globalization, we have no hope of trying to bring this country together. Bridge, we talked um, before that, and I said, what do you think President Nixon, how would he view China? I mean, that his, one of his lasting legacies, obviously, is, is, is opening China. And you said he, had, he did weigh in on that to some extent before. Yeah, he that. did. And I, I mean, just if I could comment on what the congressman said, sure. and obviously I have a different view on the uh, political 
issues and personalities and so forth. But I, I would just laud that, that spirit, which is, I mean, I, I think especially in democracy, and I'm not elected member of Congress or anything, but it seems to me the democratic spirit is to hear and internalize this kind of, you know, enduring thing. I mean, like, for instance, just to take the Ukraine aid, I mean, I have my own views on it, but clearly, I mean, what you said about the people in your district, that's, I hear that a lot from other Republican members as well. Okay, so is that just something to be marginalized and eliminated and treated as some kind of, you know, anathema? Or is that something to be engaged with? Like, if I were trying to make the case for sustained Ukraine aid, I personally do believe that we should support Ukraine at a, at a lower level, consistent with prioritizing China and, uh, and our closer ally, uh, closest ally, or closer ally Israel. But it seems like there, there is a there is a sort of a, a, an enduring and significant input that's coming from the popular from the populace that should be reckoned with somehow. And that's something. And in the same way with deglobalization, not to say that everything is materialism and it's just about money, but people feel and the fact you know that people are still supporting. Um, not only President Trump, but can other candidates in the Republican primary who do not want to go back to the sort of, you know, neoclassical economics and dereg deregulate everything. I mean, that suggests to me, I mean, that if we're going to be a successful country in the future from an internal point of view, but also from our ability to project power and confidence and have economic growth, those things need to be, need to be reckoned with. And I, so I just, I mean, I commend that, that spirit, uh, Congressman, not that you need to hear it from me. I mean, on, on the question of China, um, you know, my view basically is that uh, the opening to China made a great deal of sense at the time because it was a way to divide the communist bloc or exploit, uh, more, more appropriately, a division that already existed in the communist bloc. And so President, President Nixon in particular, whose idea it was, and Henry Kissinger, I believe, admitted that last year in the, in the conference here, he wrote about in his, his famous 1967 Foreign Affairs article. Um, uh, obviously, uh, Secretary Kissinger deserves a great deal of credit for it as well. But that it, it had run its course by the end of the Cold War, because the purpose was to exploit the divide in the communist bloc to cause tr 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 trouble in particular for the Soviet Union. So with the collapse of the Soviet Union, we should have reassessed. And instead, the opening to China took on a kind of life of its own. It, it got taken over by this sort of, we're going to transform them into, into a liberal democracy and, this sort, and to some extent, you know, the China hands, to, not to personalize it. But actually, I, I was telling Joe, I, my understanding is that President Nixon, before he died in 1994, had actually talked about or written even about reassessing it as people like Ed Lutvak had recommended to say, look, there's a new geopolitical context. And I'm not saying that, um, uh, you know, we needed to, do, I mean, I think, I think the vote in the Senate for um, most favored nation status for China was something like 100 to zero or the permanent normal trade. I mean, it was, it was overwhelming. So it's like, it's a, bit of, it's a bit of, you know, it's pretty strong Monday morning quarterbacking to say that, that we were completely stupid not to see that. I think it was a reasonable approach in the 1990s to say we're going to try this out. And if you go back and you read Clyde Prestowitz's book, and Clyde, people like him, and Michael Lind, you know, Bob Lighthizer deserve a lot of credit for being right when, when I think all the, most of the rest of us were off about this. But, you know, the Clinton administration had committed to holding China to account, and that didn't happen. So to me, the question is, when did you get off the China train in terms of this, you know, pursuing this policy? Where, well, we're hoping they're going to change, and if they don't change, we're still going to outcompete them. And, you know, at some point in the 2000s or early 2010s, it should have become more apparent, certainly by the mid-2010s, very apparent that things were not going in a healthy direction and we need to fundamentally reassess. But President Nixon, as a great geopolitician, uh, was, was very prescient on that issue. It's a difficult thing, I mean, to consider. It's hard to pass up a billion and a half consumers. That's, and I, I see it every day with Disney and Nike and and Apple, and, you know, we're, we're we tell, I, I guess, China Hawks say, just be prepared to just cut everything off completely when they take Taiwan. It, it's a weird position to be in, to be basically all in, Starbucks, my own company, Comcast, we, we have a lot of operations there. It's, how do you walk that line with China? What would you, what would you tell CEOs to do right now? Well, I am not for a complete uh, severing of the economic relationship. I am for the rebalancing of the relationship. I've said this even in the context of the culture of the U.S.-India caucus. I think we have to make sure that as we develop that relationship, we don't have structural trade deficits. And it's not, to me, an unreasonable thing to say to China 
that you've got to open more of your markets towards uh, American goods that are uh, made here, not the high technology sensitive technology goods, but towards uh, things that we can export. And w you've got to stop dumping your things in the United States and we're going to be more self-reliant. And we want to get that trade deficit uh, to be lower because we're no longer going to be financing you to go give loans all over Africa and all over the world and help you build your power. That seems to me a reasonable thing. Now, I think that's for Congress to do. If you're a CEO, you have a, a duty to your shareholders. You have a duty to profit maximization. I don't think me lecturing them, I mean, they may give me platitudes, and then they'll go and do what's in their, their business interest. But it's for Congress and the administration uh, to make the rules that help us uh, redefine uh, industry here and rebalance the trade deficit. I believe that should be an explicit goal of foreign policy is lowering the trade deficit mm. with China. Bridge, there's yeah. more, there's more um, NBA fans right. in China. There's twice as many as there are right. people in the United States. And, and you, you saw when you know, it was the GM of the Houston Rockets, yeah, he, yeah. he barely said anything. And LeBron, and, I mean, right. it's important. It's an important yeah. market. That's just an example. But with your worldview, what, how, do we, how do we do this? Well, I actually think um, my worldview is more consistent with that reality. I agree with what the congressman said. It's up to the government, and we don't need full-scale decoupling. We can have a degree of exposure. This is because, and this is why I, I, some people think I'm sort of old-fashioned, but I tend to really focus on the military balance. And the reason is because economic leverage and economic sanctions, and I don't know what was said. I, I wasn't able to make it because I had another commitment. But I, I just, economic sanctions don't work very well. I mean, it's shocking how poorly they're working against Russia. Certainly, they're not just convincing Putin and the Kremlin to behave differently, but the, the Russians are actually selling above the price cap. But let alone leave Russia aside, look at Cuba, look at North Korea, look at our efforts on Iran and Iraq. Economic sanctions don't work very well. They certainly don't work to precipitate major changes in the targeted state's behavior. So that's bad in a lot of context for us, but it's also good because it, it also is true for China. Because it means, that if, it means that if we're trading with China and China one day says to the NBA, oh, we're going to cut you off, and the NBA comes and whines to the White House and Congress, you know, some members are going to say, oh, I'm sympathetic, but probably they're going to say, you know, go, go, you know, go break rocks or something. That's your problem. You took that risk. What matters is military force. If you really want to force somebody to do something they don't want to do, you, you invade their country and you put a gun in their face. And that's what, I mean, I think unwisely we did in the case of Iraq. That's what, that's what China's thinking about doing with Taiwan. What that means, though, paradoxically, is I tend to be rather dovish on economic measures. A, because I don't think they work very well, and I would rather spend that political capital on the military side. And B, we might actually even be counterproductive. I am concerned that we have a variant of the Japan 1941 scenario, and my friend Neil Ferguson, I think, has referred to this in his Bloomberg column before, um, which is that we are convincing the other side, the targeted state, in this case China, that we are, quote, unquote, trying to strangle them that is the term that Xi Jinping is using, without actually having success. So I don't, I don't think the economic sanctions are going to hold them back, but we are convincing them that we are trying to hold them down. So what I would rather do, especially in this window of vulnerability, is really focus on the military balance in the region. And I actually would throttle back. And then my, my advice to, co to co corporations would be, look, and I said this, I was on a commercial thing yesterday. I would say, look, it's up to you. You know, if you think there's nothing is going to happen and you're taking a big risk, I mean, that's on you. If you're, you don't want to be in the position of McDonald's, which was not subjected to sanctions in Russia, but people didn't want to support you know, McDonald's in Russia, it, there could be Americans dying directly, and that's going to be huge exposure for a company. But if you want to take a risk on something outside of civil military fusion or things like semiconductors, I think that's on them. If, if you're the case of the NBA, you know, but caveat emptor, and we will not bail them out. But I don't think we need, I mean, there, may, there are reasons for us to decouple on our own terms, as we've been talking about. But I don't, from a strategic perspective, I think the main thing is the military balance. All right. Ro, can you, you see that clock? I have to do this all the time. I have to do this all the time. Hit a hard break, and you've got to hit it exactly. So in closing, I'd like to, to thank Ro. Thank you, uh, Bridge. And I'd, I'd like to also thank uh, the Nixon Foundation. Uh, and just leave um, a, a, us all with a quote. Uh, that I'm sure you've all heard from President Nixon, and it was mentioned to me, Blake, by Scott, totally separately the other day in a different context, but I think it's relevant uh, today in our politics and even more broadly. The president said, always rem remember that others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them, and then you destroy yourself. And I want you to take that back. 
to Congress with, with you. Will you? And, and maybe we can, maybe that'll help. Did you remember? You want to take this with you? I, I'll try. I, th I thought you were going to you know, announce your candidacy. For the I was going to bring that up because we thought about. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking for a bipartisan speaker, Joe. A bipartisan speaker? And, and I don't need to be a member of Congress. You're right. You don't need to be a member You're of right. Congress. You're right. No. <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our panel. The Grand Strategy Summit will resume at 2.15. Once again, the Grand Strategy Summit will resume at 2.15. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to come back into the room and take your seats as we begin our fifth panel on financial diplomacy and working with developing nations. A crucial component of any 21st century grant strategy is working with developing nations. The U.S. has awarded foreign aid for decades, but such traditional transactional strategies are now being rethought and challenged, especially in light of the People's Republic of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Please welcome Washington Post columnist James Homan to moderate this discussion on financial diplomacy and working with developing nations. Mr. Homan will introduce the program participants. All right. Thanks so much for being with us. I know a long day of panels, but I think this is going to be a, a really great conversation about a really important issue. Uh, you know, we've obviously talked a lot about uh, kinetic and hard power and a lot of what's in the news today, uh, but I think this is a, a, a good broader conversation to have uh, that really gets in uh, to how the U.S. can really embody some of the values uh, that, that President Nixon did during his administration. We're joined on stage today by uh, an interesting mix. We have Matthew Johnson, who is the Principal and Director of Research at Garneau Global. Uh, and we also have Yerzan Saltbaev, who is the Director of the Institute of World Economics and Politics, who has flown in from Kazakhstan to be on today's panel. Uh, we're, uh, we're excited to have the perspective of a uh, Central Asian country uh, as we sort of think through and talk about what role uh, the U.S. can play in uh, economic development. So let's just start by uh, talking about the Belt and Road Initiative. I know that's top of mind for so many people when we consider sort of the future uh, of uh, U.S.-China economic competition. Uh, and uh, you know, we had uh, Kazakhstan's president, Tokayev, meet this week in Beijing with uh, Chinese President Xi on Tuesday. It was a Belt and Road Forum. Uh, Xi said that uh, China is willing to increase agricultural exports from Kazakhstan and widen the scale of railway, railway freight and the use of transportation routes across the Caspian Sea. And then also this week, we saw China's state oil company sign a memorandum of understanding with Kazakhstan's national oil and gas company to conduct joint geological research and expand cooperation on existing oil fields. You're in this unique position uh, where you're sort of, um, you know, it obviously is a post-Soviet state with rich natural resources, including oil, but it's also the ninth largest country in the world by size, and it's right in the geographical central center of Eurasia. Uh, in, I think Kazakhstan, if I'm not mistaken, shares one of the largest land borders with both Russia and China. How do uh, how does your country maneuver in these sort of dark waters of geopolitics? Um, well, thank you very much indeed, first for inviting us to this conference. I mean, this is the first time that the foundation of Mr. Nazarbayev is participating in the in Nixon Forum. Um, um, uh, regarding to your question uh, of BRI, uh, it's important to remind the, our audience that the BRI was actually initiated in 2013 in Kazakhstan. It was at Nazarbayev University in our capital, Astana. So it was not only symbolical, but it's also the sign that what role China uh, devotes to, to Kazakhstan as actually the central or element or central part of this land corridor through China to Europe. Mm. Because uh, Kazakhstan, indeed, is uh, one of the vastest uh, country um, in the world. It's in top 10 countries uh, by territory, uh, and it's bordering with Russia, with China, with Central Asian republics. Uh, through Caspian Sea, we have the exit route to Iran, to South Caucasus. So we're quite diverse in terms yeah. of our geography. It's not like Mongolia, which is locked between <laughs> Russia and China. So we have much more options. And uh, for China, especially after they realized that uh, the relations with the United States will change with, with time, it was the beginning of Xi's uh, tenure, the first uh, uh, of his um, um, five years. Uh, so they decided that to uh, manage this competition and to hedge the risks that existed, especially with maritime routes through like uh, uh, Pacific, etc., which is 
controlled uh, largely by Western powers, uh, by U.S. Navy. So they decided to, to build roads through the Eurasia, through the land mass of Eurasia, where the uh, United States has no like, um, uh, instruments really to block any of these uh, 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 transportation roads. So in 2013, they initiated it, and now it's almost 10 years since uh, inception of this uh, concept of uh, belt uh, and road. Um, it was formerly one belt and road, now it's just belt and road. I don't know the difference because in China it's still Ida Ilu, so <laughs> it's no difference. But um, uh, now um, I think that China has done a lot in terms of really uh, concrete investments in, in Central Asia and in the Kazakhstan. They have a big project of 52 investment projects, which was launched in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 2017. Uh, with the overall like volume of investments of about twenty one twenty seven billion, not all of them are uh, successfully implemented, but uh, still they 're very stubborn in terms of how to to make them uh, effective because some projects are uh, uh, reorganized or uh, reshaped but uh, they are trying their best. Uh, so uh, the second big effort was this year when this C5 plus China forum was held in Xi'an, and the uh, ancient uh, Tang Dynasty capital of China. It was very uh, like um, uh, theatrical with all this, you know, interesting stuff of uh, people in, in uh, ancient closings and all these festivities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the 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 main thing was they w were invested to Central Asia 50 billion. Uh, USD, uh, out of which about like 22 billion invested to Kazakhstan. Uh, it's all, they also promised to to give just for like um, for free, like three and a half billion uh, to Central Asian countries just to support like their uh, development. Uh, if you compare it with, uh, I'm sorry, with uh, with some figures from the U.S. side, for example, C5 plus one meeting. Uh, in Astana uh, at the beginning of this year, um, uh, the uh, State Secretary Blinken, he proposed only 25 million M uh, for five countries of Central Asia. So, I mean, the big mansion building in the outskirts of Almaty would be like about 20 million. So it, it's not that big number. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, Chinese are quite concrete and uh, very um, consistent in, in, in their efforts to, to make Central Asia part of this greater project of uh, Belt and Road uh, China-centric Eurasia. We'll, we'll keep talking about that. Let's bring Matt into the conversation. If you can talk sort of uh, at a broader strategic level about, uh, I don't know if we're going to call it one belt and road or belt and road, uh, whether, uh, you know, it obviously does seem to be having a real impact in Central Asia, but elsewhere. Sure. Um, so I think uh, the main um, line on the belt and road, I mean, with uh, the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road's formal launch as the Belt and Road. There's been a lot of media attention on this project and what it means. And the consensus, if you look out in the media, the consensus is basically that this is China's global infrastructure investment project. And so people will point to the $1 trillion uh, that China has invested or committed to uh, since 2005, um, really, so even before the Belt and Road. But still a uh, very significant investment. Um, they'll point to the fact that some 60 to 66 percent of that is uh, are, or uh, has been spent on transportation and energy. Um, and they'll point to the fact that, you know, China's expanding investment into new sort of quasi-infrastructure related uh, areas like uh, digital data centers, um, you know, green technologies, uh, ports, other sort of what, what Xi Jinping calls, um, you know, hard, hard connective uh, projects. So I'm primarily a researcher. I spend a lot of time in Chinese language sources, and my, my perspective is a little bit different. Um, I think, one, if you go out and look even at the Chinese language transcript that is more sort of public facing on what the Belt and Road Initiative is meant to be. And yes, it's, it's still the one belt, one road. Um, but you know, the, the fact that it has a different name externally is itself kind of an interesting fact. Um, and, and says something about you know, the sort of image uh, management that's at work here. What, what the Belt and Road is supposed to be about is 
connectivity, not infrastructure per se. It's really about bringing other countries outside of China more sort of into China's orbit uh, in a variety of spheres. One is policy. So there's a sort of policy coordination component to the Belt and Road. There's a transport and infrastructure component to the Belt and Road. There's a trade component, obviously, to the Belt and Road. There's a monetary aspect <clears throat> to the Belt and Road. And you know, China hasn't necessarily made great strides on internationalization of the renminbi, but they have developed a kind of alternative uh, financial architecture in SIPs and uh, the, the ECNY that is, is a system you know, that, that could potentially pose um, an alternative or you know, uh, challenges to uh, the, the current financial system, dominant financial system, um, basically uh, created by the United States further, further down the road. I mean, so, how, we, yep. We're 10 years in. You mentioned the media coverage. I mean, is it, is it worse than we think? Is it not as bad as we think? I mean, the Washington feeling is that Belt and Road is a very scary challenge to uh, American power. Sure. So the, the, the way that Xi Jinping himself describes it to uh, stakeholders inside of China, experts and government officials, is even broader than what I've just laid out. So this is the sort of less official perspective, but more sort of from the top where it fits into China's grand strategy. And it's about manufacturing. It's about making sure that other countries' economies are sort of balanced with China's in ways that facilitate China's economic growth. It's about security. It's about enhancing China's ability to protect overseas interests outside of China. It's about creating early warning systems so that China is aware of, uh, you know, threats, um, so, that, so that Beijing is aware of threats abroad. And it's about positioning Chinese enterprises around the world to, you know, serve a range of functions, not just economic and not just, you know, sort of constructive, so to speak, but um, actually, you know, acting as uh, uh, entities that facilitate all of the other stuff that I've just been talking about, the policy coordination, the, inform the, the movement of information, of, of data uh, from areas outside of China into China. So it is still connected, but it's, it's extremely strategic. It's not just economic. It's not just infrastructure focused. And even though, you know, I think right now the, the, the idea uh, that's being floated is that, you know, this, this 10th anniversary has kind of fallen flat. You know, you read about how Belt and Road investments have, have failed, um, that you know, some $60 billion went to Venezuela and basically uh, nothing was built. Um, but there, there, there are harder, more concrete legacies that I think are worth taking into account here, even 10 years in. One is the fact that Russia and China, and Russia has been one of the largest recipients of, of Chinese official aid during this same period, are far more integrated and far more strategically coordinated than they ever than, than they have been, you know, basically since the early 1950s. Um, it's it's got legacies in terms of uh, data and digital infrastructure, including financial infrastructure, as I've just described. And it's had, I would say, legacies and you know, like real hard security relevant legacies in terms of you know the spread of Chinese naval ports outside of China, in Cambodia. Uh, in Djibouti on, on, on the Horn of Africa and elsewhere. So it's, it's moving and it's got many dimensions beyond infrastructure. And that really is why we're talking about it today. I mean, that's the nature of the strategic For challenge. Sure. And I'm really glad you mentioned the Russia-China tie-in because obviously one of President Nixon's great achievements was driving the wedge between Russia and China. You know, on, on Kazakhstan specifically, uh, obviously, I think if you were talking to Vladimir Putin, he would say that Kazakhstan is in Russia's sphere of influence, which is probably not what a lot of people in Kazakhstan would, would think or want to acknowledge. Uh, how I think there is a Washington tendency to think that everything is always about us, you know, that the Belt and Road is entirely about countering U.S. influence. Uh, but if you could speak to what Matt was just talking about, to what degree is, is Belt and Road about countering sort of Russian influence, if, if at all, in Kazakhstan? 
Well, I think from the very beginning, Belt and Road was not directed against any uh, country. So it was purely like an economic project which was directed to, um, to invest uh, over capacity of uh, Chinese industrial uh, might and uh, financial might to uh, the neighboring countries. And then it became larger and larger now and it includes even Latin America and, uh, and most of Africa. Uh, so it was not definitely directed against Russia, I think. Uh, in my view... Um, the thing that uh, make it uh, looks like it's uh, against uh, Russia is because of the consequences of Ukraine war. Because mm -hmm. Russia is becoming more isolated, and many uh, its neighbors, like Central Asian countries like Kazakhstan, uh, we're um, forced to uh, to make hard choices I mean, about, for example, transportational routes, uh, how to bypass this war-torn region of Ukraine, because uh, most of the trade of Kazakhstan with, uh, is actually with the European Union. It's about like 40 percent of our export with, is with the European Union. So for us, it was hard to find a, a alternative ways. So, and China obviously sees this opportunity as a, uh, for, for them to, to make more investments in infrastructure, to, to make Kazakhstan uh, believe that uh, it, it is in our interest to, to work closer with BRI so that we can have a stable infrastructural projects that go through Kazakhstan, that bypass all these problematic regions and uh, linked us with, not only with China, but with Europe too. So, uh, so it's um, uh, for for Kazakhstan, it's a win-win situation. So we we take infrastructure uh, and we uh, gain more uh, profits from trading with our partners. Uh, but Russia, indeed, in this situation, becoming even more isolated because it's actually not only cut it off from uh, from the Europe. Uh, but it's also uh, becoming less and less important for Central Asian countries like Kazakhstan. But still, uh, Kazakhstan and Central Asia are part of the uh, several like uh, economic and political projects of Russia, for example, the Russian Economic Union, which Kazakhstan is uh, uh, maybe the main part, especially after, uh, after the Ukraine war, so mm -hmm. there is no possibility, at least in the some foreseeable future, that Ukraine would ever be the ally of Russia. So Kazakhstan is still the biggest post of its country, mm -hmm. which is in a Russian neighborhood and which is, uh, have friendly relations with Moscow. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, uh, also important dimension is the military dimension because actually uh, Russia has its military bases in Kyrgyzstan, uh, air base in Kant, uh, which it uh, plans to increase. I mean, the number of, um, uh, of, of airplanes there. Uh, they also have a big base in Tajikistan, which is their uh, thousand-most uh, Soviet Republic bordering with Afghanistan, and they're trying to, uh, uh, to invest in, in an infrastructure and in military infrastructure in that country too. Uh, just yesterday it was announced that they will build a new uh, outpost in, in southern Tajikistan. Uh, so I, I think this, uh, with this military component, uh, uh, Central Asia is still uh, very much dependent on, on Russian support and r Russian guarantees, security guarantees. So uh, this will help Russia to withstand uh, the economic pressure from China. Mm -hmm. Matt, uh, you've done a lot of work in Estonia and some, uh, you know, I think have some understanding of the, the Soviet, uh, the post-Soviet republics. Uh, to what extent is China trying to project financial diplomacy, financial influence in some of those countries? I know you we've spent a lot of time in Estonia, but you understand some of the other countries on the board. Sure. So we, we were just chatting about uh, my experiences as a, as a Fulbright specialist um, in Tallinn, uh, working with um, a think tank there to basically you know build research capacity uh, related to uh, China in particular, which is just, I think, given the pace of China's expansion, one of the major issues that a lot of countries, you know, outside of the United States especially face, but, you know, really uh, even states within the United States face, you could argue, is uh, lack of, um, lack of, you know, deep analytic ability focused on all the sort of new entities that are connected to and coming in from China uh, via trade and financial, uh, technological, educational partnerships, et cetera. So when I was in Estonia, it was a very interesting experience. The, the, China present wasn't, the China presence wasn't huge, and the volume of trade is not huge either. But at the same time, they're, they're very, what Chinese companies have been pretty successful at is getting into strategically important 
sectors of the economy uh, you know, through a combination of the quality of the technology that they produce and then also price. And so, you know, again, for budget-constrained governments, and this is obviously a debate that's, you know, raging across capitals, across medias, et cetera, you know, how, how far can we trust Chinese technology, or depending on your viewpoint, American technology, other technology? Well, state-subsidized Chinese technology. Yeah, well, so that, that's, that's kind of a tell, right, is, 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 is the state-subsidy part. So um, it, it was just interesting getting to know the landscape of a country that had experience under the Soviet Union and it was now dealing, you know, with another large centrally coordinated actor uh, that, you know, clearly had regional and, and does have regional strategic ambitions. Um, and so, you know, not everything is under the BRI. That's, that's a point that people who are really sort of hyper-focused on the BRI <clears throat> would often make. But uh, China engages in a lot of um, what the aid data program at William & Mary University calls BRI-like activity, which is just basically, you know, providing technology, providing uh, low-cost project uh, bids, um, usually high-cost funding, as, as we're now learning um, in terms of terms. But, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a capacity that China has developed and has gotten very good at in the past <clears throat> 10 years. But again, as I, as I said at the very beginning, the issue is that a lot of countries are dealing with this influx don't have the research and analytic capabilities to actually understand the degree of coordination and what you know the actual strategic goals <clears throat> of these companies may be uh, you know just because that's not where their educational systems which are often resource constrained are allocating uh, resources right so that, that to me is a very interesting problem about how to you know sort of see the BRI for what it is because it's got a very active, very externally facing or external facing propaganda component to it. China will tell you what the BRI is. Companies will tell you what their objectives in the region are. They won't talk about, you know, the other discussions that they're having back in Beijing, uh, you know, about sort of how to, how to strategically posture themselves and deploy resources in order to achieve even deeper strategic gains, um, you know, through uh, their presence in those countries. Yerzan, uh, you know, the, uh, on that point, uh, you mentioned earlier kind of the Tony Blinken shows up and offers something in the millions, China shows up, offers something in the billions, and you use the word concrete. Uh, what concretely can the United States do to compete with uh, the BRI and these other initiatives where you know, the Chinese technology is state subsidized to make it cheaper, uh, and maybe they offer you know financing that uh, we're not in a position to do. But what, what concretely should the U.S. be doing to compete? Uh, well, actually, the United States has a great leverage in terms of uh, its allies. I mean, it's not only the United States; it's also Europe, it's also Japan, it's also South Korea, and now increasingly India. So all these countries, all these uh, unions are interested in like um, getting resources from Central Asia or getting access to Central Asia as a region. Uh, so, um, for example, European Union, they proposed um, a project of Global Gateway, which is about like 300 billion euros. So, but so far, it's mostly about like uh, talking. It's not something really concrete. But if you can uh, really coordinate efforts from uh, different actors uh, like EU, uh, Japan, South Korea, India, vis-a-vis uh, -vis region, because all of these uh, forces, they have uh, these, the same formats, C5 plus one formats of uh, dealing with, uh, with Central Asia. Plus, by the way, Gulf states. Uh, Gulf states are still under the U.S. security guarantees, and you can uh, really ask them uh, more or less uh, convincingly to, to be more helpful in terms of like more investments uh, in, in, in certain projects. Uh, so I think that there are four like uh, dimensions of where uh, these projects could uh, really develop. It's uh, first, it's a uh, hard infrastructure, especially uh, a 5G infrastructure, because uh, 5G is like the main driving force in, um, behind the fourth industrial revolution, and it's a main factor of developing in the world today. So Kazakhstan is also trying to um, um, uh, to to implement 5G at least in main like uh, demographical centers like Almaty, Astana, 
So we, uh, we're changing from 4G to 5G. So mainly it's about Huawei right now, but we have examples, for example, in uh, Turkestan, which is a uh, uh, ancient city, but actually it's totally rebuilt right now. It's a brand new city in the south part of our country. It's a new regional center, which is operates uh, um, uh, Ericsson uh, as a main like um, uh, provider of 5G. So it's, it's a very good example of how actually uh, uh, US and SLS can provide uh, a viable alternative, uh, even in digital technology. The second one is, I think, it, it with agriculture, because we have a water scarcity problems. We have a problem with inefficient technologies. And at the same time, we have a very vast uh, number of uh, arable lands uh, which are not used. Uh, for example, we have about like 1 million hectares of unused lands. So it's a very big chunk of land, maybe the biggest in the world, which is not used. And uh, China is very interested in uh, doing uh, business with us, uh, c keeping in mind that we have uh, a lot of resources. So uh, we can, the same way we can work with uh, Europeans or with Japanese or with U.S. companies uh, to, uh, to use these fertile lands more effectively. And we can produce a lot of wheat. Uh, for example, uh, by the maximum number of wheat that we produce, about like 30 million tons per year, uh, now it's dropped to 16 million which shows you that uh, really the technological uh, development is really um, a key factor here uh, and uh, more like uh, efficient use of water resources. Uh, so we can produce much more. And uh, n right now you see that after U Ukraine war, Ukraine really losing a lot of its uh, uh, wheat export. And for many years, I think, to, to come, there will be really hard problems with cultivating these lands because they are minefields, etc especially in the Kherson region, the Zaporizhia region in the south, where the main production of wheat. Uh, so Kazakhstan could be a substitute in, in this regard for the world's uh, food security, especially for Africa, for Afghanistan. Right now, we the biggest uh, provider to Afghanistan of wheat. So it's uh, Afghanistan uh, imports about like 600 tons, 600,000 tons uh, from, from Kazakhstan. Uh, so I think that's uh, the second uh, dimension. The, the third one will be, I think, that uh, f financial uh, uh, services and uh, providing financial uh, services for, for our banks, for our financial system. Uh, more Western banks, more financial institutions could participate in, in a Kazakhstan market. Right now, EBRD is the main, uh, the main investor. It's about like 10 billion portfolio of projects in Kazakhstan, but uh, there could be many more. Uh, and, and the last but not least, it, it's um, rare earth minerals because uh, it's a main factor for the uh, green energy uh, transfer in the world. Uh, and Kazakhstan, by some estimates, is uh, the, uh, one of the b biggest reserves in, in terms of rare earth minerals, especially uh, if you're talking about lithium, because right now, German company Bergbau, they invested about 700 million in one of the um, uh, new projects in eastern Kazakhstan, lithium projects. And uh, by the estimates, we have much more uh, uh, of and um, uh, unpacked reserves of uh, different kind of uh, REM, uh, rare earth minerals. Uh, by estimates, World Bank, it's 46 trillion of uh, uh, reserves of different kind of uh, minerals in Kazakhstan, because uh, about like 5,000 places are not uh, really um, uh, discovered or, uh, how to say it, uh, the, you know, researched uh, well enough. Uh, but uh, the potential is uh, quite huge. That's a, a, a very uh, helpful rundown uh, of those four areas. I would love to change gears a little bit. Uh, we're about halfway through because we're lucky to have one of the sort of the foremost experts on digital currencies. Uh, Matt, you've done a lot of work. You've worked uh, over the last couple of years with the Hoover Institution on uh, studying digital currencies. In, in particular, this is one of the areas where China's being especially aggressive in a way that I think a lot of Americans don't understand, contra the Belt and Road Initiative. There, you know, the, uh, China has been developing this um, basically central bank digital currency. Uh, can you explain for those of us who haven't been to China uh, recently just how much it has seeped into their consumer culture, but also that it's being used in Thailand and Hong Kong? And what, what should we make of this uh, central bank digital currency, and then from there we'll pivot in and talk about is it time to have some kind of digital dollar, uh, because I think that that's a, a question a lot of people are asking. So the, the, the digital dollar question is uh, a tough one because, uh, you know, the, the, I think one perception of digital currencies is that they can 
uh, function basically is surveillance money. They can you know, track uh, every transaction across an entire economy. And that's basically one of the ways in which the People's Bank of China does seem to envision use of the digital B within China's borders. It's not the only uh, use, but it is um, one of the key uses is to be able to track where money goes. And they've, as they've been building up this project, uh, you know, which is basically just to make money digital uh, so that you, you wouldn't have physical cash. Or, or so it's, would, it's more a network than a currency. It's, it's, it's more of a network than a currency. It's, it's changing the rate, and, and this is where it intersects with the BRI. It's changing the rails that financial transactions, including individual consumer transactions, move on so that the rails that they're running on are, you know, uh, in the context of China, increasingly visible from the perspective of the PBOC. And then outside of China, uh, the goal is to create new exchange mechanisms so that central banks uh, can interact with each other, um, essentially outside of existing financial institutions. So it's, it's doing two things at the same time. It's, it's piloting a new technology, but it's also attempting to move financial infrastructure in a more multipolar direction that goes hand in hand with China's multipolar, ultimately uh, you know, more globally dominant geopolitical objectives. So basically, you know, the, the, the fear inside of China, and you can read this in white papers and interviews from Chinese think tank uh, uh, thinkers, um, is that the U.S., uh, through sanctions, has a kind of stranglehold on China. It's certainly not the, f the case that China's the first state to ever say this, but the, there's, there's confidence that there's a technological, or at least there's um, hope that there's a technological <clears throat> solution to sanctions, and that China will be able to move money around sanctions more easily in the future if, if required to do so. They've, they've got an alternative messaging system, SIPS, uh, you know, that, that is meant to be an alternative to SWIFT. Russia and Turkey have both actually <clears throat> used SIPS to circumvent sanctions in the past. So China's financial and digital efforts are, again, very much geostrategic to go along with all of its other efforts. With respect to the use of the ECNY within China's borders, frankly, it's, it's very hard to say. There's, there's so much propaganda around this technology now that it's sort of already one of China's great achievements, but actual usage is pretty hard to confirm. It seems, it seems more in, in the um, pilot phase, basically. You know, when you talk about their vision for a multipolar uh, system, I mean, what you're really talking about is challenging the dollar as the world's reserve currency, which is something that I think is very top of mind for Washington policymakers. Certainly, you know, it's a priority for Jay Powell at the Fed. To, to counter that, uh, we've seen uh, over the last year and a half, uh, you know, you talked about SWIFT, uh, kind of a, a, an effort by our adversaries and people who may become our adversaries to, uh, to at least talk or threaten uh, to no longer denominate in dollars or to trade in dollars. And I'll, you know, believe it when I see it. <laughs> Uh, but, um, you know, obviously we've seen other countries like El Salvador experiment with crypto. That has been a complete disaster for them. Um, you know, I, I guess how can the U.S. government, in your view, uh, advocate for basically, you know, China, China says you're right that it's surveillance. I completely agree with that. China says it's about cracking down on money laundering, et cetera. Um, how, how can the U.S. government advocate for democratic norms of privacy, accountability, transparency, security, and basically trying to set global standards for these digital currencies? Is, is there something that the U.S. should be doing that we are currently not? Yeah, so the, the last part of, the, the last part of that, that question, I think, is, is really a good place to begin um, and, and gets back to a point that I was making earlier, which is it's hard for the U.S. or any country to you know, tell a modernizing, developing country, you have to use our technology. 
you can't use this you know, sort of cheaper, easily available technology that another country is willing to provide for you. Um, but what you can do, and this, this draws on some experience that I've had you know, abroad, uh, is you can increase, exactly as you said, you can increase the, the transparency uh, through, I think, empowerment of journalists, um, empowerment of, again, you, you, you've got to develop tools for being able to sort of understand how this stuff works, how it's supposed to uh, work, and you have to you know, house that knowledge in institutions that can communicate with government, can communicate with the press, can communicate with publics, and you've got to promote openness abroad. I think obviously there's, there's a role for embassies to play here as well in terms of raising public awareness on you know, any number of issues around technology, China, uh, et cetera. Uh, you know, those, those folks work hard. Uh, those embassies are, are you know, I think, given the scope of the challenge that we're talking about, often understaffed or under-resourced. Um, but you know, being able to, to infuse more openness into the environment so that there's more of a sense of choice and so that journalists who are often critical and investigative <laughs> in all the right ways. I agree. Uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, are, are um, uh, you know, really, I think, like poised to lead those sorts of yes. discussions in, in certain ways. But you, you have to put the tools in people's hands first. You yeah. can't, and you know, you have to provide protection from lawsuits and from harassment and from all of the other issues that go into, you know, getting under the skin of projects where there are stakeholders on multiple sides and, and uh, you know, but aren't necessarily for the public. And, and ultimately it does, I mean, come back to one of the secrets of our sauce, which is the rule of law. And, uh, you know, obviously there's fear about being susceptible to sanctions, but there's a, a rule of law here that, uh, that you don't see in China. Uh, years on, I, do you have any thoughts on digital currencies? Is that, um, you know, what is the perspective of, uh, from Central Asia on that push? Are you seeing any overtures, that kind of thing? I think that we're very early stages of the implementing of this kind of technology because actually CBDC in itself, I mean, it's very early technology, so it's not yet like uh, developed and uh, penetrated uh, uh, extent of Central Asia. But we have also a project of uh, digital tenge, which is our national currency, and we're also working with the same like institution with which uh, China is working this uh, Swiss bank or Swiss organization. So now, right, right now, as far as I understand, the China has partners from uh, from Thailand, from EOE, and from Hong Kong, which uh, together with them are trying to develop this CBDC. Uh, system, maybe it will be implemented uh, uh, this year. So maybe this uh, situation will will change uh, dramatically. Um, uh, so I, I think yes, indeed, it's it's uh, it's a challenge to the United States. It's a really big challenge because actually, if they can undermine this uh, financial institution that you built for like decades, like SWIFT, etc., so it's really undermines the very like foundation of your uh, strength. I um, mean, dollar is the main currency, uh, um, uh, still provides U.S. Um, you know, uh, unchecked opportunities uh, in terms of like how to uh, deal with uh, some rock states or with even b b big powers. Uh, so uh, from the point of view of Kazakhstan, obviously, uh, we, we are trying to see uh, what kind of benefits we can uh, get from this, uh, but we are very cautious, and I don't think that our government is ready to uh, implement something like this I mean, in the near future, but we are working on that too. Great. Uh, Matt, uh, you did some great research on ByteDance, and uh, you did work basically tracking the ownership structure of TikTok. You know, we're, we're talking about digital currencies, but technology is also a, a, a piece of financial diplomacy. Uh, we, from a domestic perspective, obviously worry a great deal about what TikTok is doing to our country and to our children. Uh, can you talk about your research, what it showed, just how much power the Chinese Communist Party has over TikTok? And, you know, it, it's, it's disappointing because the conversation has sort of faded here a little bit from the spring in terms of the efforts to ban the, um, the essentially spyware. Um, but if, if you could speak to, the, to, to ByteDance and TikTok. Sure. Uh, happy to. Um, I, I think... Uh, the main conclusions of that research were that ByteDance and TikTok are, when one traces the structures uh, and one looks at the patterns of behavior, they, they operate and behave 
as the same company. I think that's in the open source record, all of that information. Um, secondarily, uh, on the China side, on the, the, the ByteDance side, uh, there are party, Chinese Communist Party institutions throughout that corporate structure that make it pretty clear, and again, the behavior of the company makes it pretty clear that the party plays a significant role in shaping uh, Douyin content, and then further forensic, which is TikTok's Chinese counterpart, and then uh, further uh, forensic analysis indicates that the TikTok app itself behaves uh, in, in ways that more or less um, align with China's policies, particularly in the sense of promoting uh, pro-China um, content. Again, that's, that's, that's through study. Mm -hmm. um, the final point would be that um, ByteDance as a company has uh, worked pretty extensively with China's internal security forces and military forces, uh, both as a data provider and you know, basically to like, provide a positive image of uh, both of those uh, branches in, um, in social media. So that's the story. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, I, the, 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 the point that it makes is, and this is one that I've tried to, you know, make repeatedly when talking to people about China generally, is the idea of, you know, China as the entity that we're dealing with when looking at Beijing foreign policy, uh, you know, broader uh, sort of political ambitions and agenda is just way too fuzzy and way too diffuse. China's a one-party state. The party that rules that state is the Chinese Communist Party. It is a dictatorship it is in, its, uh, in, in, in the formation of its government. And the party is the organization <clears throat> that matters here. And so if you look, and this is based on other research, uh, you know, like quite careful research, I would say, at how China's larger tech corporates are organized, you will find party structures in all of them. And you have to then go back basically to then what the party says about data and what Xi Jinping says about data and what they say about technology and how they relate all of these things to you know, some sense of China's grand strategy to really understand what the strategic role of these companies is. The, the, the whole China thing, to be perfectly frank, is almost itself a kind of like effect of China's external propaganda apparatus. We, we talk about China, we talk about how China feels as if China has feelings. Um, you know, we, we, we don't talk about <laughs> the party and its leaders and the division between the party and the rest of the government, which is increasingly negligible, between the government and the people, um, and between overseas Chinese, you know, people of Chinese heritage versus, you know, people who are citizens of the PRC. It's, it's, a, it's a strategic communication goal of Beijing to collapse all of those distinctions. And it, it works to strategic advantage. It, it makes you know, people dealing with China confused. What are we really talking about here? Um, but you know, again, I think, like, sorry to keep coming back no, to that's, the I'm research yeah. point, but you know, it's, it's, just, it's, <laughs> it's important to really understand how all these pieces interact with each other uh, you know, from, from the perspective of what can be, uh, at least in, in my case, you know, teased out from the open source uh, record uh, you know, from, from, from the media. It's not hidden, but the, the language itself encodes it. It makes it very difficult. It's, it's such a good point. And, and you know, as a journalist, you mentioned the importance of journalists when we were talking about digital currency. China has kicked out all of the reporters from the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, so we don't have eyes on the ground. Uh, and, we, it, it, and you're absolutely right that it's the goal to sort of create that monolithic impression, and that is a propaganda win for them. And it, uh, it ultimately means less understanding and increasing uh, chance of conflict when we don't understand our adversary. Um, I want to shift gears here in the, the last 15 minutes of our conversation to talk about open markets. There's a quote from President Nixon that I really like. He, uh, in his 1992 book, Sees the Moment, uh, he talked about, uh, he said, to promote economic growth, foreign trade, not foreign aid, should be our principal instrument. Uh, this is, again, Nixon in 1992. 
Over the past 40 years, the U.S. has poured more than $400 billion in foreign aid into the underdeveloped world. The results have been meager. Foreign aid alone often only serves to prop up inefficient industries, increase industrial subsidies, and raise trade barriers. The developing countries cannot immerse themselves in the healing waters of free trade unless the industrialized world keeps its markets open to their goods. I know the last panel was about protectionism, uh, which is a big strain of thought now uh, in both of our political parties. Uh, but I, I would love to talk about the danger of closing off markets uh, in terms of the degree to which that undercuts American leverage in financial diplomacy. Here's on if you want to start in, in you, you were mentioning all the great, you know, the, all the arable land that you can develop to sell grain. There's, a, you know, a, a, so many resources. You mentioned critical minerals. But uh, it, it does feel like we're in this era where doors are closing rather than opening for trade. And uh, it, it, a lot of it is self-inflicted by the United States, whether it's pulling out of TPP or what have you. Uh, can you. Can you talk about that from your perspective? Uh, well, at, at least as far as I understand this uh, quotation from the, uh, Mr. Nixon, it's, um, it sounds to me a little bit um, outdated in terms of uh, the real um, situation on the ground today because actually for the United States to open up its market to all these developing nations would be catastrophic. Uh, I think, because um, uh, every country needs a certain level of protectionism. And um, indeed, uh, it, it works uh, very well for China. I mean, you open up your market for China, and uh, they uh, benefit a lot. And now uh, they pose like, the greatest challenge to you, as you uh, yourself admit. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, to invest smart, to invest uh, in uh, certain uh, industries, for example, in developing nations that would benefit uh, both of the parties, I mean, the U.S. and uh, local nations, so so-called win-win situations. By the way, the Chinese, they very much like this uh, word, win-win. They, uh, they always use it, um, and so it's a mutual development, a mutual success, it's a win-win situation, etc. And it works, actually. I mean, we have uh, to learn a lot from China's experience. Uh, they were quite successful, especially in the developing world. Uh, they, they, do, uh, they have a business-like uh, approach to all these investments. It's not uh, um, uh, something that they distributed like uh, for for free. Uh, so they, 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 if they invest something, that they make it uh, basically the part of the internal ecosystem. So uh, they invest in a company that hire uh, Chinese subcontractors, that hire Chinese labor, uh, gain uh, you know. Credits from the Chinese financial institutions, etc. So it's very closed uh, system. Um, um, and um, with, with, with regard to, to development countries like Kazakhstan, for us, it's important to have uh, an alternative to, to the Chinese investments in this sense, because we need uh, more options on the table. And actually, the if, uh, creation of Eurasian Economic Union in the first uh, uh, um, the place was uh, to create. Uh, um, uh, a trade zone that would be protected against the dumping uh, from the from the Chinese uh, import uh, or export, how we see it. Uh, and now, uh, as you can see from the uh, the results of the BRI uh, meeting in, in Beijing, even uh, we see from the rhetoric from the Russian side, from the Putin side, that uh, uh, Russia is not actually going to be engaged so deeply in BRI project as a part of it. They would rather see as themselves as a, uh, a separate project, I mean, the Eurasian Economic Union as a separate entity, which could, uh, I mean, cooperate with BRI, but not becoming its uh, part. So uh, there will be no fusion between BRI and uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, and I think that in the future, Kazakhstan um, uh, will have to, you know, um, to keep this very, um, uh, uh, very, very uneasy balance uh, between engaging with, uh, with China at the same time by protecting uh, its own market for, uh, from, uh, from the... Uh, from the cheap uh, import uh, from China because it will s simply could kill the our in industries. 
Uh, but uh, with regard to, uh, uh, to US, invest US investments, uh, I think that uh, we have a lot of opportunities, I mean, uh, in Kazakhstan, because US investments were uh, primarily focused on uh, oil and gas, but oil and gas era is over. So now it, there is a new chapter, I mean, green transition, uh, transition to green energy, all these metals, I mean, copper, cobalt, uh, lithium, etc. cetera. And, and all of them, uh, I mean, Kazakhstan is either in top 10 or very close to top 10. I mean, we, 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 we can really find a new ways to cooperate and uh, I think there will be enough places for everyone. I mean, uh, and, and not only in Kazakhstan, but in, in the developed world, I think uh, for, for United States, there are a lot of opportunities. It's only a question of coordinated uh, strategy. I mean, you have a lot of allies. You have uh, Europe, you have Japan, you have India on your side. So if you can uh, really coordinate all these efforts uh, perfectly. So uh, I think that, uh, yes, it, it will be very beneficial for all developing nations. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned, I'm glad it's the second time you've mentioned, you know, we talk about the U.S., but it's important to talk about the U.S., and all of our allies, the people who really are aligned with us, because together uh, we can be a lot stronger. Um, you know, it, it, yourself's talking about kind of the um, the win-win phrase, which you do hear from Chinese officialdom quite a lot. Uh, you know, it, it feels sometimes like China is approaching a lot of these relationships as a solely kind of from a business perspective, not from a, a you know. They're, they are approaching these other countries as if it's some financial arrangement when there's obviously you know, other objectives. Um, you know, the U.S. in a lot of ways is a benefactor for a lot of the world. And we, you know, we talk about food, for example. Uh, the U.S. is by far the biggest donor to the World Food Program. China contributes zero dollars. But it often feels like we're not, as the United States, getting credit uh, from the developing countries, from the global south, for basically, you know, paying, poning up, uh, and really helping them out. Whereas China does get these wins from their more sort of transactional approach. Uh, what, what do you make of that? And uh, and and if you could also kind of speak to this idea of, of the danger of increasing trade barriers. Yeah, I mean, look, when when. President Richard Nixon helped bring China back into uh, the international system after, you know, years of being pretty much isolated, you know, both from the uh, Soviets and from the Americans uh, under under Mao's rule. Uh, that that was part of a of a you know, not to get too grandiose, but it was it was part of a new historical phase. The the, the dollar was moved off of gold. Uh, globalization was suddenly the uh, you know force that was going to drive economic prosperity uh, for the world, and you know the the I think U.S. leaders could rightly claim that you know they they help lead the world in that direction. We're we're in a position now where China is trying to build an alternative global system. Every new initiative that comes out of Beijing is global. The Global Security Initiative, the Global Development Initiative. The Global Civilization Initiative, this uh, Global Cyber uh, Cybersecurity Initiative, and brand new announced yesterday, a, a Global AI Governance Initiative. So China's ambitions are global, but not global, I think, in the sense of being, a, a, you know, stakeholder in the system that the United Sta States played a key role in ushering in, but in another system which Xi Jinping envisions as more appropriate both to China and more in tune with what I think, you know, frankly, having read many of his writings so that you all don't have to, uh, you know, Thank is, you. <laughs> is it's, it's a very bleak vision of where the world is going, which is, and, you know, there, there may be some truth to it, frankly, which is much more resource constrained uh, you know, where, where states are going to have internal issues and external issues to contend with simultaneously as the global landscape becomes basically more fractured and broken and, you know, in, in, in the words of uh, both Russia's and China's leaders, multipolar, which is, you know, a kind of cover for saying, you know, we, we uh, want to shape this newer, more anomic, more contentious world. So... 
I think it's for all of us to think about what the meaning of that vision really is, both in terms of China's strategy and in terms of what the response, the appropriate response to it should be. Um, you know, we are right now very good at thinking through what the second and third and fourth order effects of U.S. policies toward China and toward Chinese tech are, but I think it would be important if we would start to start thinking through the second and third and fourth order effects of global gains that China seems to be making, which are almost nakedly, and actually are, are nakedly, if you go back to the current uh, you know, five-year plan and things that Xi Jinping said around that time about how China is going to increase its economic leverage. They really are about China being able to control and shape flows of more and more of the world's resources. So what does that world look like? I think that's, that's you know, a, a question that we're not going to answer today, but it's, it's one that's certainly worth thinking about. Do you have thoughts on what that world looks like? Uh, the world which is uh, China dominates? Yeah, I mean, there, there's another Nixon quote that I'll read. Last uh, quote from President Nixon is, you know, he said, simply pouring money into countries without having political and economic institutions and trained personnel who can use that money effectively is putting it right down a rat hole. You know, Matt is talking about China's effort to create all these, you know, so-called global institutions that are really challengers to the global institutions created after World War II, uh, you know, and I guess to create this bipolar world again. Uh, what, what do you see uh, the future being, uh, if you have sort of any final thoughts? Uh, well, it's hard from, for, from this point of time to, to really see the, uh, what exactly the future would look like uh, in, in if, um, if, if China or U.S. will dominate the world. I think that uh, the world is really will be m more multipolar or multi-civilizational. So you will have like China's centric world, you have the U.S. centric world, you have maybe Europe as a, as a, as a something in between and India, Turkey, um, uh, maybe some other uh, players like Brazil uh, who will play their significant role. Uh, but for, for Kazakhstan, I mean, for countries like uh, mid-sized uh, countries, uh, which are most of the like countries in the world, uh, I think it's um, it's it's open question w whether this world will be beneficial for us, uh, because um, in, in a, a clear when they have clear rules and they have clear like balance of power, it's easier for to to operate and to to, to plan. When uh, all these centers of power are either equal in their might or the uh, trying to uh, change this uh, equilibrium. So uh, it really creates uh, uncertainties. Uh, for example, Ukraine is an obvious uh, example of that. So when Russia decided for itself that it's enough uh, and they uh, decided to change the uh, status quo. And it leads to a very dramatic, uh, harsh, um, and horrific war. Um, uh, so, so I think that yes, for 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 our countries, it's uh, it will depend upon uh, whether uh, the balance of power will be uh, in favor of like uh, equal distribution of this power. Uh, so nobody will really dominate uh, the whole field. Uh, so I think there will be better option for us. But whether it will happen this way or uh, someone uh, will dominate, uh, it, it's an open question. So we'll see. Matt, closing thought? No, I think that was <laughs> extremely well said. Yeah. Well, th this has been a wonderful discussion, and I'm really glad that we have sort of the perspective that's so important that you bring, uh, and Matthew, your perspective as well. Uh, it, let's give a round of applause to thank Matthew Johnson and Yerzan Saltibayev. This concludes our panel. The Grand Strategy Summit will resume at 3.30 with the final panel of the day. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.
Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to return and take your seats as we begin our final program at the 2023 Grand Strategy Summit. And it's about a topic that quite literally affects all of us in our home lives every day, and that is the topic of American energy. As America rethinks a reindustrialization of our energy infrastructure, a gradual shift from fossil fuels to various sources of renewables, we must consider how such changes affect U.S. national security. President Nixon was very proactive about this issue in the 1970s and sounded the alarm about America's over-reliance on foreign sources of energy. Today, we're asking ourselves many of the same questions. Please welcome back to the stage Arthur Herman, Senior Fellow and Director of the Quantum Alliance Initiative at the Hudson Institute to moderate what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion, and he will also introduce our distinguished panel. Am I mic? I'm I'm mic'd. I'm ready to go. Well, uh, thank you for being here, uh, and thank of you who uh, are able to join us for this closing session of what has been, I think, an absolutely fascinating and multi-dimensional discussion, uh, a series of panels, and um, uh, Ambassador O'Brien's uh, keynote lunch in the address which I also found very, both very informative but also very moving as well in talking about the things that he has had to do and the things, the issues that we need to be confronting here at all. And as I think about this from the point of view of, uh, of where we are with this last panel, I'm thinking to myself, we've spent a large part of the day today uh, going through the ways in which this current administration is blowing it in one region of the world, in one sector of economy after another, right? Um, the failures of the Biden administration with regard to Iran, the failure with regard to Russia and the war in Ukraine, uh, failure with regard to China, uh, failure with regard to Middle East and and the, the situation and the peril in which Israel now finds itself, to which I think the Biden administration needs to assume some uh, serious responsibility. Um, and, in, and in all of these discussions, and it, its relationship with the Global South, too, which we touched on in that last panel, um, and how we have a situation in which the United States is far behind our leading uh, antagonist China in terms of dealing with and thinking about how to encourage economic development worldwide in a way that makes that strengthens our position as opposed to China doing the same to strengthen theirs. And in, I think one of the themes that's come out from all of these panels in our discussions has been that part of the problem, not the only problem, with the Biden administration approach is that it, it in no way reflects a grand strategy. That what we see is um, policies and diplomacies that are piecemeal, which are ways in which to deal with immediate, react to immediate crises, uh, of ways of trying to avoid the uh, political, uh, political uh, fallout from uh, bad choices and bad policies. Um, that this theme of a grand strategy summit is you need a grand strategy in order to succeed and to think about how these decisions fit into a more holistic concept of where the United States is, of what American power should be, and what its relationship with its friends and allies, but also with its antagonists, needs to be. Now, what we're going to talk about right now in this last panel is, I think, the one area uh, in which the administration does have a grand strategy, that grand strategy being the Green New Deal 
and its variants, and that strategy has been a disaster. It has one which has not only uh, given us an inflationary economy and prices at the pump, but it's one which has also made us increasingly dependent and looking to countries that do not necessarily mean us well uh, in order to get the oil and energy that we need. It has involved placing upon clean renewables, wind and solar, um, a burden for transforming our energy resources, which those technologies are not able to deliver. Um, and it is a policy, I would argue, which is moving us closer and closer to the kind of perilous situation we found ourselves uh, 50 years ago when the United States was con and the world was confronted with the Arab oil embargo following the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War and with the OPEC price rise in which the price of energy worldwide um, went from $2.50 a barrel to, uh, by in January of 1974, went to over $11 a barrel. The oil shock of 1973, which roiled the American economy, but also the global economy, and, and seriously weakened America's geopolitical position uh, in the world. Um, 50 years later, this is a situation which we face, in which the lessons of what happens when you abandon energy independence and fail to leverage your position as a leading producer of oil and natural gas to your national interest will have broad repercussions that will affect every aspect of Americans' relationship with the rest of the world. Um, and not just the impact it will have on America by pursuing a failed green energy policy, but also its effect on the rest of the world. We had an event yesterday at Hudson Institute. Um, and the speaker was Mike Summers, CEO of American Petroleum Institute. And he said something, some, stated a statistic which is, I think, very interesting but also very, very dire. And that is, is that today, with a, pop, a world population of 8 billion people, 1 billion um, consumes, on average, the equivalent of 16 barrels of oil a day. And that is the one billion who enjoy a, a prosperous um, ex, uh, existence uh, in the modern, and are, are participants in the modern world. The other seven-eighths of the world's population, the other seven-eighths consume, uh, have a lifestyle that consumes on average less than three barrels of oil a day. So if we are going to raise that other seven-eighths percent of the world's population to a level of economic security and prosperity, um, there is no possible way in which the green energy deal is going to be able to accomplish that. That in effect, the following of the green energy uh, policies that the Biden administration and elites around the world pursue will condemn seven-eighths of the globe's population to perpetual poverty. That's the outlook that we face if we don't change direction in terms of our grand energy strategy and rethink the importance of the energy resources which are readily available, readily abundant in terms of not only oil and natural gas, but also coal, coal and ultimately nuclear power as well. The panelists, the distinguished panelists that we've put together for our time today, uh, I'm going to ask them to reflect upon not only the ways in which the current administration has failed in terms of its energy policies and what the repercussions of those are, but also to think about and give us some ideas about what a, what a truly successful grand strategy in terms of energy policy would look like and the ways in which this can point us forward, point us forward to a new direction for American prosperity, for American national security, but also, I'm going to suggest, for, for a, the, the future, the future of a world which we don't, con we don't condemn the vast majority of the world's population 
to perpetual poverty. And to, and to carry out that discussion, our three panelists that we have here today are sitting to my right, Senator Jody Ernst, U.S. Senator from Iowa. We are very pleased and honored to have you with us here today. Victoria Coates, Vice President of the Catherine and Shelby Colin Davis Institute of National Security and Foreign Policy at the Heritage Institute, and a good friend and colleague. And then also Andrew Wheeler, who was the 15th Administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the agency we must remember that Richard Nixon was the president who founded and created, uh, and which has taken on a life of its own that I think was very different from what Nixon originally had in mind, uh, but I think who will bring to us his, his experience and his expertise having worked on the administrative side of dealing with the ways in which a Green New Deal and its advocates have vitiated America's um, energy policy and uh, national economic policy. Well, I'll tell you what, I am going to start our discussion by turning to Senator Ernst and to get your thoughts and reflections on where we are in terms of energy policy today and also where we need to be headed uh, with a new administration or an, at least a new outlook on the role of energy security as national security. Well, and thank you, Arthur, and thank you to the Nixon Foundation for holding this very important discussion today, because as we look around the globe, we see the issues that are popping up um, globally, and much of that will be energy-centered. You just mentioned a lot of the world's population exists in poverty, um, and a key component, of course, to stability in any region and prosperity is access, just as you said, to readily available, reliable energy sources. And um, for uh, my folks in Iowa, they have to know as well that it is affordable. Um, so that would also be a key component there. But what have we seen in this administration and the policies that are being uh, pushed by this administration? And my estimate of those policies is that it has been a failure uh, across the board as we look at American stability and prosperity in various regions. Uh, so we are a lot less energy independent than we were three years ago. We have seen our fuel prices steadily increase, um, which means that uh, Iowans, as heating season is approaching, will be paying significantly more to keep their homes warm over very brutal winters. Um, and, of course, uh, folks in the rural areas, like the area that I'm from in southwest Iowa, they do have to drive significant distances. So when they're filling their cars at the pump, it's costing them a lot more. So, uh, again, a lot of, of failures there. And when we see uh, being less energy independent, it means we are relying on someone else to fill that gap. And most of the time when we are looking for those energy sources, we may have to turn to adversaries, just as we see with, you, you mentioned uh, the green push right now, Arthur. Um, when we are pushing green energy, oftentimes then we have to uh, lean a little heavy on our adversary, China, uh, to fill the gap because most of the, the sources of rare earths and uh, critical minerals are controlled by China. China controls 90% of the rare earth elements and they control about half of the global capacity of rare earth minerals. Um, so we are by and large enriching China by moving to more electric vehicles, more, um, more uh, of the um, green type energies that they will try and promote through this administration. So unfortunately, we're seeing less American jobs, um, less energy coming out of the United States of America, 
and more of those jobs going to China, uh, where they will build the batteries that go into the electric vehicles. And I know we can talk about a whole slew of other issues that go along with those electric vehicles. So uh, that is where we see our ourselves today. And I know that uh, Andrew will do a little bit of a deep dive into some of those issues as well. Um, I got to know Andrew significantly through uh, the last administration, and I, I appreciate the support that, that we had at the EPA while Andrew was there. Um, but again, just, just the two things that I'm hitting on right now, but I hope we'll have more discussion as we get into this. Um, one is that we are far less energy independent today. We're leaning on our adversaries, and this Green New Deal and the push to EVs is is truly detrimental to where we want to be as a nation as we're looking um, at the long haul. So I will stop there, Arthur, but uh, I know we'll, we'll have just a fascinating discussion as we uh, visit with Andrew and Victoria. So thank you for having me here on the panel today. Well, thanks for being here. Andrew, um, 50 years ago, in 1973, the United States found itself in a perilous position with regard to its ability to uh, produce the oil that it needed to keep its economy going. Um, the uh, cost of production had gone up in ways that made it more and more convenient to import foreign oil, especially from the Middle East. Um, and in the, at the very start of the decade, a massive... Uh, oil and, and natural gas discovery in Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, offered the opportunity to ease the reliance on foreign imported oil and to meet the growing demand for oil uh, and gasoline in the United States. But a massive campaign by environmentalists managed to prevent the uh, construction of the pipeline that would have allowed Alaskan oil to flow into the United States, which was supposed to be by 1972, but the series of lawsuits and court decisions stopped that, and also stopped the uh, development and exploration of offshore oil in California, which also might have had a mitigating effect to protect America from the big price rise that would come in October of 1973, and the oil embargo by Arab uh, ex oil exporting nations. When you were at the EPA, when you think about the role then of how environmentalist movements, the green movement, has come to see the way in which to, uh, a way which to dictate America's energy policies, what did you see? What were the mitigating factors that you could bring to, get, to bear to prevent this disastrous vision from being, from being carried out? Well, thank you, Arthur, and, and I want to thank the Nixon Foundation for inviting me here today. Um, as you mentioned, EPA was created by President Nixon. I had the distinct honor when I was EPA Administrator of celebrating the 50th anniversary with a, with a speech at the Nixon Library in California, which was, was very fitting to celebrate the creation of the EPA. And I think President Nixon would be very surprised as to what's happened over the last 50 years, as, as, you, as you mentioned. Um, I, I do want to, I don't want to disagree with you so much as just change of, of word a little bit. I don't believe the Biden administration has an energy policy. I believe they have an environmental dogma that influences energy decisions in the current administration. Um, the United States is the world leader in environmental protection. We set the gold standard. Other countries emulate what we do. And when you import energy from other countries, when you import um, finished um, goods from other countries, you're not using American-made products, you're not using American-made energy, and we end up having less protective for environment energy and, and products here in, the, here in the U.S. We are importing energy from countries that are, do not have the same standards that we do here. I want to just give a few quick examples on natural gas and oil. As you mentioned in 1973, today we do have the capacity to produce all of the natural gas and oil that we need, and we showed that during the Trump administration. But the environmental decisions over the last three years 
ha have negated that advantage. Well, we have enough energy to be exporting it to our allies and friends in Europe and across the world, and we're not doing that. On uranium, I believe nuclear power is, is, the, is the future. I, I really do. And we used to produce 10% of the uranium. We used to produce over half of the uranium that we needed here in the U.S. Last year, we produced 0.2% of the worldwide uranium. And that's not because we don't have the uranium. It's because of the lawsuits that have been enacted, the environmental protections that are... But the problem is we're, we're making ourselves so protective that we're reliant on energy that is being produced in a less environmentally conscious manner. On, um, on solar, China is producing 80% of the solar panels uh, and equipment. We're not doing that. We should be. They, they dumped um, products in our country 10 years ago to push our solar companies out of business. And today, it's a national security issue. Our, um, Russia and China have developed a cyber, um, a cyber weapon that can actually turn off the, solar, uh, the vast majority of our solar power with a flip of a switch because our, solar, um, our smaller solar companies have their command centers available on the Internet. It is, we are putting ourselves in a national security um, risk, and we're also putting ourselves in a national security risk in the reliance of importing these goods from other countries. And then um, finally, on rare earth minerals, Senator, Senator Ernst um, said 90% is under control of, of, of China. We control 4%, but we actually have much greater assets that are locked up due to litigation and environmental protections. Um, but if we were mining those rare earth minerals here, they would be mined in a much more environmentally friendly fashion than China does. Um, they're using child labor to mine their rare earth minerals. We obviously would not be doing that. And our environmental protections would be are so much greater. One quick final example I would give and that is on phosphorus. And while it's a fertilizer, it's not energy, but we need energy, we need fertilizer for national security reasons. The largest phosphorus mine in the U.S. is in Florida. The Obama administration almost shut it down through a series of environmental enforcement actions against them. We worked with them. They changed their remediation um, policies and programs. I went down, toured the facility. They do an incredible job on mining phosphorus in an environmentally conscious manner. While I was there, I asked them, who is your biggest competitor? And they said, a company in Morocco. I asked, well, what, do the, what does the company in Morocco do with their waste? They dump it in the Atlantic Ocean. When we, don't, when we aren't using American-made fertilizer, when we aren't using American-made energy, we are importing fertilizer, we're importing energy, and we're importing products that are degrading the environment in the other countries where it's being produced. It's a unilateral disarmament that I think President Nixon would have, would have been very upset with. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Victoria, um, you've been thinking about this issue of energy security and national security. What additional light can you shed on where we are from a na in terms of our energy independence and national security needs that, that this audience needs to also be aware of? Well, thank you, Arthur, and, and again, thank you to all of my friends at the Nixon Foundation for bringing us together at such a, uh, a, a fraught moment for our country, and I, I did just want to uh, extend, obviously, our, our condolences and friendship to our, our, our compatriots in Israel and the American citizens affected and still, still held captive. Uh, that's, it certainly has this kind of an event, a way of focusing the attention, and I've been thinking a lot about how you know, there are intersections with energy and, that, and, the, and this kind of cataclysmic event and what it means to our country and why it would be uh, very reassuring to me now as a policymaker to know that I had the, the rock-solid energy security of the United States under control, that my strategic petroleum reserve wasn't at 30-year lows, that our production was ramping up, and most importantly, our investment in our infrastructure was increasing to support Amer future American energy needs. Uh, sometimes even Republicans toss around the term energy independence, I think, very loosely because it, it's 
you know, that's much more complicated proposition than, than many might think, given the global nature of American energy markets. But the fact of the matter is, it is possible to establish American independence. If a future president came to me and said, for whatever reason, zombie apocalypse, whatever, we were declaring Fortress America, you know, I could do that. It would be difficult, expensive, uh, and probably a little bit painful, but, but I, could, I could do that. And we could also do that in terms of food. So making us, I think, the only country of our scale that could both feed and fuel ourselves independently, which is a massive advantage, particularly in terms of China, and they know it. Uh, and they are deeply concerned about it. And to Andrew's point, I agree with the term dogma. Uh, they have made a whole series of decisions to try to undermine that, that security for the United States. And what we're seeing out of our current leadership is this dogmatic approach, which is driven by, to my observation, you know, two sort of key priorities. One of them is to get the United States to net zero by 2035. The other is to get to global net zero by 2050. And if those are your driving sort of determine, uh, sort of priorities, you, know, you have a problem vis-a-vis -vis China because they can't get to 2035 uh, without cheap Chinese products like uh, solar panels and and wind turbines because they can't make them economically viably here at home on that time frame. I agree with Andrew, if we're gonna have them, we should make them here at home, but, but they can't get there, so they have to have it. And they can't get to global zero 2020, 2050 without a deal with China. So they, they strategically can't contemplate a rift with China, a conflict with China, they have to keep talking to China or else they can't get to these predetermined, predetermined goals. And so I think that is what is driving what to those of us who do value United States energy security find to be an extremely confusing uh, and disconnected policy. So my hope would be that as we go through you know, the coming months and a uh, little over a year, we can draw a very bright uh, sort of policy division between that approach and what uh, a different type of leadership might present. And I think the current crisis that we have in the Middle East is, is illustrative for that because you know, on, on top of these, these two sort of directives that the administration is working on, they also want to get reelected. And to get reelected, they can't have an oil crisis like we had in 1973 and the, and the subsequent economic disruption. So they need barrels on the market. And unfortunately, if they're not gonna be American barrels uh, and you haven't created a system of energy coordination with a major producer uh, like Saudi Arabia, you know, you're gonna have to get those barrels from somewhere else. And you know, we've seen over the last two and a half years, the failure of the administration, the choice of the administration not to enforce the sanctions that we had on the, uh, the Trump administration rather had on the uh, Iranian oil industry, in which we got them well under 500,000 barrels a day uh, they're now up over three million uh, barrels a day, and you know that is product that is keeping prices under control. And removing those three million barrels a day right now, if you're not going to really ramp up U.S. production to offset it, you're not going to work closely with the Saudis to make sure they they are playing their part you can't tolerate that politically to take that product off the market and you then also flood a regime like Tehran with billions upon billions of petrodollars. And the result of that is uh, in a fairly direct line what happened uh, on Saturday, October 7th. So I think you know, as we can discuss various ways that we can increase uh, U.S. energy production. I'm from Pennsylvania. I was just out in Oil City, uh, Pennsylvania, which is a wonderful place. If you haven't been there, it's where the first oil well uh, was, was drilled. And some of our producers told me that they could ramp up uh, Pennsylvania natural gas. We're already the number two state. Sorry, this wasn't supposed to be a public affairs statement for Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> 
but we could quadruple our natural gas production, not tomorrow, but in fairly short order, and nobody is investing because they are terrified of Andrew's former institution coming to uh, destroy projects in which they've invested and spent years. So, you know, I think we really do need to look with a, with a clear eye, you know, what are the consequences, both in terms of China and Iran, of the current policy and the benefits, uh, the tremendous benefits uh, of, of what an alternative policy that would still be environmentally responsible might mean. So thank you very much. That's, um, I think, Raising the issue about natural gas um, is an important one here because when we faced our energy crisis in 1973 and the issue of ener American energy production falling behind demand and therefore coming to be dependent on foreign imported oil, th that was the main focus, was oil, right? Natural gas was still very much, a, should we say, an emerging energy technology. And in fact, Richard Nixon was, in fact, one of the uh, president who saw that more investment in natural gas production could indeed be an important part of American energy independence going forward. Andrew, I'm going to ask you, with a, with regard to natural gas, as 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 that has becomes increasingly the driving engine, not just for American energy independence, but also for an American e energy exports through LNG exports, supporting allies, the ways in which we can become, in a sense, the, 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 the fuel supplier for the world. How important is that from an environmental standpoint when we're talking about the emergence of a clean energy future, both in terms of gr reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, clearly an important objective on the, part of, on the part of many, but also from the point of view of, of overall pollutants uh, and environmental threats that's posed. Certainly. I mean, natural gas is seen as a bridge fuel um, from the other fossil fuels. It is cleaner, and it does burn cleaner. And the LNG, the, through the, the, the fracking and the deposits that we have found in Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Dakota, has been a game changer. But it could be an even bigger game changer. I, I like to say the, the worst environmental decision by an elected official over the last 10 years was made by Governor Cuomo when he vete vetoed a pipeline from Pennsylvania to New York um, that could have pro provided low-cost natural gas from Pennsylvania, or Ohio, the Marcellus Shell, into New York and New England. And, it, and he did it for climate change reasons. We're yeah, going course. to be using natural gas and oil worldwide for the next generation, maybe two generations. Instead of uh, allowing the Ohio-Pennsylvania natural gas into New England and New York, it's, it forces those states to import oil and natural gas from other countries. It was you know, just what, six, seven years ago, there was an oil tanker from Russia in the Boston Harbor. We should not be importing Russian oil into New England when we have the cheap, affordable natural gas that we do. And I do want to just pose a quick question you, on the commercial for Pennsylvania. Do you have a favorite in tonight's baseball game? <laughs> Go, Phils. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Senator, oh, by the way, what, what are the natural gas reserves like in Iowa? The natural gas reserves? Yeah. I mean, has a fracking revolution come to Iowa yet? Fracking revolution hasn't come to Iowa. Andrew and I could go round and round about ethanol, but <laughs> large, large bet, that's true. we have many times. But um, no, it, it has not come to Iowa yet. Um, but, you know, if we want to go back and, and talk about some of the issues, because I do I want to talk a little bit about uh, my recent experience in the Middle East. In fact, and, should we, should we yeah. transition to that real quick? Yeah, if you don't mind. Because I'd what I want to do is, and, and the way I want to transition it is this, and in 1973, Saudi Arabia was the pivotal country in terms of imposing the oil embargo against the United States and other countries who were supporting Israel. It was fiercely aligned with the Arab states that were hostile to Israel uh, and who were, the, who had, were part, combatants in the 1973 Yom Kippur War that threatened Israel's existence. The situation has changed a great deal in terms of where Saudi Arabia sits and its position as a pivotal 
state now is geared not towards hostility towards Israel as it was 50 years ago, but now looking for peace and reconciliation with Israel and a change in the entire shape of the region. You just got back from a trip to Saudi Arabia. Uh, you are a member of the Abraham Accords Caucus in the Senate. Give us an idea about what that, those discussions were like uh, and the ways in which what happened on October 7th may have changed the mood or changed the direction of those discussions. Yes, I am a, a founding member of the Abraham Accords Caucus in the United States Senate. It is bipartisan and bicameral as well. Uh, so part of those duties, of course, we interact significantly with the members of the Abraham Accords um, and everyone in that, in that region on various aspects, whether it's um, trade, education, energy, but most importantly, um, national security, uh, managing their security risks against Iran. Uh, so uh, when we talk about oil and uh, the influence of that in that region, um, when uh, Saudi Arabia had, uh, had a number of issues uh, towards the beginning of the year with their, their oil production and how the U.S. viewed that, and so as I, I interacted with the energy minister in Saudi Arabia, it was in February, we did a delegation trip to the region, um, their response to us was that, you know what, the United States, you need to produce more of your own oil. I mean, just point blank, that's what he said to our delegation. He's like, listen, you got it, you need to produce it. Okay, that'll take care of your energy situation. And I've heard that many times over. Well, I was back in the region then um, a week and a half ago. And I started my trip in UAE, which is another energy um, producing nation as well. Um, and they tend to look a little more towards China right now. They're an original member of the Abraham Accords. And we had a very frank discussion about this. And, and they said, you know what? This administration has not been helpful to us. Um, we have had our own tankers, our own oil interdicted by the Iranians. And the United States of America did absolutely nothing to assist us. So they feel forgotten, left out. We brought them into this agreement. We thought it was very important to stabilize that region, and yet we have done nothing to assist them along the way. So that was my first stop in UAE, very frank conversation uh, with the Crown Prince, MBZ. Then I went on to Saudi Arabia. Again, much different uh, discussion in 2023 than perhaps they were having 50 years ago. So the point of going to Saudi Arabia was to further discuss the Saudi-Israeli peace agreement. And truly, Saudi Arabia does want to look towards the future, and the future for them is a stable region that is prosperous and free of terrorism. And in order to do that, they feel that partnering with the Israelis will create a much more stable region, and all of these Arab nations with Israel would be able to push back against the influence coming from Iran. That is the ultimate objective, is to push back against Iran and be safe. Stabilize that region against the threat of Iran and their terrorist proxies. Um, so we left that meeting with this bipartisan delegation feeling very optimistic. MBS was um, just really encouraging about a path forward. It wasn't to be immediate, but a path forward to find peace with Israel. So we left that meeting that evening, got up the next day to fly to Bahrain, and we found out it was October 7th that uh, there had been a terrorist attack on Israel. So we were to travel to Bahrain, um, visit with leadership there. The next stop was to be is Israel. It was to speak at the N7 conference there. So um, we had a, a 
good discussion in Bahrain, picked their brains about what was going on with Hamas. Um, all of these nations uh, tended to be very frank in, in discussions. Because we couldn't go on to Israel, um, no flights in, we ended up going to Jordan. We added on that stop and, again, had very deep, heavy discussions with King Abdullah in Jordan. And very tenuous situation there because, of course, um, there is a huge number of Palestinians that live in Jordan. And so if you look at how tenuous this has been and the Arab nation support of the people of Palestine, it's because there are so many in the Arab nation that have taken in Palestinians um, and they comprise a lot of the population in some of these regions. So uh, we spent time in, in Jordan and we're finally able to break into Israel. And we were there on the 10th of October and were able to visit with Americans who had family members um, that had been affected. One gentleman uh, that came to us, he had come directly from the funeral of his son's best friend. Uh, we spoke with Israelis who uh, had their, their fathers, their mothers um, taken away by Hamas. Um, one family lost their, their 80-year-old father was kidnapped, their brother was murdered. Um, we heard story after story after story. We were able to visit with the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, um, one of his senior advisors uh, that you all probably know, Ron Dermer. Um, we were able to visit with opposition leader uh, Lapid. Uh, we had a lot of significant uh, visits while we were there, but overall they were so, so thankful that we went in as a bipartisan delegation and stood side by side with Israel. Um, so uh, I am of the opinion, I've heard others say that this completely changed the dynamic. There will never be a Saudi-Israeli peace agreement, it's dead. I disagree. I disagree. I think it's a little further in the horizon. I don't believe it is dead. Because at the end of the day, and it all goes back to Iran, at the end of the day, these nations still want a peaceful region. And a peaceful region means Iran is not emboldened or empowered and is not using oil money to send to their terrorist proxies. Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and the Houthis. It's got to end. But the United States, I'm, I'm just going to pound my fist on this one. The United States has got to step up and enforce the sanctions that are in place. Because the Iranians have been exporting much more oil just in the last five years, they have hit an all-time export high. And $80 billion of that has gone into the coffers of these terrorist proxies. And it enables them to enact acts of terrorism against innocent women, children, elderly in Israel. So um, we actually have a bipartisan push in the Senate. Uh, Richard Blumenthal has been a great partner to me on this. Um, but uh, forcing the administration to step up their, their enforcement of already existing sanctions on Iranian oil. Um, it all goes back to Iran, folks, and, and God bless the people in Israel. Um, it has been a very significant turn of events for them, and we, we pray for peace. That's, um, that's a moving account. Um, what was the mood like in Israel three days after that? after the massacre? It, it was very hard. Um, you could tell, and, and I'm a veteran. Um, I served in Operation Iraqi Freedom uh, between Kuwait and Iraq. And I want to, I know we're running out of time, but um, electric vehicles in the military, I'm just going to say, that's ridiculous. Okay, so there's my piece. I had a whole thing on it I wanted to talk about, but let's talk more um, about the mood there. So I'm a combat veteran, and I've, I've seen just other um, units. I was in a support element, but the, um, you know, what I've seen of combat veterans coming out of uh, areas of engagement, they're in, sometimes in shell shock when they have seen horrific things. This is what we were seeing from those family members. 
Um, this is what we experienced when we were visiting with the Prime Minister, is that he was very resolute, but you could tell that this was emotionally draining. This was a very, very heavy toll on the leadership in Israel. Um, Ron Dermer, again, many of you may know of Ron Dermer, maybe have ex experienced or seen him on television. The man is wound tight. He is ferocious. And in that meeting with the Prime Minister and um, his advisor, Ron Dermer, Ron Dermer was brought to tears. And it's like everything that had happened over the course of those three days just poured out of him. And it, it, was, it was emotionally draining for the entire delegation to, to go through that. But we were returning to safety and understanding and knowing that Israel has been subjected to attacks coming out of the Gaza Strip, out of the West Bank, forever. I mean, their, their entire existence, they have been subjected to rocket attacks. They are never out of range of rockets, um, which is why uh, through some efforts that I've had on the Armed Services Committee, we have an integrated air and missile defense system. Now through those Abraham Accords um, countries and other partners, we're tying their air defense systems together and sharing intelligence. Why? Because of Iran and their proxies, um, and we'll continue on those efforts. And I could, I could spend days talking about our efforts in the Middle East, oh, um, but I um, want to thank you. I, I appreciate being able to share that. Thank well, you. Well, you know, this is a great example, isn't it, of how high oil prices have been able to facilitate Iran's role as a bad actor in the Middle East, including, including uh, funding and bankrolling those terrorist units. Victoria, can you give us a sort of a overview of the way in which high energy prices both oil and natural gas have also facilitated Russia's role as a bad actor including the dependence of Europe on on Russian supplies of natural gas yes I mean it's sort of extraordinary we've gotten to this point in the panel and we haven't really talked about Ukraine uh, because I think the Putin's uh, just catastrophic invasion of Ukraine really reset the board in terms of, of, of sort of global energy views. And uh, I don't just spend my life running around going to energy conferences, but I was at one, I was at Oil City last week. Three weeks ago, I was out in Oklahoma City uh, at Oklahoma State for an energy security conference. And it really was striking our private, our private industry, our producers have really taken the kick me sign off their backs and are making the point that we need domestic U.S. production very much to counter Putin. And the fact that Putin can continue to sell a great deal of energy to China uh, is what is fueling this war. I think if, if one wants to see you know, what, what is the real, uh, the real impetus behind his continuing, it's the fact that Xi continues to, to bankroll him. And so you know, this really is uh, one of... I, Senator Ernst's colleague, Senator Manchin, said early on, this is an energy war. And the question is, you know, very much what do we do now? Now we know that if you enrich a, uh autocrat like Putin with sort of constant flows of petrodollars, you don't cut him off from that. This is what he does. We know what Iran does. And I'd just like to, to wind up by saying we are about to see this again in our own hemisphere because the administration announced this week it is relaxing sanctions on Venezuela uh, because I guess uh, the president, president Maduro pinky promised uh, the State Department that he would have a free and fair election next year. Okay, great, let's take off the sanctions because they, again, need more barrels on the market. Uh, and the problem there is Maduro is very close to the Russians and he's very close to the Iranians. And the concern has to be if you start, and he hates America as much as both of them do, and if you start flooding Caracas with a lot of new energy money, what is he going to do with it? We know he has a relationship with Hezbollah. We know he is exploiting our wide open southern border. And so you might not think energy and the southern border are, are tied together, but as a matter of strategy, actually, they are, uh, because he may spend this money just the way Putin and the Supreme Leader have. 
Andrew, do you want to add something? Uh, yes. Um, I used to work for Senator Jim Inhofe in the Senate, and back in the late 80s, he and former um, Energy Secretary Don Hodel went around the country with, they had done some analysis that showed that you know, for all the armed conflicts in the 20th century, the side that had the greater access to energy won. China gets that, Russia gets that, Iraq gets that. It's time the Biden administration got that. Um, in, at the height of the energy crisis in 1973, right after the uh, Arab oil embargo was launched, um, President Nixon um, addressed the nation on what he called Project Independence because he understood that the key to this situation, and even the key to America's strategic position in the world vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union, was dependent upon America's ability to produce the energy that it needed, not just now, but in the future. That project independence included, and just go through the checklist real quick, it included building 100 nuclear reactors by the year 2000. How's that coming along? It included developing natural gas as an alternative fuel source uh, to oil. It included um, changes in the way in which uh, coal could be mined, new regulations to make it safer and cleaner in order to, to do that. It included investment in solar power and also investment in oil shale, the, uh, the ancestor of the, of the fracking revolution. Now, if we're going to think about a project independence for America, for the next administration, and for the next president and his team, what I'd like to do in the next, in our remaining minutes, is to give each of you an idea about what should be on that president's checklist as part of a project independence 2025. Should we start with Senator? Sure thing. Okay. So I'm going to go back to my military piece because this is where I really am very upset in my, my world of national security focusing in on our military forces is the Biden plan to electrify our military. So he had this grand plan and just bottom line up front, next administration, scrap the plan. It doesn't make sense. Okay. So... His plan is to move the entire non-tactical vehicle fleet to all electric by the year 2035. Okay, granted, that's not the tanks, okay? It, it, it's non-tactical vehicles. However, the plan was then to go ahead and electrify everything else after that. Um, so again, transportation company commander, young Captain Joni Ernst, um, serving overseas in Iraq, running convoys. Um, up to the front lines, and I cannot imagine um, running electric vehicles through the desert. Excuse me, Mr. Iraqi, where's the nearest charging station? I need to charge these 60 vehicles. Um, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's a, logistical, so, it's a logistical nightmare. It is a logistical nightmare, one. And then we're enriching China, as I stated earlier, because all of those products and the batteries are coming out of China. Um, but this is the, the problem with this administration, that they have wrapped themselves up into this green ideology so much that instead of focusing on making our American military, the most lethal fighting force on the face of the planet. They instead want us to be the greenest and friendliest. Um, and you can see where that has gotten us with all of these um, in minor incursions that have happened around the world. If you look at Russia and Ukraine, if you look at what is going on um, in Israel right now with uh, Hamas and the backing of Iran, if you look at China that's eyeballing Taiwan, uh, countries do not fear us. Um, they do not fear us. And I, I know this is the Nixon Foundation, but you know the old Ronald Reagan adage, peace through strength, the United States must be much stronger. And energy is a huge, huge part of that. Andrew. 
Yes, first I want to thank Senator Ernst for her leadership in the Senate on both national security and environmental issues. It's very here, important, here. and she gets, the, she gets the way the two come together. Um, the, the one point I, I would just add is in the Trump administration, we streamlined the permitting process under NEPA, and we put a deadline for two years. I think any project should be able to go through a permitting process within two years. The Biden administration has completely undone that. Think back to the Empire State Building. It was designed, permitted, built in under two years. Our permitting process today at the federal level can take anywhere from two to ten years. If we're going to have the next generation of nuclear, the SMRs, if we're going to continue to build out wind and solar, if we're going to utilize the natural gas assets that we have, if we're going to access the uranium mining or the rare earth minerals, we have to be able to get those pro projects through a permitting process that's fair and open with deadlines. And the, the next administration should focus on that straight out of the gate. Victoria. Well, thank you, Arthur, and thank you, Andrew. Senator Ernst, really appreciate this opportunity to visit with all of you. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to commit a, a heresy here, uh, which is I'm going to say that the next administration needs a complete shift in mindset about how they're going to approach the next 50 years, indeed the next 100 years for the United States in terms of energy security. And, oh, by the way, we should bring our partners and allies along with us on this. And instead of pr proposing a transition to uh, electrification, which would be fueled by renewables, I'm going to say we, we have to get off of the renewable fantasy because it is. This is 100-year-old technology. It is less dense than coal, natural gas, oil, nuclear, and then potentially uh, fusion energy. We have never, as a, as a species, as humans, gone backwards on what we rely on. And furthermore, they are also a horrible environmental burden because of the materials that are used for them, the, the material that has to be dealt with uh, when they're no longer useful. They, they are not good for the environment. Yet I keep being told, well, they poll really well. Like that's because people, do, they, and sure, it sounds nice. We love wind and sun. There's lots of both of them. But it's simply not practical. So instead, I think we need to lay out a new chart in which we do focus on natural gas for a period of time, however long we need to. My feeling that's going to be a pretty long time. Completely concur with Andrew that we need to have a lot more nuclear, and we might get to President Nixon's vision of nuclear reactors if they're small modular ones, uh, and that we can have these truly fueling the future with American technology, not Chinese technology. And then make your 100-year moonshot fusion, uh, that, that the experiments that are going on out at Livermore have been uh, successful. And the Secretary of Energy proudly uh, announced the other day that she's putting something like $200 million behind it. At DOE, I'm a proud alum, that is a rounding error. That means you hate something and you want it to die uh, if you give it that amount of money. So I think doubling down on that, protecting that technology like it is our crown jewels because it will be. Fortunately, our partners are the Brits, the Israelis, the Japanese. I can work with those countries. They will see it the same way. Uh, but I think we have, to, we have to free ourselves of this burden that's been put on us that we somehow have, have to go to, to solar and, and wind as the fuel, fuel of the future because it isn't. It's the fuel of the past. Is it this is my last statement, and I just need affirmative or negative from each of you. Is it too much of an exaggeration to say that the um, Green New Deal agenda that relies so heavily on clean renewables as the future, um, that its net result is to deliver our future into the hands of our enemies? Yes. 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 There you've got it. We have consensus on, that on the panel. Um, <laughs> let's, let's thank our panelists for the great discussion. Well, on, on that cheery note, uh, that concludes, ladies and gentlemen, the 2023 Grand Strategy Summit. I want to thank all of you uh, who were here in the audience for your participation. I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, a report will be made available at nixonfoundation.org on Monday. 
which will summarize the key findings over the last two days, and I encourage all of you to check that out uh, on, on Monday. Thank you for being here. We will see you next year in Washington.